Good morning. Just a very quick two minutes call. Two minutes and we'll start with the opening video. So please find yourself a seat. There's room still here up front. There's some lonely men here up front. They need company. So come and join them. Data science and any data inspired and data driven science is so critical right now. More and more decisions are made based on data. The amount of data that we gather every day and the insights that the data can provide us is just growing exponentially and that is no exaggeration. The market for data science and related areas like AI is booming. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems. It's critical and we need women in these roles. Every individual brings their own perspective and so we need to make sure the entire workforce is represented. And the good news is there's so many jobs and many different ways to combine their passion area and their skills in data science and get involved. I would like you to say, what are the problems in the world that absolutely have to be changed? And you know, can you individually, given all the amazing background that you've had so far and all the education that you've got so far, what are the unique things that you can do to change the world towards that mission? And then think of the technology. If that is going to become completely data-driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and, 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 and have your say. If you're not looking at the data from all sorts of different angles, then you could introduce a lot of bias. So it's really, really important that we have around the table all genders, uh, all races, all backgrounds. We can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't just go in a, in a corner and write some code and read math and then we're, that's, that's the solution, right? We can't do that. So we have to think about who is being affected by these algorithms. Welcome to WIN! <laughs> when we first started this conference, we never would have imagined that we'd be sitting here today with over 200 regional events. We've got over 500 WIS ambassadors worldwide. Many of them are women, but we've also got a lot of men. And these are people who are just passionate about 
inspiring others within their community. We're in over 60 countries and year after year, we're blown away. Let's make this next decade, the women in the data science uh, decade. What I love about it is that that growth is viral, that people will attend one event in one city and then they'll want to bring it to their cohort or colleagues the next year. This type of industry can be done everywhere, so it should be accessible to everybody. And this is one of the reasons why I love that we are global with WIT. So we wanted to create opportunities for women to inspire, educate, and support women at many different times throughout the year. And one way that we decided we could do that was through a data-thon every year, which is a predictive analytics challenge using real-world data. We have over 900 teams from 85 countries, and that's in every continent except Antarctica. When we started WITS in 2015, we had no idea this was going to be a global movement with tons of international events and a data-thon and a podcast show. And, and now outreach to middle school and high school has just been such a ride. Our latest endeavor is to work on some materials that we can hand off to teachers in schools around the world. This has provided a platform for literally hundreds of women, if not thousands of women, to have an opportunity to be heard. But the truth is, these are really simple experiments, but they had a profound impact because they empowered someone else to be able to do their job better or to be able to take that message. Five years ago, when we were sitting around a coffee table thinking about what WIDS could be, I never in my wildest dreams thought it would grow so far and so wide around the world in just five years. But what I'm most excited about is the next five years, because I think this is really just the start. Welcome. <laughs> We're so happy to be here today at uh, WITS around the world. I know a lot of people are looking at the live stream as we speak. We're not just talking to you here in the audience, we're talking to a global audience and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm Margot Garrison and I'm here with uh, Karen Mathis and Judy Logan. We are the co-directors of the mm -hmm. Global WITS. And uh, this is a conference where we promote and we, we, we look at and we admire outstanding women doing outstanding work in the broad area of data science. And we're here to support, mm -hmm. inspire and educate everybody, regardless of where you're from and regardless of gender for sure. It just so happens all the speakers today are women. And not just here, <laughs> but everywhere in the world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, last year, if you were here, we tried this last year, but we're going to try it again this year. So here it goes. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Global, Global Women in Data Science, Science 2020. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> wow, hey. We did it. We did it. <laughs> And as you heard in the video, we are so excited this year because we have more events than ever. We have 200 regional events worldwide being planned in 60 countries. And these events are being planned by over 500 WIS ambassadors worldwide, people who are so passionate about data science and about mm -hmm. sharing their knowledge with others that they host these regional events. Some of these events have actually already taken place, mm -hmm. and other events are happening in the coming months. And we're also really delighted because today we're welcoming several of our WIDS ambassadors here today at Stanford in the audience. Yes, we'd actually like to celebrate all of you here today. We have an amazingly diverse group in the room. 30 universities are represented amongst all these tables and over 90 organizations, including corporations, national laboratories, NGOs, and beyond. Um, we know a lot of people came a long way, and thank you for making the time to come here. We always like to give a shout out to the person who comes the farthest. I think this year it's Sulekshana um, Sriram, <laughs> yay, from Hyderabad, India. So thank you. <laughs> And then we also have a shout out to our youngest members today. We have Sam Diener, 
um, in high school and John V. Subramanian in high school. So we have a wide range of ages in the room as well. In terms of speakers, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Our speakers are a very diverse, wonderful group as well. We have speakers on stage today from 11 different countries. Yeah, and, and today is really quite special because as you heard in the opening video, this is our fifth anniversary. So we, we're five years older and we have a lot more wrinkles <laughs> <laughs> since we started. And glasses. But it is unbelievable to, to think about this. Mm. For five years we've been doing this and now we're so, uh, so wor worldwide and so many people are joining us. And I know there's many of you who've been here from the very first WITS mm -hmm. conference. Mm -hmm. But you know, five year anniversary, do you know how you celebrate that? You know what the gift is for five years? Wood. So I thought I'd give my, my wonderful fellow co-directors <laughs> A wooden present. We get presents. So yeah, yeah we get presents. <laughs> now, and, and I love these women to death, but there's one thing about them. See, they're they're a little short. <laughs> I, they're, they're a little shorter than I am. So I thought, <laughs> what can I do with wood? Oh, oh. So uh -oh. Sp specifically <laughs> for them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is for Judy. She. My calculation is she was about four inches shorter than I today, so she can, <laughs> she can, stand, on, she can stand on this one. And, and you know, Karen needs a little bit more help, so we can, <laughs> we can stand on this one here, Karen. So there's a go on. Now we're the same All right. Is this better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is here much better. Go. I love it. Right. Thank you, Margo. I feel very empowered. <laughs> well, but there is a more modern gift that is typically given during five years, and that's silverware. Yes, we thought, Margot, we'd give you a present as well. And um, <laughs> since the future is so bright for women in data science, we thought, how about a custom first edition pair of wind sunglasses? Oh, yes, so, look at this. There you go. Oh, wow. We'll look put at them this. on to... <laughs> 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 this it actually helps a lot because we have these big lights here that's on right. stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is really, but I can't read anything now. So that's, uh. the, <laughs> that's the only problem that we have. So um, we are really interested to, to, or really excited to tell you today about many of the things that we do. We don't just have the conference anymore. We have a, a podcast series as well, which I'm really fortunate to host. And we also have a global datathon for WIDS, as well as a new high school outreach program. And you'll hear more about both of those later on today. Um, but before we get started, we definitely want to give a big round of applause and thank you to our wonderful sponsors, our global visionaries, and our innovation leaders. And then finally, our Stanford sponsors as well. We are incredibly grateful to all of them for the support, encouragement, ideas, and everything they do for us to make this all happen. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all. All right, so I'm, I'm looking at the time, and you know, I'm going to be your MC for today. And one of my greatest joys is to <laughs> kick people off the podium. So I'm going to start with, <laughs> with Judy and Karen. <laughs> But if any of the speakers want a little step up today, then you can, you can borrow those from these, these women. Hey, a few uh, quick things, uh, household items before we start with the program. Um, first of all, you have the program hopefully in front of you, the booklet. Something really important in this program is uh, the tweet handle for WITS. So one thing I would like you to do is take out your smartphones and tweet something right now. Take a picture of your table and put it on Instagram and make a strength that's going to be the goal again for this year. The other thing I just wanted to quickly let you know that if there is an emergency and we do have to leave, you just go out of these doors here and you're going to be fine. So these, these doors in the back go out of that. I also want to ask you that if you do leave through those doors uh, halfway through a talk, that you close the door really, really quietly because if you just let it go, then it makes a big bang and it, it can disturb the, uh, the speakers a little bit. 
Uh, one of the things you'll see here is we have many women in the audience. So we have taken over the gents' restrooms, apart from one. <laughs> so nearest us is all female, all women's restrooms, and then towards the end of the corridor for the gentlemen amongst you, you, you will have to go there. Uh, now, all around the conference also, we have hand sanitizers, and we just want to ask you, considering the coronavirus uh, right now, that you wash your hands uh, frequently as well. But I'm really happy that all of you are here and that nobody had to cancel at this conference. By the way, this is a real advantage of having a distributed conference where everybody can just go to their own regional event and we don't have that much international traffic moving through. We just connect uh, with each other through the live stream. Now, I mentioned men with the restroom. I do want to call out the men in this audience. Please all stand up, all the men. Come on, <laughs> stand up. Hi. Hi, great. And for some of them, for some of them, this may be the first time in their lives that they're really different. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we are so used to this. You go to a conference and you're surrounded by men. In fact, we started this conference because so many conferences just had male speakers. And at some point I was asked, and I tell the story all the time, to give a talk at a conference and I couldn't make it. And then a few weeks later, I uh, get, see the program for the conference. They're all male speakers. So I, I talked to the organizer and said, what happened? He said, well, Margot, you couldn't make it. I said, what about some other women? Oh, we really looked, but we couldn't find any. And so when people ask me, and some of you have heard this before, why do you have only female speakers? I said, well, Bob couldn't make it. Right? <laughs> and we really tried to find some male speakers, but we just can't find any. <laughs> so one of the great things about WIDS is that over time in the last five years, we've put on the stage probably 2,500 female speakers around the world. So nobody has an excuse anymore. <laughs> But to start today at the conference, it's my great pleasure to introduce Persis Rell, one of my very favorite people on campus, favorite women on campus. And what is so fun for me also is that she actually opened our very first Women in Data Science conference. At that time, she was not yet the provost of Stanford University. She was only <laughs> the first female dean of the School of Engineering here at Stanford University. She has a fantastic career. You can read about this in the program. I'm not going to talk about everybody's amazing bios because it's all there for you to read and peruse at your leisure. But I do want to mention one thing. Perse started uh, as undergrad a long time ago wanting to do mathematics. And then you changed to physics. She could have been a real data scientist <laughs> if you just stuck with math. But I think she turned out OK. So, <laughs> so please welcome Persis Drell. Thank you, Margo. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to Stanford. We are, as Margo said, really thrilled to have you here. And I have to say, it is really just fantastic to uh, look out in the room and see a room full of women. Um, I also have to think back to five years ago. And Margot, one of the differences, I want to know if you agree, there are actually more men in the audience now. I think they were a little afraid five years ago, maybe. But anyway, so I want to welcome the men in the audience, too. Uh, allies are great. Um, this conference is, I think, a great indication, as Margot has shared, of how the interest in the field of data science has grown and grown among women. Uh, when, when I think back to that first conference in 2015, uh, when I made those opening remarks, I had no idea that Margot and her colleagues were starting a movement. Uh, but clearly, there was a hunger for it, and it has been, it is just awesome to see how it has grown. In just five years, WIDS has expanded from what was a local Stanford conference 
uh, that was live streamed to a really global event with the 200 conferences around the world. And of course, the field of data science has also expanded in the last five years. Uh, more and more decisions, good and bad, are made based on data analysis, analysis that is good and bad, and one of the challenges is uh, separating those. Um, but things like precision medicine, understanding and targeting retail, retail customers much more successfully than I wish they did, monitoring financial markets, predicting the weather, and elections, of course. The uh, new insights available from big data have made data science an exciting and important field to be in right now. And I'd say that's, a, that's another difference from five years from, ago. Five years ago, yeah, data science. Now it's, wow, data science. Now, all of this means that uh, diversity in data science is actually more important now than it was even five years ago. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about what I mean about that. Um, why is diversity important? If you step back uh, and try to address that issue, you, it's really important to be able to say why in research and education, in any field, why is diversity important? And we've spent a lot of time thinking about that at Stanford and discussing it. Um, I think we've made some strides at Stanford to become a bit more diverse, di diverse inclusive, and accessible. But we, we need to do more, and that's where answering that why question can be very powerful. It is just very, very important, and I'm gonna stress this for each of you, to be able to clearly articulate why diversity and inclusion are critical to our research and education mission. So I'm gonna give you my version on this. You will each have separate versions. Um, the first reason for me is at Stanford, promoting diversity ensures intellectual strength. To solve complex problems, discover break, scientific breakthroughs, achievements in the arts, whatever it is, you have to bring a broad range of ideas and approaches. And to advance our educational mission, it is essential to be exposed to views or cultures that are different from your own and have your opinions and assumptions challenged. An institution or enterprise that reflects broad diversity will inspire new angles of inquiry, new modes of analysis, new discoveries, new solutions. So that's one reason diversity is important in my articulation. The other is that the future is diverse. Our world is becoming increasingly complex, more interconnected. To be fully engaged citizens in the 21st century, we need to embrace diversity in all aspects of life not just in the workplace, not just on a campus. We need to be able to navigate difference, develop empathy, value our engagement with diverse backgrounds and perspectives. The challenges we face now and in the future transcend all borders, all genders. We must be sure that solutions we develop address the needs of all people and incorporate input from all communities. Diverse teams are a critical path to embracing that diverse future. And the time is right now for the field of data science because data analysis can be applied in so many different areas and in so many different ways, diversity is critical. And you're the experts, you know how easy it is to take data and use it incorrectly because you started with a bias or you started with an with a adversely selected sample. As the world becomes more data-driven, there will be increased opportunities and demand for data science, scientists, and we have to remove the barriers that exist for participation. We can't afford to exclude talent. So as you all know, women can and do excel in data science, despite what are all too common and very unfortunate beliefs by some that women and girls do not have what it takes in STEM subjects. And that, of course, has been debunked in many studies, but those prejudices still exist. We need to expose and counteract those biases about girls and women and their abilities. They are especially pernicious for young women growing up, girls, and we need to get them interested in science at an early age. They need to see role models. You've all heard, you can't be what you can't see. The overall number of women undergraduates in STEM subjects is increasing. That's very encouraging, 
but there are still large disparities for women entering these fields professionally. And women leave their STEM-based careers at a much higher rate than men. They are often in male-dominated workplaces. They find themselves not fully integrated, accepted, promoted, included. That means we need to make improvements to the workplace, all workplaces, and I'm going to include here at Stanford as well, to create more welcoming and equitable environments for women. And we all need to continue to seek support from and provide support for each other. So this conference showcases outstanding work by some remarkable women. There are many role models to be found here today and at WIDS nationwide and worldwide. If I had a hope for this conference, it will be that it continues to inspire more women to get involved in data science and that it continues to create networks of support to keep more women in the field. So before I just wrap up, I want to thank the organizers of Women in Data Science, Margot, Karen, and Judy. Please join me in thanking them. And I'd like to thank the sponsors, Stanford Data Science Institute, ICME, the Stanford President's Office, and the Women in Data Science's industrial partners. So make the most of your time here today. Come away informed, connected, and inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Persis. Don't go just yet. OK. Because I want to ask you a question. Sure. You know, you have been, as the dean of the School of Engineering mm -hmm. and now as provost, for quite some time now, right at the forefront mm -hmm. of data science here in the Valley. Mm -hmm. So before you go, tell me, what is your deepest fear and what is your fondest hope when it comes to data science? It's one of the themes we have at this conference. Yeah. So deepest fear is unfortunately easy to call up. And that is, so I'm old, right? You're all mostly younger than I am. <laughs> and so I, I, I was a graduate student in the 80s. And uh, I remember that world. And I remember what people could say. They weren't bad people. They didn't know what they were saying. But there was a, um, a discourse and a narrative and a conversation that uh, was really not very supportive of women uh, and did create what we would now call a hostile environment. I mean, I didn't particularly think it was hostile at the time because I didn't know any better. But we've learned a lot since then. And then I've watched progress where you can't control what somebody thinks, but you can make it unacceptable to say certain things. And that worked pretty well. And it's made the environment more inclusive and more welcoming. And I've seen more women coming into the field. And in the last decade, maybe even the last five years, it has become acceptable to say things that I thought had been agreed upon as unacceptable decades ago. And that I, I find deeply, deeply disturbing. So that's the greatest fear, is that we can't put, the, you know, I want to put that genie back in the bottle where it belongs. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm worried about what's happened in the, in the dialogue in our country. So that's the greatest fear. Greatest hope for data science. Greatest hope. Wow. Apart from, of course, that 50% of the leaders in yeah, data science are going to be women. Absolutely. But that, that will come, and it'll probably solve the problems. But um, <laughs> it's. So I, I think that my greatest hope for data science is to develop the uh, framework and a culture to keep data from being misused. <laughs> I think I, mean, I got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning, because both of those have a slight negative tinge to them. But <laughs> it's that right now, I mean, data and the use of data is so powerful. And we learn so much from it. But as I said earlier, each of you knows how easy it is to misuse data. So how do we develop the cultures and the frameworks uh, so that data can be shared and used appropriately and positively and uh, mitigate the negatives? Every new invention, every new technology has good sides and bad sides. It's the culture of the field that helps us use, use it for good 
and, um, and contain its use for, for bad. And that's something that, that this field, uh, that's a challenge you need to take on. And my hope is you get it right. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Persis, for you. coming and opening <laughs> us. My pleasure. <laughs> I was going to give you a hug. And I will see you in five years. In five years, you bet. I'll be here. That's right. <laughs> Thanks again. Persis Rell, Provost of Stanford University. Yeah. Great. Now, before we continue, uh, I'd like to call out somebody in this audience who's already drawing uh, feverishly, and that is Liza Donnelly here. Liza, get up. Stand up. Liza Donnelly, uh, she has been with us for four years. She will be live drawing the conference, and she'll be Facebooking that and tweeting it, and, uh, and later on today we'll show some of her work. Thanks so much again, Liza, for joining us. And I also wanted to just welcome some of the people on the other side of the camera, because right now I know for a fact that Austin is watching us, that UC Berkeley is watching us, and in fact there's several of them here <laughs> from Berkeley. And, but also further afield, so Mexico City is watching us. Uh, bienvenidos, Mexico City. Uh, Mexico, I should say, huh? Ciudad de Mexico. And then Saskatoon is watching us as well. So we have truly a global audience right now. So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you our first keynote speaker for the day. And she's standing there getting ready. Definitely, jo please join me here on stage. Devni Kohler, she doesn't need that much introduction. Um, she has a PhD from Stanford. I know her as a Stanford prof because when I was a student in computer science, you started. <laughs> you started just before I, I left in 1995. We had her with us for a long time and then she did something really remarkable and amazing. She started Coursera, which I see as the first huge step to democratization of education and really feel so incredibly uh, obliged to you for that. I'm personally very impressed with that. Um, recently, she started on something else. She, she founded a company called Incitro, and she says always in interviews that she started Incitro to address the crisis of the increasing drug development costs. So thanks for that work too, and I'm so much looking forward to your keynote. Thank you, Margaret. Devni Kohler. Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and see so many wonderful and talented women here and on the other side of the camera entering a field that I entered um, almost 30 years ago now in the early 90s and it makes me feel really old. But um, And there weren't a lot of women in this field back then and it's wonderful to see so many wonderful, talented young women entering this space and I think it'll make a huge difference. So um, I'll tell you today about what I'm doing in this field right now. Um, I spent my career at Stanford actually working at what I think of as the boundary between two disciplines. One of those is machine learning and data science, and the other one is biology and health. And I use the word boundary rather than intersection deliberately because there really wasn't that much of an intersection between those two fields at the time um, because the data that was available on the biology and health side was relatively limited. And so you could apply fairly simple statistical tools, but you couldn't really um, apply very sophisticated methods. It was, a, it was a real challenge. And I think that's changing. And I think this is the right time to come back into the space and do amazing things. And I hope that the talk today will be able to convince you of that. Um, so if you think about drug discovery and development, it's kind of a real interesting glass half full, glass half empty perspective. On the one hand, the glass half full is that in the last 50 years, um, discovery has enabled drugs that have taken diseases that used to be a death sentence or a sentence to a lifelong of pain and agony into something that is now manageable or sometimes even a cure. And cure is a very rare word in, in medicine today. That includes vaccines for infections, diseases, cancer immunotherapies, um, autoimmune system modulators. Um, one of my favorite stories is um, the cystic fibrosis drugs by Vertex, which took something that used to be a death sentence at the age of 20 and now gives 90% of those patients effectively an almost normal life. It is a remarkable tale of achievement. 
The glass half empty is this other side, which has come to be known as Irum's law. Now, those of you here in the audience, I'm sure, have, uh, are very familiar with Moore's law. Irum is the inverse of Moore because it is an exponential decrease in productivity of pharmaceutical R&D consistently for the last 70 years. This is a graph on a logarithmic scale where uh, this is the number of drugs approved per, US, for, per 1 billion US dollars. The price tag of approval for a new drug is now 2 $2.5 billion. Now, that is not because that single drug incurs $2.5 billion on its journey from idea to approval. It's because that one drug carries on its back the many, many thousands or tens of thousands of drugs that didn't quite make it. So really what's going on in drug discovery and development is this is a 15-year journey, often, maybe longer, from idea to approval, with many, many forks in the road, where one fork, if we're lucky, takes us to success, 99 don't, and we have only the very uh, limited tools to make a decision on which of the paths in front of us are going to lead us to success, and taking the wrong one can be a matter of years and tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars before we figure out that we took the wrong turn. So how can we make better predictions of downstream outcomes, hopefully helping bend that curve on the last slide? So this is where I think machine learning and data science could potentially play a role. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to some of the developments in machine learning, um, maybe not as useful in this audience, but I think interesting nonetheless. I've been amazed at how much progress has been made even in the last five years. So back in 2005, I used to do a lot of computer vision. And you would give this image to a computer and ask, is there a bear in this image, a simple binary classification problem? And uh, the answer would be slightly better than random. 2012, um, this is the era of ImageNet, which um, was created by my colleague here at Stanford, former colleague and friend, uh, Fei Fei Li. Um, and this give, gave machine learning enough training data to the point that you could actually start answering a much harder question of what is in this image, multi-class classification problem. And, and the label for this image would probably be wolf. Um, this is actually a bear, but it's a wolfy looking bear, so you know. Not so bad. Um, 2014, an actual label from the state of the art algorithm, a brown bear is swimming in the water. There's, the bear isn't in the water, but there is a brown bear and there is water. So this is actually pretty good. In um, 2017, two bears sitting on top of rocks. Uh, today, the performance of machine learning for this problem is dem demonstrably beyond human level of performance for a task that each of us has been trained to perform since we were an infant. So the fact that you could actually achieve beyond human level of performance is actually, to me, remarkable. Now, what made this possible? Um, so if you look at the models that we used to employ way back when in the early days of machine learning, these were usually simple models constructed on top of human constructed features. So things like logistic regression or random forests, and people had to do a lot of what's called feature engineering to feed those algorithms. And it turns out that those algorithms started out pretty good because they introduced a lot of human uh, bias knowledge into this, but they asymptoted at a relatively low level. Um, today, we basically don't do that anymore. The computer starts out with scratch um, and just the raw features, and it takes it longer in some ways. You require more data to reach a high level of performance, but it turns out the computers actually end up constructing better features than people do, which is why the performance keeps going up and up. So specifically, if you look at uh, what we do today, this is what's come to be known as deep learning. Um, and so the computer, for instance, in the case of images, starts to get raw, it starts with raw features, basic pixels, and it constructs an increasingly complex hierarchy of features built on top of other features, so that in the end, it's, basic, it's able to construct features that are very subtle and can make distinctions like between an Arctic fox and an Eskimo dog, where person be really hard put to define a feature that would actually make that distinction. The other aspect of this, which is important and comes back on the next slide, is that there is also a uh, new representation learning aspect here. So if the original images, say, are 1,000 by 1,000, and let's think grayscale for simplicity, then they sit in a million dimensional space. At the end of the day, just before the final prediction is made, that vector is usually about 100 dimensions large. So we have taken a million dimensions and compressed it into 100 dimensions. And those are meaningful features of the computer constructed. 
So from a mathematical perspective, what that actually means is that the machine has actually created a hundred dimensional manifold in a million dimensional space and has embedded all those million dimensional images in that 100 dimensional representation. And that space actually has interesting structure because um, there is an infinite number, a continuum of manifolds that one could construct, but the machine has to actually put next to each other um, images that are labeled the same way. So these two trucks, even though in the original space would be arbitrarily would be as far from each other as two random any other two random images, here they have to be next to each other. And because the hierarchies, the hierarchy of features is learned jointly, other classes that are not labeled the same way but share some features like windshields and tires are going to be next to each other in this manifold, whereas other classes like cats and dogs are in a very different part of the space. Okay, so that's the um, Good. This is the glass half full side of machine learning. In light of the earlier comments, let me actually talk a little bit about the glass half empty side of machine learning and why quality of data is of paramount importance. So it turns out that these really powerful machine learning algorithms that are really good at teasing apart subtle signal are equally good at latching onto subtle artifacts. So this is one of my favorite examples. It's from an archive paper in 2018. Um, this is a paper that, was, uh, that looked at how bias can creep into algorithms in the context of an, a radiology problem where you're trying to diagnose fractures from an x-ray image. This is the input, and you can see they got really good ROC curves. It's, you know, it's not perfect, but really compelling. And then they looked at the embedding of that manifold that I talked about. Um, and they visualize it, and they notice the following unfortunate fact, which is that if you look at that embedding and you look at the distribution of fracture versus non-fracture, it's actually kind of nicely distributed across the clusters. So the machine hasn't learned to really distinguish fracture from non-fracture. What it learned to do really well is distinguish the machine, the x-ray machine that took the image really, really well. And so it turns out that in fact, when you correct for that, um, you basically get close to random performance. And what turns out to be the case is that just certain hospitals have a larger predominance of fractures and a certain x-ray machine, and that's what it latched onto. Which highlights the importance of having really high quality data, as well as a very rigorous testing regime. So we'll come back to that later. Okay, so why am I back in this space after um, so many years, um, it's because I think we now have the opportunity to actually create and utilize massive data sets in biomedicine that didn't exist before. So in some ways, there have been two revolutions going on in parallel in two different fields that haven't really spoken to each other. On the left hand is advances in uh, cell biology and bioengineering, each of which has been transformative on its own, but together they've enabled a perfect storm of data creation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these advancements. The first of those is what's called induced pluripotent stem cells. It is an invention, a discovery that earned uh, Yamanaka a Nobel Prize a few years ago, and and what it is is the ability to take, say, skin cells or white blood cells from any one of us, revert them to stem cell status, which is a pluripotent type of cell that can create any cell lineage in our body, and then differentiate them into neurons or hepatocytes or cardiomyocytes that carry our genetics. And so it enables us to create cellular models that capture the genetic diversity of a normal human population in the cell background that is relevant to disease. We have, using technologies like CRISPR, the ability to furthermore perturb these cells to probe at causality. What would happen if I change this gene from this form to that form? How does that cell behave differently? We have the ability to gauge behaviors using a range of technologies of high content, what's called phenotyping, measuring those cells using imaging, using super-resolution microscopy, using single-cell RNA sequencing that measures the transcriptional profile, and many more that are currently emerging. And we can do it all at scale using automation and microfluidics. This creates an incredible amount of data that looks like these, this image on the left. And the people are unable to make sense of that amount of data. And so that's where the machine learning revolution that we're all familiar with can come together with the revolution on the left and really make sense of these data and help us understand biology and find um, new treatments for disease. So 
In, what we're doing is we're trying to put this together, coming back to the E-Room's last slide before, to come up with explicitly trained models that can perform predictions on which fork in the road we want to take. So we're looking for places where such a prediction will make a big difference to the probability of success, where machine learning is the right tool for the job, and where we can produce the right data at the right quality and the right scale so that we don't have this example that I showed before with the radiology images. So I can tell you about a number of efforts that we're making along these lines. Since I don't have as much time today, I'm only going to take you about one, but it's the one that we think is the most core, which is how do we predict human clinical outcome? If I make this intervention in a human, what will it do? Now, you're sitting here thinking, well, how can you create a data set where you um, uh, measure human clinical outcome? We don't get to do experiments in people until the very end of the process, which is what's called a randomized clinical trial. And that is absolutely right. And so part of the uh, idea here is how do we use other forms of data um, to answer this question? So. Currently, the state of the art, if you will, the normal uh, standard operating procedure for answer, answering the question, what will an intervention do when uh, administered to a human, is, well, we can't administer it to a human, so we're going to administer it to a mouse. Now, the problem, unfortunately, is that mice are just not people. <laughs> And mice don't get most of the diseases that are the unmet need today. Mice don't get atherosclerosis, they don't get Alzheimer's, they don't get Parkinson's, they don't get autism or schizophrenia or type two diabetes, they don't get any of those things. So, so we create artificial diseases in these animals that are very different to humans and then we cure these artificial diseases and then we're surprised when the results don't translate into human clinical outcome. So the question is, how can we use humans as a model system for humans? So as I said, you don't get to perform experiments in humans, but here is uh, something that we can do. Each of us is an experiment of nature. Each of us is an experiment where Mother Nature has perturbed thousands of genes in our genome, and we can measure outcome, clinical outcome of, e of, of different people to see how that connection between genotype and phenotype manifests. And this is a place where you actually do have a Moore's Law slide. This is a graph again on a logarithmic scale, and this is the number of human genome sequences since the very first human genome in 2001. And you can see that not only is this growing exponentially, it's growing exponentially twice as fast as Moore's Law. So depending on whether you believe this uh, trend line to continue, the number of human genome sequenced by 2025 or 2027 will be somewhere around 100 million to 2 billion. That's a lot of genomes. Um, Genomes on their own are great. When combined with phenotypes, they are better. Um, there's less human clinical outcome data available, but there's more and more coming. One of my, my favorite resources in this regard is the UK Biobank. Um, the UK government was very forward thinking in creating a cohort of 500,000 just normal individuals uh, with whatever uh, diseases they may or may not end up developing. And they collected thousands and thousands of phenotypic outcome data on them including multiple covariates like diet and environment and urinary and blood biomarkers and, um, and for 100,000 of them full body and brain imaging and many, many other phenotypes that are incredibly valuable. Um, and there's more of these uh, cohorts emerging. Here in the United States, we have the All of Us cohort, which is about uh, supposed to be a million people, also more genetically diverse than the UK cohort, which is predominantly European. So it's going to be a great resource, and there's others emerging over time. So if you take genotype and phenotype and put them together, you basically have a suggestion of causality. And because to a reasonable first cut approximation, um, a genetic variant that associates with disease is roughly causal of that disease, if you can actually figure out what that is. Um, so that's great, and sure enough, from the very um, in the last uh, ten or so years since these uh, efforts first started, there has been thousands of traits that have been associated, each with hundreds or thousands of different genetic loci that are drive that, that are that associate uh, presumably causally with this disease. Some of some of these are diseases; others are for normal traits like height or even um, educational attainment or bone mineral density. All of these have genetic loci associated with them. Now, the thing is, for each of those traits, there is usually hundreds of different loci in the genome that have an association with that trait, often with a very small effect size, and how do we figure out which is which? 
Now, um, so it turns out that indeed when you have um, genetic evidence from human genetics for a disease, um, if you have a drug against that target, it increases your probability of approval. So if you look at the graph on, on the right-hand side here, you can see that the odds ratio of approval for a drug that has human genetic support is about 2x, which is really an incredible improvement in probability of approval. So that's great. Um, the problem is it's not that simple. Coming back to what I mentioned before, um, not all targets in this case are created equal. Um, if you look at targets that are Mendelian, in the sense that it's a one gene, one disease association, that odds ratio creeps closer to three. The ones that come from the genome-wide association studies, where, as I said, there's hundreds of loci and you don't know which one matters, that odds ratio is closer, is actually less than 1.5. So it's actually difficult to figure out which of those makes a difference. So what we're going to do here is we're going to come back to this other evolution that I mentioned earlier, where we have high content biological data, and we're going to see if we can get that to get us closer to the causal biology. So let me give you an example of how that might work. This is a case study. It's just a really beautiful case study um, of, um, of psychiatric disease. This is a region on chromosome 16 called 16P112 that for whatever reason is subject to copy number alterations in the population relative to wild type. It's deleted in some people and duplicated in others. When it's deleted, there's a 75% probability of autism and when it's duplicated, a 40% probability of schizophrenia. 25 genes in the region, no one knows which of them has that effect. Up until a paper about three years ago from UCSF that took IPS lines from the deletion patients, the duplication patients, and normal controls, reverted them, differentiated them into neurons, and looked at them under a high content microscope. And what you see is this, and even to the untrained eye, you can see that um, the neurons on the left look a lot bushier um, than the neurons in the middle, and, uh, and the ones in the middle are a lot bushier than the really naked neurons on the right. Um, there's a significant deficit, there's a significant increase of synaptic arborization on the deletion and a significant deficit on the duplication. So we don't know still what's causing, which of the genes in the region causes this, but gives, this gives you a phenotype that you can now try in this IPS culture various interventions to see which of those reverts the phenotype from the unhealthy to the healthy state. So that gives rise basically to what we're doing at in citro. Can we do this at scale and using machine learning rather than manual um, looking at things under the microscope to get at what distinguishes unhealthy versus healthy cells for, of people with uh, a lower or higher disease burden of gene uh, genetic disease burden? So if you imagine these are cells that are embedded in a manifold like we talked about in the images side, you can imagine that just like in the image that I showed you before, you have clusters that look like clusters that are healthy that look the same, and you have different types of unhealthy clusters, each of which looks different, and those clusters will emerge um, by, by looking at the cluster diagram in the manifold, and we can now ask ourselves which um, intervention might revert um, an unhealthy to a healthy cluster. Now, what's important about this is that this manifold gives you two things. It gives you, first and foremost, a stratification of the segmentation of the patients into subtypes that might not be visible at the clinical level. The big transformation that happened in precision oncology was when we realized that breast cancer was not one disease. There, we were able to do that because we had a lot of molecular data from enough patients that were obtained from tumor biopsy samples of those patients, and we now know that a HER2 positive cancer is very different from a BRCA1 cancer is very different from a triple neg cancer, and each of those is, is treated differently today, which is what's given rise to the tremendous advancements in treating um, cancer, not just for breast cancer, but for other uh, cancers as well. Here, because we will have enough molecular data from enough different genetic backgrounds, these different clusters will emerge. And because we have a cell-based system that is very scalable and intervenable, we can ask what intervention, what drug might allow us to move from, say, the yellow cluster to the blue cluster. 
So um, let me give you just a couple of examples to show you that this actually works. This is work that came from our own lab. Um, we've created massive data sets that look at different cells under different conditions with different genetics and so on. Um, and this is just a few examples to show this. This is a bunch of cells, each of which were treated with a CRISPR intervention with targeting a different gene. And the question is, can you just by looking at the cells figure out the different genetics of those um, of those gene of those cells, and the answer is you can't. Um, this is what the manifold looks like, and you can clearly see clusters that emerge. And uh, this is a comparison to the state of the art method that used an engineered set of features. This is a fairly subtle perturbation because it only touches one gene and it only reduces its activity by 20 to 40%. So the fact that you can get this level of performance is quite striking. I'm gonna show you the one, uh, one last one, which is very recent work. This is um, in a disease that we're working on called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. It is a fatty liver disease whose prevalence in the population is becoming increasingly large because of um, the obesity epidemic and the type 2 diabetes epidemic. Um, and it's going to become the largest cause of, um, of liver cancer and liver transplants in the next decade. So the question is, can you, can you create a cellular phenotype for NASH that you can then screen for interventions that revert, um, that revert the phenotype? So this is a bunch of cells um, from NASH patients and controls. And you ask yourself, which are the ones that are NASH and which are the ones that are different? I'm sure you can't tell the difference, but the important thing is neither can a trained cell biologist who studies NASH. <laughs> Um, and even when we highlight the ones that are NASH versus non-NASH, you kind of look at this and you say, I don't know. And that is exactly what they said. Uh, so we plugged that into a, um, a machine learning algorithm to distinguish NASH from non-NASH. And you can see a nice separation in the training set. What's more important is you can see a similar separation in the test set. And rigor of machine learning. This was not only done on a different set of patients, it was done on a different set of patients whose cells were obtained from a different vendor, just to make sure that we're not overfitting. Um, and so this is what you get. And again, you can start to look at the embedding and see what insight that gives you in the biology. You can't tell that much from, pick from something of this size. But when you look at the highest ranked tiles that um, for the NASH, versus the highest ranked tiles for the non-NASH, you can clearly see that it's latching onto a phenotype that corresponds to these green circles are lipid droplets, the big pink circle is the nucleus, um, lipid droplets that are at the nuclear membrane. And you can use attention models um, from, from the, the machine learning to look at what exactly was the network looking at by back propagating through the network. And you can see that in fact, in the NASH case, it was looking exactly for those lipid droplets at the nuclear membrane versus the non-NASH was looking at a diffuse signal. So um, wrapping up, um, there is, uh, what we're really building is an incredible data factory that uses all of those tools that I mentioned before. IPS cells, CRISPR, um, high content phenotyping, and with automation at scale to create massive amounts of biological data. Um, on the other side, we're using techniques from statistical genetics uh, and from data science from, and from machine learning to interpret those data, but these are not two separate things. These are two, feed, these are two loops that feed into each other. All of the work that's done is done in interdisciplinary teams that work together like this to figure out what is the problem that we can solve together, uh, what is the experiment that we need to perform, what assay do we need to build that really captures the biology, um, and how what model do we build and what insight can we extract from the result? This type of interdisciplinary collaboration I think is absolutely critical in this space and I think in other areas as well. The separation of data scientists into one side of the, of the organization where, where data are thrown over the wall and results are thrown back over the wall is the wrong way to do data science. So just um, highlighting that for those of you, um, I think this is absolutely critical to success. Um, 
So I'm going to take a big step back now um, for the last minute or so of this talk, just uh, mention why I think this is a really wonderful space to be in, this intersection of uh, machine learning slash data science with biology and health. If you look back at the history of science, there are, at different periods in history, um, one discipline that takes on an incredible rate of progress because of a new insight or a new invention or a new way of, of measuring things. In the 1870s, that discipline was chemistry, where we understood the uh, where we understood the periodic table and moved away from alchemy and trying to turn lead into gold. Um, in the 1900s, that discipline was physics, understanding the connection between matter and energy and between space and time. In the 1950s, that discipline was computing, where uh, we were able to use silicone chips to actually do calculations that up until that point, only a human, and sometimes not even a human, had been able to do. And then in the 1990s, there was an interesting bifurcation because two disciplines suddenly took on that incredible progress. Uh, one was the era of data, which is related to but different to computing. It includes elements of computing, but also of optimization, statistics, and neuroscience. Um, the other era was that of biology, quantitative biology, where we moved away from a purely descriptive science of cataloging phenomena to really understanding the principles of what drives biological systems. And this was enabled by the tools that measure biology um, in a very quantitative way, microarrays, the human genome, uh, super resolution microscopy, and so on, all allowed us to really measure biology in unprecedented ways. But those two disciplines didn't talk much to each other. I think the next era that's coming upon us now is what I call digital biology. It's the ability to measure biology in unprecedented scale, detail, and fidelity. The ability to interpret what we measure using the tools of machine learning and data science. And the ability to take that insight and rewrite biology to do things that it wasn't meant to do. And that will have an impact in biomaterials, um, in agriculture, in energy, in the environment, and in human health. And I think that's an area which is a really exciting place to be because I think that is the next big epoch of science. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for an amazing talk. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. And are you going to be around for a little bit? Just for, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. in the break. Yeah. So if you have any questions for uh, Daphne, uh, the break is coming up in about 40 minutes, so uh, please find her there. Thanks very much again, Daphne Kohler. Yeah. Here's Lisa's uh, drawing. So I'd like to welcome on stage uh, now the panelists for the ethics panel, Lucy Lin and Ashley Han. Um, while we're setting up, I want to do a shout out to another WITS uh, conference that's going on, Cal State LA. Uh, so shout out to them. I know they're still watching. Please come and, and find a seat somewhere on this stage. We have a very comfy chair, so hopefully you had some coffee. So yeah, anywhere here, let's, uh, let's take those so you don't fall asleep. <laughs> Please find yourself, uh, find yourself a seat. It's a little bit strange to introduce myself, <laughs> saying I have the pleasure of moderating this, uh, this panel. This year, we're playing with two different panels. And if you've been here before with WITS, you know that we always have a panel where we discuss careers that will still take place this afternoon. But with this um, incredible uh, surge in discussions around fairness and accountability and transparency and the incredible importance of these topics uh, in data science, we thought it would be really great to set up, really start this day and the technical talks with a discussion around that and hence this panel here. Um, as I said, you know, as, as engineers and scientists and, and certainly data scientists and leaders, and we're all here in the audience uh, in, in one of these capacities, we always have the responsibility to deliver high quality, of course, and reliable and trustworthy work. Uh, we have the responsibility to really understand what we're doing, 
uh, and to understand the consequences of our labor and to really think very carefully about fairness, accountability and transparency. By the way, the acronym for that for a long time was FAT, FAT. And, and I was always so surprised at this. And we have these conferences that go, come to FET 2020. <laughs> I always think about it as faith, uh, spelled the old fashioned way, F-A-I-T-H-E, where you have fairness, accountability, integrity, transparency, honesty, and equity. That's a, that's a whole mouthful, but I think it captures, <laughs> it captures everything. Um, so we need to pay attention to this, but as in everything, it doesn't always happen. There are often many pressures uh, there's competition, there's power, there's money, there's greed, uh, and sloppiness also gets in the way. So we have to start paying attention. There's a recent urgency, I think, in this field because of the growing hype also around artificial intelligence and the search in data science in every particular field. And for me personally, also this growth in black box solutions that are out there that makes people just grab a black box and, and use it without really understanding maybe what's in that black box. And then the other thing is also as data is growing, and Daphne pointed out, it's, it, it provides tremendous opportunity. But data in itself, of course, always is is biased, humans are biased, and if you combine that with black boxes, then the outcome can be a little dodgy, to say the <laughs> least. Um, so people are going nuts about this area right now, which is, is in a way great for us, but we really need to think about this. So we must pay attention, and this is not virtue signaling. We cannot do that. You know, sometimes we, 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 we feel that way when companies talk about um, ethics, and we think it's an afterthought, uh, but we really need to, need to start with this. Hence today, uh, after this fantastic keynote by Daphne, starting with this. So we have three women here with us who think about these issues a lot. And uh, I asked them to describe themselves in just a few words as an introduction a little different than what's in your book. <laughs> so the first one, I want to introduce Ashley Han uh, Demarkaya here. And she's originally from Turkey. And she says, I'm a mathematician. That came first. <laughs> Second was a mom. <laughs> Third was a teacher. Fourth was a researcher. And fifth was a traveler. And, and I don't know if your husband is watching, but wife is not in this list. <laughs> <laughs> because we are all women. No men today. <laughs> yeah, <you see. laughs> but thanks so much for coming. And I know her, her boss, she works for a company called Vayan, and her boss is Vishal Sika, and we are very old friends. And so a shout out to Vishal, and he's watching, and that makes her a little nervous. But don't worry. <laughs> don't no. worry about that. The second person I want to introduce to, Lou, uh, to you is Lynn uh, Kirabo here. Um, and uh, she describes herself as a quirky and passionate learner who constantly engages the potential of technology both in East Africa and the United States. So thanks so much. You flew in from the East, or somewhere around the East. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's wonderful that you're here uh, today as well. And then we have Lucy Bernholtz here with us. She's a colleague uh, here at Stanford University. And her description is also really interesting. She says, I'm a philanthropy wonk. <laughs> we have to talk about this, what you mean with this. Says, my core professional question is, what's public, what's private, and who decides? She says, big data has become a source of power inequity in business and in government. What do you do about that? And I love this description, Lucy, because it's the perfect opener for this, this panel. <laughs> so what do you think? What do you do about that? Well, I think the first thing, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, secondly, for a conference for women in data science, I mean, I think there's an inherent assumption in calling out the need for gatherings like this, which is that women have experienced what it's like to be on the receiving end of a power imbalance. I mean, I assume that's part of the, the thinking in this, in this gathering. So that understanding that by gathering these enormous data sets of information, particularly I'm here I'm talking about information on people, you've got a bunch of information, but the people you have information on don't know you have it. There's an automatic asymmetry, but what we're seeing in the world around us right now is what happens when a few corporations create you know, a, a sort of corpus of, of a resource that 
serves as a moat to any competition, and certainly we're seeing what can, governments can do with this enormous resource. So I think the very first thing to do for people who are actually working with this resource all the time is to recognize that it's inherently about power. Now you're very active in this field and you, you've worked in this for a while. What, what got you uh, starting in this? What's public, <laughs> what's <laughs> private, and who decides? Because you, know, you can think about data in a lot of ways. You hear it all the time talked yeah. about as an asset or a resource or whatever you want to call it. But it's actually our identity. When it's data about people, what you're talking about is my identity in a data set that I have no control over. That's a question of who, what's public, what's private, and who decides. When I came to Stanford in the 1990s to think about that question, and I'm trained as a historian, I had a great experience working with historians and political scientists. When I came back to Stanford in 2011, suddenly all the engineers were interested. And all the computer Fancy scientists. That. How, yeah, what, yeah, what happened? Yeah, all what the happened? mathematicians <laughs> and all the computer scientists and all the engineers. Boy, you want to talk about privacy and public and decision making? Let's, <laughs> let's have coffee. Which is a good thing. I'm glad they're interested. Oh, we had coffee we had for coffee. that same and reason. And here I am. Yeah, yeah. And she, she is. Just, you know, this is what happens when you start talking to people. You're well, asked you to coffee. come on stage. <laughs> Lynn, you uh, are, I have to call her out. She's very courageous. She's finishing up her PhD. This is a scary thing to be at the conference. <laughs> and, <laughs> <that's battle. laughs> and so, so this is wonderful. So you started your PhD working in this area of, of what I call faith. Uh, fairness, equity, and so on. What drove you to choose this? And, and also tell me, what's your biggest passion right now? I mean, it must be your PhD work. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am actually doing a PhD in human-computer interaction. Um, and so that's basically at the intersection of three different fields, right? So like behavioral sciences, design, and computer science. And you know, when we're talking about faith, you know, like faith the acronym, humans have to be involved, right? Because if you're building solutions for people, um, you need to include the people that you're building for. Because if you don't do that, then we end up having the problems that we've been having. And so my, uh, one of my greatest passions is um, working on solutions for where I come from. I come from East Africa. I'm from Kampala, Uganda, and I hope they're awake watching. Um, so um, yeah. So. Right now, we see a lot of solutions, a lot of systems that are trained on people who don't look like us, people who don't have our experiences, people who do not have um, an understanding of our context. And that's a problem, because the world is getting smaller, and solutions are crossing the globe fast, faster than we can think. And so when you have you know, solutions that are not designed for you, um, being forced upon you, or you know, you're just using them, um, there, there's like an inherent problem there, in, at least in my opinion. Um, and so in answer to the question that, that you asked, um, what do we do about it? We need to first acknowledge that there's a problem. You know, yes, we, we, we have um, algorithms that are working now. We have, um, uh, you know, solutions that, that we've built, but there is a section of the population that we did not consider when we were building. And so I think the first step is saying, yes, we have a problem, and then working on a solution together. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about your experience also in, in Africa, because of, of course, one of the interesting things for me about data science is, is that it doesn't really know that many borders. Right? Everybody yeah. in the world can participate in this. You don't need mineral resources, for example, <laughs> as, in, as in other areas, right? You yeah. need a computer, and you need to have brain power, and brain power is everywhere. Although at the same time, we still have monopolies right, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. because of data. So we'll, we'll come back to that. I'd like to ask and you more about this. Yeah. build on that, the people who aren't included mm -hmm. are the majority of the people in the world. Right, <laughs> right. That's Represent right. the majority of the people exactly. in the world. Yeah. So, so Ashley Han, you come in from a really interesting uh, point of view as well because you work for this company, Vi, and then, and Vi was really started with uh, accountability in mind, you know, mm -hmm. with robustness and reliability. Right. And you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about black boxes, right. and and mm -hmm. I think with Vi the the whole idea is actually to open up the black box and to understand a bit better what's going on. What what drove you to join that company? So my background is mathematics, and uh, as I know, you introduced me, but I worked for 
12 years, I'm still affiliated with the University of Hartford. I'm an associate professor of mathematics. So I see things from math approach. Um, so during my data scientist science certificate last year at Berkeley, uh, you know, we learned about all these black box models, but I wanted to dig in and understand what is going on in terms of math. Um, Models are working great, like we were assigned projects. I do projects, 95% accuracy, it's working great. But how is it working? Like, um, okay, I'm training my data set, but if I pick something from, uh, not test data, from something not familiar with the training data set, do I get uh, really like a good result? And I tried, I made experiments also at YNI. We did experiments and we saw this robustness is so important. Because what is robustness? So if the system is not stable, like if you change your data a little bit, and if your system blows up, like gives something nonsense, then it is not robust. Mm -hmm. And this is very important, it is. So I want to be a part of a, like a group who can fix this by using like, uh, models that are explainable to everyone, not just the experts in like black box models like NLP, not like uh, only 20,000 who are expert in this high tech, like any data scientist. So I want to be one of them, like who is like, who takes, um, who wants to take a part that will deliver to all data scientists from coming different backgrounds, from statistics, from physics, from biology, because we are dealing with data. So instead of um, like expect, uh, accepting what the black models do, like here, 95% accuracy, your model is working. No, we won't accept it. We want to play with these initials, different data set. Uh, are we going to get really the correct results? Because it may ruin people's lives. Yeah. Um, there are like models, NLP models, which I wanted to give an example. Maybe I know if it is time, but yeah, sure. I want to share example. because, yeah. like, again, from math perspective, um, most of you know Google Translate, right? You write, and then you, because I'm a native Turkish speaker, I use Google Translate from time to time. And there had been this standard example which shows the Google Translate's gender bias towards male. So, for example, in Turkish, we don't have he and she. When you write, um, he is a doctor, uh, sorry, when you say in Turkish, o bir doktor, o is like it, he and she, it translates to he is a doctor. When you say, uh, o bir hemşire, it translates to she is a nurse. I know if you, if you heard about this mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So, there have been lots of discussions, critics, so Google translators, uh, like developers, they fixed this problem recently. When you write it, you get two outputs. He's a nurse, she's a nurse, he's a doctor, she's a doctor. But uh, this is just, you know, I know how they fix the problem. Maybe they fix the model or the data set. But, you know, we have a solution now. It's, it doesn't make us sad to see he, you know, he's a doctor. But there is also BERT, which is published in 2018. I don't know if you had any chance to play with BERT, but I did. I wanted to see if it is also gender biased. And I'm a mathematician. I studied engineering in my undergrad. So I picked some sentences. I, so how BERT works, you mask a word, and then you are going to see the most likely words that will fit in that sentence. So I made an experiment, and I uh, wrote my predictions on a piece of paper. And then I looked at uh, Bert's uh, prediction results. And when I compared, I was amazed with these results. Um, I want to make the experiment here to you, if you give me 10 seconds. Am I Ten talking seconds too is much? Fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But... Uh, okay. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes, but be honest with me. I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you a sentence, and then you are going to picture someone. Okay? Close your eyes. Okay, picture a mathematician. Open your eyes. Okay, that gender. What's the gender of mathematician? Who, okay, raise your, raise your hands Come if on. it's a female. <laughs> female. 
female. Okay, female. What about males? Be honest, yes. So kind of 80% males. This is what I did. I pictured a male, and uh, when I looked at birth results, I have the results here. It's 83% for mathematician, for male, and 17% for she. And then, actually, what is worse, I added great, and then it went up to 93% <laughs> for he, 7% for she, which you really Well, said this, is, this is exactly what we want to change at which, right? A great mathematician right, should be a woman. What is yeah. the solution? How can we change it? Are we going to ask the builders of uh, BERT to change it, or are we going to do yeah. how can I, we I change wanna it? I want to ask Lucy yeah. about this also, because when we were preparing for this ethics panel, you talked about this, and, yeah. and you talked about this idea that, look, there's bias everywhere. And one of the big uh, challenges for us is to recognize it and yep. then to know what to do about it. As engineers, yep. we're usually not trained in that area. So my question to you is, Lucy, you talk to a lot of engineers and a lot of people working in this field. How do you even recognize it? Yep. And how do you train people or yourself to become better at recognizing bias mm -hmm. so that you can actually address it? So, you know, in the engineering and data science and mathematician and STEM fields in general over the last decade and a half, maybe two decades or four, there's been a big movement to like data science for good, yeah. right? First of all, personal statement, if anybody says to me blank for good, I'm out. <laughs> but on these issues, and, and precisely to the example that was just given, if all of the women in this room, if 80% of them see a man when you say the word mathematician, that's a social bias. We've been uh, habituated, enculturated, um, literature, movie, uh, taught, parented, whatever you want, that's where that comes from. That's not coming from a data set. That's coming from the world around us. So rather than putting data science out into the blank for good, what we need actually are those social values very explicitly part of the education and training of folks uh, working in this field. But it's got to go much beyond that. I mean, those biases get baked in really early. So I'm not going to make you all responsible for changing society, but what you need to do in order to improve the data science training, whether that's as a mathematician in an engineering school, wherever, is really engage deeply, meaningfully, and to, uh, Daphne talked about having interdisciplinary teams. We need this, these processes to be designed to help you learn to look for those biases. Assume they're there. They're there. Assume it. Start from that assumption and go looking for them. And I love the idea of actually trying to make the black box explicable. What about actually trying to put all of the brain power in this room to understanding what data science shouldn't do, where it's going to absolutely accelerate and exacerbate the existing systems? And if you know that's what's yeah. going to happen, then don't put it out there. Then don't, don't just hope for the best, because what we're seeing is what happens when you just assume the best and not the worst. Right, or when, when these sort of unintended consequences that you can have become the afterthought instead of the, the well, thought. You're right more generous start. than I am. Yeah, I'm not well, so sure that some of what we're going on is <laughs> unintended. No, I'm, I'm no, dead no, serious, I, but I also no, think right. there's, this, there's an optimism for, to engineering and science. There's, a, there's a, a, a wonderful enthusiasm for looking for solutions. But you have to do that in the context of, of, ex, of recognizing that the data will be biased. Your algorithms, particularly if they're designed to accelerate learning, guess what they're going to do? Accelerate bias. I mean, there's nothing unintended in that, actually. It's, it's working as designed. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I'm just trying to be a little bit more political than yeah, you. Well, but this I, is why I have you on the panel. That's <laughs> because you're the host and I'm the guest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've got to stay back. Lynn, I want to go to you because you mentioned uh, that bias already in your introduction today, and we've talked a little bit about that too. Um, and, and you talked about this wanting to be, people to be proactive rather than reactive. So talk more about that and what do you yeah. do yourself in your work? Yeah, so I, I was just, you know, I really agree with what you say um, because one of the things that I was thinking about is what if we turned the design process on its head? What if we started actually asking these questions that, um, yes, I've built the system, but what if it fails? Like, mm -hmm. what if it misses? You know, a per, like you, let's say you have a facial recognition system. You're trying to do a f affect com, um, recognition, right? But does that work on people with disabilities? Uh, because I work with people with disabilities as well. Um, does it, um, is it trained on what their facial movements are? 
Um, and if not, why? Like, why didn't you think about that? And so thinking about, um, instead of just, you know, let's put it out in the wild and then <laughs> see what happens, turning that on its head and thinking about it from the get-go, like from the beginning of the design process. And yes, it's going to take time, but is it worth the effort to um, save money at the beginning and then have this epic fallout when you've released whatever it is that you're releasing? Um, because I guess, you know, people will say, um, you know, we don't have the cost for that. We, we don't have, you know, the manpower to think about that right now. And we can't cater. I've heard this one a lot, you know, we can't cater to everyone in the world. But it's technology. Like. Yeah, it, it always surprises you to me when they mm. say they can't cater to everybody and what they mean is women, which are just about 50% of the world population. <laughs> Even though they're going to try to sell whatever it is to everybody in the world. Yeah, well, in right. this case, they're actually talking about, because a lot of the times I ask people, so um, have you thought about how the solution will be used in the developing in developing countries, like in the global south? And they're like, no. Uh, like, yeah, but why not? Well, you know, we can't really cater to everyone's needs, and you know, we can't really build you know context context um, specific solutions. But I'm like, the majority of your population might be in the global. There are some applications that are more used in the global south. So. It's, yeah, yeah. One, one of the really interesting things for me, and, and also really difficult, I, I don't know what to do about this, is we are developing, uh, some of us anyway, here, here also in Silicon Valley, ideas about fairness and equity uh, yeah. that are, of course, based on some metric that we designed. <laughs> but the metric is designed from our own perspective, yeah. with a moral framework that we have here in the West, right here in California. And... The concept of fairness is extremely difficult to develop a metric for, period, but also very difficult to develop metrics that are applicable to other areas in the world where a different morality or a different moral framework, a different concept of ethics may actually, uh, actually be. So it, there's something really wrong about us here in Silicon Valley, for example, designing tools that uh, are supposed to work everywhere in the world because it's almost impossible. Yeah, but then that's, that brings back the, um, the topic that was, that was one of the things that has been said already is you have to have these interdisciplinary teams, but you should also think about diversity in terms of, in terms of geolocation, right? So do you have people on your team who are from far places? Um, do you have consultants that you can reach out to? Sometimes it's just put the survey on Twitter, you know. <laughs> so, so I understand, yeah, and then uh, when, when we talk to companies as well, and, and especially startups, and we, uh, we ask them these questions, I understand the pressures of the marketplace, yeah. right? And the people want to bring out products really fast. We're also now in, in a time where folks get really interested in applying data science yeah. to areas where it hasn't been used before. Yeah. They want to be the first, and there is money to be made in that. So that brings me to accountability. You, you, one of you said, uh, wouldn't it, isn't it bad if you don't have, bear the cost up front of really thinking about it, you're going to pay for it later? Sometimes they don't. Uh, yeah. But if they do, you know, how that, does that come up? You know, how do we keep people account, accountable? So my question to you is, how do we do that? Is there, a, uh, is there room for government regulation? <laughs> is this something that can be self-regulated by the market? Uh, no. Is it? Is it? I, th I knew you were going to say this. <laughs> I just want to answer that. Yeah, you get a, a one-word answer very infrequently. But, but you no. Know, yeah. But you know, in Europe, they've 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 put some extra rules on people. Here, are getting a little bit nervous. We have seen uh, some bad publicity around decisions made by big companies, and people get a little bit nervous. But yet, these companies are still doing well. How do we hold people accountable for this? I, they, I can, you want to start? I can jump yeah. in with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the power is in this room. Yeah. Because the truth is, the data scientists know the algorithms. They know the limit of what they're building. And I like how, in the recent past, we've seen a lot of sit-ins. We've seen a lot of walkouts. We've seen a lot of employees take a stand against what they believe is unfair use of the product that they're building. And so I think um, sometimes it may not be that um, we can approach the government. Like, I don't know how it happens here, but you know, back home, it's not, it's not popular where you can just you know, try to inform 
policy. But I think as people who are building, you have the voice to say, um, this, this will not work like this because of X, Y, and Z. And we as data scientists, we as women in this field, take a stand and say, we will not build X because of this. Um, so yeah, I believe that the power is in this room. Like, this is a right really now. interesting point that you're making. And sometimes we're asked this question, suppose that you're working as a data scientist in, in a firm. Yeah. And you see your work being used in ways that you don't like. Yeah. You know, what do you do about that? Well, the recent past has shown that some companies are actually listening to their data scientists. Like, you don't want to be that person who could have said something and didn't, because it in turn affects you, your own mental health and stuff like that. But so I would just say, speak up. There is a consequence. What if you get fired? But if you get fired, maybe you don't want to be working for that company anyway. I also I want to build on this um, because it's it's also it's not any individuals. Uh, problem to solve. It's a yeah. it's a classic collective action problem. Yeah. For the actual trained data scientists in the room, there's going to be all the levels of the company or the government in which they're doing this work. Um, for civil society around um, the corporate structures, we're seeing an explosion in organizations do devoted to fairness, accountability, accountability, and AI and machine learning. In civil society, these are organizations of advocates around it. It is a collective action problem. So maybe you know one thing you can uh, really hope to get out of today are some of those connections that will give you the support throughout your professional career yeah. that will also then enable you, if you do find yourself in that situation, of having to actually stand up to stop a product from being shipped, or if, a, if an algorithm and a set of analyses can't be explained. Maybe there's a, an advocacy strategy that the people in this room and the people watching could be the leaders on, on understanding what to do when we shouldn't go forward with certain things. And that leadership can come from this room, but you have to think about it as something that's gonna take the collective. Yeah. Its effects are going to be collective, and it's going to take the work of, pe of people working together, both to make a change within a company, whether to make a change with or without a government, your Af East African governments and the United States government, not that different right now, um, <laughs> in terms of reliability and doing the right thing. Um, so that's, that's the power of the people, that's the classic work of civil society, and that's why you know, people wanna come together and find others who share their interests. You've got a, a whole room full of them here and on the, I was going to say on the phone, on the camera. <laughs> on the phone <laughs> that just shows yeah. how Hello. old you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to phone so, a friend. <laughs> that's right. So, Ashley, you work for a company where this is actually the, the prime target, is to, to really understand uh, uh, what is inside these black boxes, to build software tools that are explainable in that sense. So you must have worked with quite a few companies. You see companies working with, uh, with, with the software that you're producing. What has been your most exciting uh, connection there that you've had with the company? Okay, so I'm coming from Academia, so this is my first company. And yeah, as I told you, this company, we are, um, so being a platform member, we are digging into these black box models and trying to make it explainable to uh, data scientists who are working for enterprises, especially who are switching from different backgrounds and want to learn data science but who didn't maybe do PhD in uh, machine learning. Um, so, so what is the biggest barrier that you see for people to really understand? Um, so during my, so at the company or like at the company. based on my... Yeah, yeah, the company. So what is the difficulty? Yeah, what do you see when people come in and you try to give them an understanding of what's happening in, in the software? So our platform is not ready yet. Um, <laughs> well, we'll be ready. Well, it's actually, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's kind of, I don't know how much I can tell, but um, the intersection of all these uh, different backgrounds is math, you know, like, so the idea is using math-based language, uh, we can um, present a platform where uh, data scientists who are coming from these different backgrounds can easily 
play with the initial conditions like the training, like they can perturb the data set and see how the results change. So can check the robustness. And then uh, we, the, model, uh, the platform will have like uncertainty which will um, let a data scientists to see if uh, how reliable their uh, result is. So it will be easy instead of uh, working on like 2,000 lines of code in TensorFlow, PyTorch, R, you know, all these languages. Uh, the platform will be easy to use uh, just using math. And so, so it will not be like a very advanced math. It's okay. just if you know how to differentiate. Okay. I mean, you won't even need to differentiate if you don't want to, but everything will be visual. So, uh, but we, math is, you know, you, you're really advocating, look, if you want to understand, you need to have a basic understanding of mathematics. Right. Right. So, so that is one thing. So what would you say, Lucy, is an, is an essential thing to learn when you really want to understand this field better? Um, I get past the ethics word. Ethics has become a, a greenwashing word. And if I asked everybody in this room what it means, we'd get everybody in this room times two definitions, right? Because it's about values. And it's about val it, it, and you've got to articulate those values. So if you haven't experienced in, in your academic training or in your professional training, you steered away from all those humanities kinds of things because it's all about soft, smushy value stuff. That's actually what you are encoding into your algorithm. And I'd back right up and go get some training in that. And I'd really actually seek um, opportunities within my workplace, whether that's in a company for the government, working in civil society organizations, a very clear explication of the values that the group thinks it's working about, working on, because there are two values that we as a society, as societies, are being subjected to now on a daily basis that if you actually rank them for yourself, you probably find they're not your one or two values. They may be your own personal 10 or 11, number 10 or 11, and that's um, efficiency and scale. And last time I went out in nature, I looked at arts, or I met with my family, I talked to my friends, I thought about you know, the society I want to live in, efficiency and scale really low on the list. Really low. We're talking justice, love, friendship, beauty, truth. So if you just talk, if the conversation stays at the ethics language, you're not talking about anything. You're actually absolutely talking about an empty phrase. But you've got to get to the values. Helene, what's your call to action, your advice? I, yeah, so I would say um, get out of your silos. Uh, because I think just you've just expressed it very well. I think when we, when we silo ourselves or when we just are surrounded by people who are like us, like we're all data scientists and we, um, we do things like this and we use these algorithms and we you know, have these specific outputs, we end up with systems that are inherently built just for that silo and that is not the case anymore um, when it comes to technology, right? Your work will be used by someone so far away from you and you'll be amazed at how they use it. And so I would say, you know, um, I'm, so I'm PhD students, so if there are any students in the room, go out and look at people in other departments, talk to them. At, um, at CMU, um, I've seen students come together, form reading groups, and actually um, you know, have discussions about what does ethics mean for you? What should ethics look like? What should fairness and accountability look like? Right. Um, I'm going to ask you all uh, to, to tell us what your, what your most hopeful thought is in this space. Okay, because we've we spent <laughs> quite a bit of time now talking about all our worries and so on. Uh, and before we do that, I just wanted to tell you we have a, a little bit of room for questions. So we have, uh, here is a mic, and so please, if you have a question for the panel, uh, signal to the mic carriers and they will get ready. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll just quickly go and, and hear your, your hopes. Because I want to, I want to end the this part of <laughs> the panel with something positive. <laughs> so, who wants to go first? 
You, you already has learned? Okay, so yep. my hope is we are going to understand the models, all these black box models. So when we get good results, like 95% accuracy, we won't say, okay, it's a great model. We won't get satisfied with this result. We are going to see if the model hurts any group. We have to be sure that it's fair to any protected group. Uh, so my hope is um, it will be less biased, more fair, um, most of these, most trustworthy and uh, most robust. Lynn. So my hope is we're, we're going to build some amazing systems because right now um, AI, machine learning, data science, they all have this amazing, incredible potential for impact. But imagine the potential if we added more diversity, if we added more, um, got more voices involved, and we could build you know, things that are amazing. So that's, that's my naive hope, yeah. Nothing naive about that <laughs> future of. Um, there's a lot of talk about humans in the loop in a lot of um, algorithmic processes uh, and, and uh, data-driven solutions. I'd encourage you all to think really about society in the loop and that that's a recurring, recursive relationship. Yeah. It starts at the beginning, goes all the way through the process, and yes, there has to be some way when something is released that there are appeals processes, um, due diligence, and there's um, recourse for action if things go wrong. But I think that the people in this room and the people on the live stream and participating in this community around the world are precisely the people to help build that. Build that. Right, thank you. So, question uh, from the audience. There was a mic. Going around, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you very much for sharing your thought about uh, buyers and ethics and everything. So as a data scientist, I'm very agree with a lot of things you said. And as a man, I agree and also I disagree about different things. My first question is... You, you get only one. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> My only question is, <clears throat> is a problem is... I think the problem is not the data science or the model. The problem is the data sets. And... Uh, you mentioned that uh, you want the data scientists to be more aware of what they are doing, but I think the main problem is that the data science and the models and the data scientists are slaves of data sets. So what do you think about uh, the need of creating uh, a United Nations of data sets to, to, to be sure that the data sets are not carrying the, the bias inside? Because the model is just a consequence of the data set. You want to take it, Lucy? There's no one data set for every possible algorithm. Is that what, you, is, what was the suggestion that there be a donation of data to an unbiased data set? But the question is to, to be sure that the people are using the data set which are not biased. Because the more the, the I don't think people can I, hear I don't think you there's a single answer to every algorithmic solution. Data sets are, that represent humans are going to be biased in some way or another. And, um, you're gonna, if you're addressing them for different purposes, then you've got the model. I don't think, it's, I don't think there's a one-off one solution. You know, it's, it's a, a comment, of course, that is often made. Is that as a data scientist, whatever work we do can only be as good as the data. I think it was really, really important that we look at that data very carefully yeah. before we start using it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think also, um, if, if we're not saying that the problem is the data scientists, right? We're saying that you know, there is an inherent challenge with some of the applications that are build, building, build, being built right now, if I can speak, being built. And we need to, as data scientists, well, I'm not, I'm a cousin of the data scientists, <laughs> but we need to, as a field, think proactively about the ways in which our applications can be misused. Let's say facial recognition works great here, but do you want that being applied in a nation where um, the government is, you know, doing some really sketchy stuff somewhere else, right? <laughs> you, may not have, um, you may not have power over that, but you can think about how your application might, might impact in that situation. Right. Well, well, thank you so much for sharing thoughts uh, with us today. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day because I know many of the speakers are going to be addressing these same sort of issues. So thanks again, Lucy and Lynn and Ashley Han thank for you. joining me on stage here for this. Right.
Right, and believe it or not, but uh, this, was, uh, this is already the end of the first part of the day. So we're 25% through. I know several people on the other side are signing off now and they're doing their own thing later on with local speakers. So thank you for joining us on the live stream to all of you who joined up for, for these hours. Um, we have a break coming up. During the break, we'll have a live stream of interviews by the Cube. Uh, please connect during the break. There is a job board out. Uh, if you have any openings uh, in your company or your organization, please post uh, these job openings on the board. If you're looking for internships or jobs, uh, please post your name there too, and hopefully you will be able to connect today. Uh, don't forget to tweet, don't forget to Instagram, don't forget to join us on LinkedIn as well. And we'll see you here exactly at, she says, because I'm so on top of everything, <laughs> 11. Okay, see you then.
Data Science 2020. Brought to you. Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host Sonia Tagare and we're live at Stanford University covering WIDS, Women in Data Science Conference 2020 and this is the fifth annual one. Joining us today is John Hoger who is the Principal Data Scientist Manager at Microsoft. John, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your role at Microsoft. Uh, I manage a, a central data science team for Microsoft 365. And, and tell us more about what you do on like a daily basis. Uh, yeah, so we look at uh, across all the different Microsoft 365 products, Office, Windows, uh, security products. It's really trying to drive growth, uh, whether it's trying to uh, provide recommendations to customers, to end users, uh, to drive more engagement with the products uh, that they use every day. Okay. And um, you're also on the WIDS um, conference planning committee. So tell us about how you joined and how that experience has been like. Yeah, actually I was at Stanford about a week after the very first conference. And uh, I got talking to uh, Karen, one of the uh, co-organizers of that, of that conference. And I found out there was only one sponsor uh, the very first year, which was Walmart Labs. And the more that she talked about it, the more that I wanted to be involved. Uh, I thought that Microsoft really should be a sponsor of this initiative. And so uh, I got details, I went back, and uh, Microsoft's been a sponsor ever since. And <laughs> I've been on the committee, you know, trying to you know, help with uh, identifying speakers mm -hmm. and you know, reviewing the different speakers that we have each year. And it's, it's amazing just to see how this event has grown uh, over the, the four years. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you first started, how many people attended in the beginning? Uh, so it started off as being you know, this conference with the 400 or so people and just a few uh, other regional events. And so it was live streamed, mm -hmm. but just really to a few universities. And ever since then, it's gone with the WIDS ambassadors and people all around the world. Yeah, so now WIDS has, is over 60 countries yep. on every continent except Antarctica, as told in, in the uh, keynote, um, as well as has 400 plus attendees here and is live streamed. So how do you think WIDS has evolved over the years? Uh, it's, it's turned from just a conference to a movement. You know, it's, uh, there's all these new uh, regional events that have been set up you know, every year. Um, and just people coming together uh, and working together. Um, so we, at Microsoft, we're hosting uh, different events. We've had events in Redmond at the uh, head office and then also in New York and Boston and other uh, places as well. So as a, as a data scientist manager for many years at Microsoft, I'm, I'm sure you've seen an increase in women taking technical roles. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, it, and for any sort of company, you have to try and uh, provide that environment. And part of that is even from recruiting, ensuring that you've got a diverse uh, interview loop. And so we make sure that we have women on every uh, set of interviews uh, to be able to really answer the question, you know, what's it like to be a woman on this team? You know, if it's all men, right. you can't answer that question. Uh, and so you know, that helps as far as really trying to uh, you know, encourage more women to come into some of these, these STEM roles. And, uh, I've now got I've got a team of 30 data scientists and half of them are women, which is which is great. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, um, what advice would you give to young professional women who are just coming out of college or who are just starting college or interested in a STEM field, but maybe think, oh, I don't know if uh, there'll be anyone like me in the room? Uh, you know, ask the questions when you interview. Like, go for those interviews and and ask. Like, like say, what's it like to be a woman on the team? And uh, you're really ensuring that the, the teams that you join and the companies you, you join in are inclusive um, and really value diversity in the workforce.
Uh, and talking about that, um, as we heard in the opening address, that um, diversity brings more perspectives. Yep. It also helps uh, take away bias from data science. How have you noticed um, that that bias uh, becoming uh, more fair, especially at your time at Microsoft? Yeah, and, and that's what diversity is about, is just having those that diverse set of uh, perspectives and, and opinions and having uh, more people just looking, looking at the data and thinking through you know, how the data can be used and uh, ensuring it's been used in the right way. Right, um, and so um, what do you, going forward, um, do you plan to still be on the WIDS committee? What do you see WIDS going, how, how do you see WIDS in five years? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I love being part of this conference and being on the committee and I just expect it to continue to grow. I, I think it's just going beyond uh, a conference to also be in the podcasts and all the other initiatives that are coming from that. Great. Um, John, thank you so much for being on theCUBE. It was great having you here. Thank you. Thanks for watching theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagare, and stay tuned for more. I know there's still people coming in, but please uh, seat yourself as fast as possible because we're ready for the technical vision talks. So I know 20 minutes goes by really fast. I didn't have time to get coffee, so hopefully I won't fall asleep <laughs> during, these <laughs> during these vision talks. Maybe, maybe I need to ask somebody to, to get me some espresso. Uh, but I'm just absolutely delighted that uh, we have our next speaker with us today. Uh, we had a wonderful time yesterday, uh, uh, Yishu and I, because uh, we did a podcast together. And I'm very excited to uh, tell you that that will be up and running in, in a couple of weeks. So keep an eye on that. Yisha, uh, unbelievable career woman. And she is now at LinkedIn. Uh, heading a very large uh, data science group. And yeah, I'm just so excited that you're here today. Yashu, everybody, from LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margo, for such a warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'm super excited to be here today. What an honor for me to be back here after I graduated from Stanford 10 years ago. And what's more important is to be among the WIDS community. Thank you all for having me. So uh, I am super excited to share with you some of the early effort that we have at LinkedIn. Uh, with regarding creating global economic opportunity with responsible data science. First and foremost, I want to say that what I'm going to be talking about, the work I'm sharing today, is impossible without many bright individuals uh, from LinkedIn. And I cannot give them enough credit. And of course, if you don't like the material, it's all them as well. <laughs> so at LinkedIn, uh, we have this vision of creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And the data on the LinkedIn platform constitutes what we call the economic graph. And the economic graph is really a digital representation of the global economy. And with data generated from interactions and uh, in engagements from millions of members, millions of companies, thousands of skills and, and, and schools, and so on and so forth. And with all this data and the insights, we can ask many important questions important to understanding the economy, understanding the future of the workforce. So what we do is we actually collaborate with many global institutes across the world, such as G20, World Bank, World Economic Forum, 
to tackle uh, those questions and really helping them design economic uh, interventions that is really able to help us to be better prepared for the future. As an example, uh, our data is able to help us understand what kind of skills are trending over time, right? What is the kind of imbalance that we see in between the supply and demand of various different skills across different geographic locations? I'm sure everyone here is excited to see that data science as a skill is really, the gap is really widening over time. There's much, much more demand over time as we see with regarding this kind of skill and it's really across many different geographic locations as well. And we can also split the data uh, by gender. It's probably not surprising to people in this room, but it's certainly concerning that we only have about 20% of AI professionals who are females, right? And this is really across different geographic countries and everywhere. And what's even more concerning is if I take a cut of this data by industries. So AI professionals, the gap, the gender gap among AI professionals is way wider. And it's even the case among industries such as education, healthcare, which really were industries historically have been very popular among female professionals. And we saw earlier, right, the data science AI skills has really been training. There's more and more demand for skills like that. And this is really putting us at risk of widening the gender and equity gap. And it's really gonna take everyone here in this room and way beyond for us to figure out how we can make sure that the trend does not continue. So now let's come back to this little blue button on your phone. Hopefully, every single person in this room now feel as much as I do, both the opportunity and also the responsibilities that this little button has as we try to create economic opportunity for every person in the global workforce. So what role does data science play in this? So let's first take a look at what's underneath that little blue button. There's certainly a lot that goes on behind the blue button. And uh, not the least, the massive data infrastructure that we are able to use and build to process over eight terabytes of events that happens every single day. And obviously to process all this and compute all these data sets, we have to have nearly half a million of offline jobs that runs every single day. And all that data and its potential really comes with a set of responsibilities. And by responsibilities, I don't mean just the regulations such as GDPR and CCPA and beyond. These are table stakes. I really mean what earlier in the panel that you hear Lucy was saying, it's really the values, it's really about what is the right thing to do. If we, Ellington, really truly believe the value of member first, we truly believe the value of creating economic opportunity for everyone. So, and it all has to start with how we are preserving the privacy of our members as we are leveraging the data that the members entrust with us. So, I think everyone here uh, probably have been trained over the years that do not give out sensitive information, such as your name, address, your social security number. But did you know that 87% of people in the United States that a hacker can still reconstruct your identity based on purely the attributes of your date of birth, your gender, and your zip code. That's why exactly the traditional techniques such as obfuscation or key anonymity is no longer sufficient to protect and to defend attacks such as the difference in attacks or reconstruction attacks. And this is why exactly we are investing into differential privacy. Differential privacy has really become this new standard when it comes to data privacy protection. And at a very high level, the concept is actually very simple, right? So you have a set of data. What you can learn from the data should be the same with or without a single individual's data to be part of it. So here in this graph that I'm showing you, essentially the distribution here is what we can learn from this set of users. 
And if I actually remove one user's data from this set, and the difference of the, between the new distribution that I learned and the old distribution that I had should be very small. This was a concept that was introduced uh, by Cynthia Dork et al. Uh, back uh, over f almost 15 years ago. Um, and essentially the mathematical definition is to say that differential privacy is able to guarantee that the privacy loss that we have is bounded by this epsilon and with very high probability. So, um, Ellinging, what we're working towards is really using differential privacy to be the default way that we're sharing data externally. And the way that obviously we share data externally can be coming through various different data applications, uh, including the, applic the analytics dashboards, the data APIs, or even our ML models as well. And it's a very challenging problem. Uh, and we are still uh, very early uh, in our uh, in, our, in our progress towards the, where we want it to be. Um, but we, we have made some good progress, um, in particular on the global differential privacy model front. Uh, I'm gonna share a little bit of it, uh, both from the algorithm standpoint and also from the systems that we have been building. So uh, recently, uh, folks in my team actually, uh, they were able to share uh, some of the new development they have uh, in the algorithm that they call Top K algorithm at the uh, New York's conference. So for those of you who are really interested in getting to know more details, certainly uh, uh, take a look at their paper. Uh, but at a high level, their paper is really trying to tackle uh, putting differential privacy on this set of query that is extremely common um, in, in how usually uh, companies share data externally. Queries such as, can you give me the top 10 articles on LinkedIn that has the most comments? So besides, uh, when, we, when we are building a differential privacy algorithm in production, certainly there is a lot of practical constraints on those algorithms, of, um, not, not the least that it has to be extremely performant, low latency and everything. But I think this set of query in particular relative to some other queries, the challenge it has is this uh, subtlety of a single user can actually impact the ranking of multiple different articles. Right? Thinking about how you can both guarantee or meet the differential privacy guarantee at the same time that you are able to still return useful information and then um, and how can we do that? So, so please uh, take a look at their paper in detail. But actually achieving differential privacy, uh, uh, the, the way that we're using it um, in practice, we cannot just stop at designing new algorithms. More importantly, we also need to make sure that we are able to build systems that is able to interface between the data storage that we have and also the applications that we have. That is the way that we can actually scale the adoption of differential privacy and making it so much easier for all the, uh, the applications that are leveraging data to be leveraging a differentially private way. So we have also uh, built the system, uh, which is really a differential privacy meteor that is able to speak between the data stores and the data applications uh, that not only has a suite of DP algorithms uh, to choose from, but also at the same time has this very important um, a component that we call a privacy budget management system, which is able to keep track of how much privacy loss uh, that is happening over time, so that we can make sure that the privacy loss is not just sort of a one-time thing, but over time, we are able to guarantee uh, what we, we set out to be with our algorithms. So again, we also have another paper that right now is in archive. I highly recommend everyone who is interested to read it as well. So um, now coming to uh, the second part of my topic, uh, obviously be responsible with data. Uh, it doesn't mean just how we can preserve uh, the privacy, but also as we are leveraging the data that our members entrust us, that we wanted to make sure that we are creating opportunities in a fair way as well. So uh, um, in the earlier panel, there was a lot of discussions on algorithm bias, right? So I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this. And obviously, really kudos to uh, Joy Bulanwini, who 
popularized or put this really in a spotlight over almost four years ago with her project Coded Gaze and really highlighted the fact that how the, the top algorithms, the facial recognition algorithms, were actually really not uh, uh, having uh, the right accuracy, accuracy um, um, when we when thinking about detecting both light-skinned men versus uh, uh, dark-skinned women. But fairness is not just about algorithms, right? Uh, earlier, uh, Lucy uh, actually mentioned about how uh, it, it's, it's really about the various different values uh, that we are creating to the, to the, to the society. And, and then if you're thinking about there's various different values that LinkedIn as a platform is providing to the society, and in, there's many different ways, right? How we're building the product, the new features that we are iterating, um, and in various different ways. And it's a very challenging problem. Um, uh, uh, I, I believe that everyone here would agree with me, right? There's multitude of views, and the world outside LinkedIn may not be fair, right? Even thinking about should we aim for equal treatment or equal outcome, right? Judging by the fact that Margot earlier <laughs> gave wooden stools of different heights, I think she's a believer of uh, equal outcome. <laughs> um, but there, there is way more. So just to give an example uh, to see why this is such a challenging problem. So if I ask everyone here to say, hey, if you um, uh, have all the power to design a fair job product, how would you design it, right? Talking about uh, uh, fairness by design. And it's super challenging. Um, so, so you can think about, hey, I wanted to design a jobs product that is able to make sure for male and female that they are getting equally good job recommendations. But that's definitely not, we, we can't end there, right? Because we have to also make sure that men and women are applying to jobs equally, they are getting hired to jobs equally. And more importantly, they are getting hired equally to equally good jobs with equally good pay. And now you're thinking about there's many different ways that we deliver value, not just jobs, right? Many other ways we have to think through. Um, uh, it's certainly a, a very challenging problem overall. So I'm going to just share at a very high level uh, the, the three dimensions uh, that we are trying to tackle uh, or try to approach fairness using data. So first of all, uh, we uh, adopted the equal opportunity framework uh, that was introduced by Hartz et al. Uh, uh, in their 2016 New York's paper, uh, which is really saying that you know, we believe the opportunities that individuals can get on LinkedIn sh should really be, uh, in the, uh, sh given the talent and, and effort, should really be independent of many other attributes such as gender, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. And to put it in uh, plain English, uh, so the fairness mission that we have is really try to enable that, ensure that two people with equal talent should have an equal shot at opportunities. And these opportunities uh, are not just um, for jobs. It's about opportunities to engage with various different contents, opportunities to build network, to find mentors, get jobs, learn, get endorsements, and so on and so forth, right? So the second thing, uh, the second dimension that, that we're looking at is, uh, is really about thinking about what are the things that is really helping individuals get opportunities. There's been historically so many social uh, research that has done that has uh, helped us uh, understand this way better, right? For example, we know that what helps people getting opportunity uh, is trust, is a status, uh, is access to information. So what are those specific assets that we have at LinkedIn that is able to help individuals to get that? And one uh, research that we did, as example, is uh, not surprisingly, right? Social capital matters to career. Uh, but in, in, in the LinkedIn setting, it's not just social capital as in how many connections you have, but it's really about how diverse your connections are, right? So, um, and obviously individual, individuals who have a much more structurally diverse network, they actually are more likely to be mobile in the labor market. So last but not least, we've got to take actions. We've got to make changes, right? And then a lot of things that we make changes are starting with measurement. And we measure from multiple different uh, aspects. And I'm going to go through uh, some of the, the examples in, in a bit more detail. 
As an example, we, we track uh, and understand the distributions of the way that people are getting value uh, based on their particular attributes, right? Students versus non-students. As you can tell, the students certainly are, you know, relative to non-students, they actually have a very large network. But if you're looking at the structural diversity of the network, not very good. Right? So then, as we are building product, we are constantly thinking about, hey, how can we help students such that we can bridge them into those clusters of opportunities who can help them really landing on those opportunities in their career? And another example is uh, thinking about how we really can present or ensure that everyone is visible to recruiters. Right, we have this uh, matrix that is called skewness at K, uh, which is really try to measure how representative is our top search results relative to the whole qualified candidates sets. And uh, one thing uh, that uh, I didn't mention earlier, which is really at LinkedIn, obviously we are uh, very experimentation driven. So every single thing that we change on our products, we really wanted to understand, is this really bring benefits to the members or not, right? So we go through an experiment uh, process and, and we are able to actually, since I'm running out of time, that I'm going to <laughs> jump really quick on this one, which is really able to uh, see whether the, the, um, what we bring, the values that we bring to our members, are they actually concentrated on a small set or are we actually uh, uh, sort of having an equal distribution across the board? And we borrow some old uh, economics concepts such as Atkinson's index for us to achieve that and such that we can detect unintended consequences in every product launch. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and sorry to do this to you, you know, to step up, but I feel the power, you know. <laughs> I come on the podium and people actually stop talking. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> I want to do a quick shout out to two other uh, WITS uh, groups out there, uh, Lehigh and Rolly. So Lehigh and Rolly, just a quick shout out to you guys, uh, gals watching. Uh, our next speaker is Fanny Chevalier. Um, she is from Toronto by way of Bordeaux in France, and so very international. She studies in perfect subjective natures of human perceptions. And um, I just wanted to tell you, you can see her, uh, her bio, of course, in the program. Check out her website. She has a list of fascinating, really fun projects on her website like Data Inc. and Eco Networks, which I was looking at at 4 a.m. this morning <laughs> when I couldn't sleep because I was so excited about today and I played with that. So, Fanny, thanks so much for coming here and speaking to us. Fanny Chavalier. Oops, sorry. Thank you very much, Margot, for the, for the very kind introduction. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. It's very refreshing to see so many women in, in a single room have been outnumbered uh, for uh, most of my life. I have four brothers. I'm the only girl. And I work with a lot of men because I'm in computer science. So uh, thank you for being here. It's very, it's, I, I very much appreciate and I'm excited to be part of this, uh, of this community. So thanks for the opportunity and hopefully uh, you will get um, to find my talk uh, interesting. So before you came here, uh, you made a lot of decisions. So what to wear, what to have for breakfast, where to sit in the room. And earlier in your life, you also had to make uh, bigger decisions, such as what to study, where to study, whether or not to move with your partner, which city to live in. So what goes into making decisions? And are we good at making the right decisions? Are you good at making the right decisions? Is something I want to talk about today. So I live in Toronto, and believe it or not, it still snows in Toronto. So I'm excited to be here also for the weather. And one of the decisions, the big decision that I'm thinking right now is where to go next on vacation. I can't wait. And how about that? 
Of course, we all understand what are the benefits that goes into like going in vacation in, in places like the Caribbean or, or something like that. I can't wait you know, to have some relaxing time where it's warm uh, and where there are like beaches and um, uh, having a cocktail. Uh, so we understand the benefits, but what are the downsides? Uh, setting time and uh, money resources aside, are there any downsides going on vacation in one of those places? So I heard about accidents involving <laughs> sharks. Crocs! So should I be concerned for my safety? Well, let's look at the data. Actually, I should not. It's the likelihood that I'm being attacked by a shark or a croc is actually very, very low, let alone be fatally attacked. So I should not be concerned. In contrast, vending machines. Oh my god. Vending machines are responsible for more than 1,700 injuries on a yearly basis in the US. And vending machines alone are responsible for more than twice as many deaths as sharks and crocs combined. <laughs> so why is it that we are still like, afraid about sharks and crocodiles and we can pass by vending machines like nothing happened? <laughs> This is because that's the way we reason. So we are actually building on a lot of mental shortcuts or heuristics, and these shortcuts actually guide a lot of our decisions. One very powerful such shortcut is affect. Fear and love are very powerful emotions that influence a lot, if not dictate a lot of our uh, decisions. Assumptions is also a mental shortcut uh, that affects decisions. I have in my head this, this stereotype of being in the Caribbean to be like an ideal situation for me. But perhaps this is not going to be so relaxing. Maybe the music is going to be super loud with a lot of spring breakers around. I don't, I, I, that might not be like the, the real picture of the reality, but my assumption is it's going to be great. And then we're also very good at um, drawing inferences or like making generalities based on our own personal experience of things. So the last time I went to the beach with my partner, he got badly stung by a stingray. And this is very painful, <laughs> I can tell, I don't know, but it looked like so. And the one thing that is weird is that for like all of my life until now, I didn't think about stingrays. But now if you get to see me at the beach, you would find me like behaving weirdly, like getting my feet like this so that I don't risk stepping on a stingray. It's not reasonable. This probably was you know, an experience of a lifetime good experience. So the fact that I act weird on the beach is not very you know, uh, serious. It's not very, you know, um, doesn't have serious consequences. But our individual behavior, may, uh, those poor decisions may have serious consequences. So one thing that I think uh, where individual decision um, put us to threat is like this incredible and reasonable uh, pressure that uh, some people have put on the, on the face mask industry, uh, referring to the coronavirus outbreak. So we know that wearing a mask, if you're not infected, going on the street is not going to help you, uh, you know, not catch the virus. Yet, because people have this assumption that a mask is going to protect them and because they fear the coronavirus, their individual, you know, own personal decision was to go and get as many masks as as uh, possible. But this is not uh, going to help downstream because the people who really need the masks are now going to have uh, not as easy access to them as, uh, as it should. So how can we combat those you know, personal uh, you know, shortcuts and make better decisions? Well, it's not a surprise to you. We're here for that. We need to use data. So the problem is that data can be extremely rich and extremely complex. You all know that. And this is an example of a patient, a clinical record of a patient. And think about the physician before the encounter with the patient has to go through pages and pages and pages of clinical record and try to understand what was this patient illness trajectory. So in my work, I work in visualization research, and I develop interactive visualization tools to help people make sense of real complex, uh, rich data. And in this example, my PhD student has developed uh, such interactive tool to help the physician you know, have an overview, a visual overview of the patient in this trajectory while still having easy, quick access to elements of interest 
uh, in the clinical record. So it builds on machine learning, it builds on natural language processing, but the visual part and the interface is important because ultimately the physician is the one to make the decisions. And we have other examples of such interactive tools here, helping machine learning experts communicate with uh, genetic uh, researchers uh, to understand what characterizes um, rare genetic diseases. So you're looking at pretty pictures now, but I doubt anybody in this room is can, can make sense of those tools. And it's normal if you're not an expert, you know, in either um, um, uh, genetic diseases, uh, there, there's very little chances that, that you make sense of this. These tools have been designed uh, for experts and they need to be trained to actually use these tools. But data science is not always about you know, rich, complex data. It's about complex problems, but sometimes data is uh, simple. So how do we do uh, when we have to communicate the data to the public? So here's an example of, um, of a topic talking about a risk assessment again. Gun violence uh, in the US is a, is a real concern. So this chart shows you the number of murders committed using firearms in the state of Florida. And in 2005, if you didn't know, there was a law that was enacted, the ground, uh, stand your ground law, that basically tells that you can shoot somebody off any situation that feels threatening, and you're not gonna have any problems. So looking at the chart after the law was passed, is that true that the very fact that you can shoot somebody when you feel threatened like cause that people would not commit crimes in the first place because they were afraid of being shot. This, this is what the, the, the chart suggests. But is it the real story? How many of you have actually paid attention to the y-axis? It's going upside down. So basically, this chart should be turned around and put in the back in the chronological you know, order, and this is what uh, you, everybody would have expected, like we had a rise in crime, like I mean in, in death caused by firearms after this, pass was, this law was passed. So it's not that the previous chart was lying to you because you had all of the information. You could actually read the axis and process this information. It's just that you have the expectation of the y-axis to go up, right? And even cognitively and, pro and perceptually speaking, this is hard to process a chart that has been turned upside down. So even when we communicate the data, as simple as a line chart can be, it can be misleading. So we need to be worried about that when we communicate uh, data to the public. Another example here that you are probably familiar with, I don't pay attention to the data, but I'm showing the same data in two different ways. So the difference here uh, is the, the scale of the y-axis. So on the left hand, you would see um, a close-up on the data and showing values only from 81% to 85%, whereas on the other side, you have uh, the whole uh, scale. So which one is better for me to communicate the information? One gives you the big picture, and you see that the difference is not as much, but the other gives you the details of the difference. So this might have an impact on the way you make decisions based on the data that you see. It's just a, a simple bar chart, but just like my design decision might impact uh, your uh, decision later on. So this is also a question that we are trying to address in my lab. Uh, why chose we developed this just like simple animation? Can you switch back and forth? But even the one first visualization that I present to you might influence the way you read the second one. So visualizing data, working with data, making decisions with data is difficult. Sometimes uh, we don't make necessarily the good decision uh, because the data might not uh, be presented in a way that you expected it to be presented and then you misread the graph and you're being misled. Uh, and it is all about a, a question of perspectives. The, the very first time, like the, at the very time you, you decide to project the data to make it visual, you make decisions. And the fact that you decide X and Y versus Y and X might change the perception of this data. So I told you we should not rely on our mental shortcuts. And now I'm telling you, let's not rely on visualization. So are we doomed? No, 
no, no, no. Visualization is just super powerful, uh, but we can do better than uh, what I just showed you. And I'm going to show you like three ways uh, I believe we can, we can try to communicate uh, data better. So first of all, I would encourage everybody when you have to communicate data to the public to help people experience the data so that you make it more relatable to people. Let me explain what I mean. This is about environment. Um, the fact is we have lost about 129 hectares of uh, forest over a period of 25 years. How big is that? Who has a good grasp about these numbers? 25 years is like the, the time that my students in data science have been alive for. That's a long time. So do we understand really these numbers? Uh, not quite. So how about we do this? This is equivalent to uh, losing 20, uh, 20 soccer fields worth of forest every minute for 25 years. This is better. Now we have units that we can wrap our heads around. Yet we still don't have like a visceral experience of uh, what that minute means when it comes to you know, taking trees down off of 20 soccer fields. So let me try this. How fast can you color 20 soccer fields within one minute? Clearly, you go past halfway through, but it's a fail. Point is, bulldozers don't fail. They get it every single minute. 20 soccer fields worth of trees down every single minute. So now, by engaging in this activity of creating this experience of what a minute is worth and what those 20 soccer fields are worth, by the act of coloring, you create an experience and you have a, a visceral experience of of what these uh, measures, these numbers mean. So this example comes from a very nice uh, book that has other, you know, it's not a relaxing coloring book at all, <laughs> but it's a, it's a very interesting one. I love this project. Uh, it's, a, it's fascinating to, to engage people through coloring in, in like actual data that we should all care about. And you don't have to actually, you know, um, oh, sorry, let's, let's experience some more data. Who here drinks pop? Oh, okay. Is that a good decision? <laughs> Let's look at the data. So there are 39 grams of sugar in a can of pop. But how much is that? Should you be concerned? This is, again, the value. This is a very mundane you know, quantity that we have to work with on a daily basis. But how good of a grasp do we have with this, with this unit? Not much. So how about I tell you it's worth 10 sugar cubes? I doubt that I, I can find anybody in this room who can picture themselves put 10 sugar cubes in their mug, even if you know we have like big mugs in, in North America. This is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot. But the very fact that I re-express this uh, abstract unit using a sugar cube that you have experience with, now my message gets across much more clearly because you have experience with that. And that's getting us back to like our personal experiences. How we can erase those mental shortcuts by creating experiences with data that people can have a memory of because they have experienced it viscerally. So make your data relatable and engage more with your data. Uh, befriend your data. We have a, a talk uh, this afternoon that is going to cover that, the personal data of you, uh, how you can learn about yourself with, by engaging more, more with your data. Uh, it's very important. So when it comes to making individual decisions, getting back to the coronavirus outbreak, I think I do, make, I do have like, the right habits of washing my hands and so on, but do I? So I asked myself the question and I started to collect the data about you know, how many times I put myself at risk, as in somebody coughs around me, or I touch a handle or like a, a, an elevator button, um, and how many times I touch my face, because that's where we get the germs from. If we touch our face after getting handles, shaking hands, and so on, that's where we get the, the disease from. And so I also recorded the context in which this happened, and I plotted this data by drawing, you know? And that's my pattern throughout the day. And if we can see that in some occasion I do things right, I touch my face, but I had washed my hands, there are occasions where I did not. 
And so that's where I can realize you know, things about myself. Uh, we believe we do things, but sometimes we don't do exactly as we believe we do. And by engaging in collecting this data about yourself, you can learn not only about yourself, but also what goes into uh, making decisions about what data to collect, when and how. What goes into making a visualization? I drew, I made decision, design decision to make this visualization. Might not be the prettiest, but you know, there were some de design decision going into that. And by engaging with that, you can get a better understanding of the whole data science process because you apply it to yourself with small data and your own data that you know matters to you. So this idea is not new. It's been uh, put forward by um, fantastic artists. Stephanie Pozavec and Georgia Lupi. I encourage you to, to check out their book, uh, Dear Data. They've done that for several years. But I've done that manually by drawing my hand. But you don't have to. You can use tools like Data Inc. that we have developed in, in collaboration with Microsoft Research, where uh, you can have a, a system that helps you with this process of creating those personal visualizations. Instead of drawing one drop to show each of the sentiments you've collected about throughout the week. Uh, you have like a replication mechanism. You have um, a vector graphics that knows what color to map to what data because you specify what are the mappings. And if you're not a drawer, you can use uh, other tool. Note that it's an all-female team. Kudos. Uh, you can actually use tools also to steal visual elements from uh, photographs and bind these elements to data to make personal uh, visualization that looks playful and that looks interesting visually. So engaging with data is important. Uh, data literacy is a skill that we need to learn and that we need to teach, which, which brings me to my last point. Uh, it is our mission to teach data to the next generation to come. Uh, we make a lot more data-driven decisions as we go, as we, we are being thrown data um, on a daily basis. And in my lab, we develop tools to help um, educators teach data visualization and have children engage with, uh, with data uh, and learn what goes into you know, collecting data and visualizing data. And, uh, but it is important as mothers, as big sisters, uh, as aunties, that we engage you know, children sur surrounding us in, in doing the same and engaging with data because that's through this means, through education, that we're going to combat all of those like, you know, irrational uh, decisions that we can make. So to wrap up, yeah, we have a lot of data that is being thrown at us. It can be complex, but it can be mundane like the sugar cubes by expressing data to make it relatable, by engaging with data, and by teaching it, uh, data, we can make a better society and hopefully uh, make better decisions with data, ultimately. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm on thank time. Thank you so much. It's amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Fanny. Wonderful talk. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to uh, welcome Karen Mathis and Carolyn Bauhaus to the stage. We're going Thank to you. tell you about a new outreach program. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Margot. Well, we're thrilled to be here today to share with you the very first steps in our new WIDS high school outreach program. Let's see if we can. Hmm? Hmm. Keep going. There it is. There we go. Yeah. Great. Well, we've heard from many of you over the last few years in the WIDS community worldwide that it would be great if we all worked together to build a much bigger pipeline of girls who one day will become the next generation of amazing data science leaders. So that's wonderful. It really fits with the WIDS goals to inspire, to educate, and support women at all stages. Um, unfortunately, the studies we've seen show that many girls, particularly around the age of 15, start to lose interest in STEM fields. And we want to change that by starting with exposing girls to excellent role models that they can really relate to, young women not much older than themselves. And we want to show that there are many ways to get involved in data science. It's very nonlinear. So you can study math, statistics, computer science, economics, bioinformatics, social sciences. Um, really, we want to inspire teenagers that they can take data science, 
combined with any area that they're really passionate about, and over time one day have a cool and you know, rewarding career. So we started by creating some specific materials, videos and other materials designed just at high schoolers. And we are excited to show you a very first look at one of those videos. Just a quick clip here. Data science can be found everywhere, shaking up almost every aspect of our daily lives. But most people really hadn't heard of it until about 10 years ago. It's one of the fastest growing fields today, so there's a ton of opportunities for everyone to be involved. Anyways, what is data science? So this is just a teaser. Other things that we're working on are additional videos. Uh, discussion guides to go with those videos, and then a student glossary that includes things like algorithm and machine learning. Another aspect that we're really excited about is a day in the life reel that features four amazing women going through their work day. Here's a sneak peek of that one. After graduating from college, I realized I could use my technical skills, my data analysis skills to really serve my country I've gotten to work at a lot of cool places as a result, including at the FBI and at the White House. I lead a team of data scientists and user researchers to better inform how we make a product much more fun and connections much more meaningful. I am a research software engineer building machine learning solutions for wildlife conservation. I'm a PhD student at Stanford studying computational and mathematical engineering. And my research is on using satellite images and machine learning to map our agricultural systems. So we're currently finishing these materials, and we've just started a pilot in several local high schools. Mm -hmm. The early feedback is really, really exciting, uh, really positive. Uh, with this in, uh, initial video, uh, we're also beginning translation into Spanish and Chinese and hope to add additional languages soon. We'll be uh, taking that feedback from the pilot to revise and improve the materials and releasing those to educators and teachers in the fall. So please, if you're interested in hearing more about it and getting the videos and materials as soon as they're ready, sign up on this bit.ly URL, or you can go to the WIDS website and sign up there, and we'll have more information coming soon. And we definitely want to give a shout out to the design team. If you're here in the audience, please stand up, because really it was a, a great multidisciplinary group, uh, two math teachers, two students, one in high school, one in undergrad, um, two industry professionals, and then three of us from Stanford yeah. on stage. And um, we'd love to talk to you more throughout the day today, so come find us at a break. You're and done. We're really, You're done. Really excited. <laughs> Looking forward to working with you all. Thanks so much, you and, and yeah. Carolyn, especially shout out to you, because you've been leading us all through this. Thank you. It's a great, yeah, great, great team. Thank Outreach you. program. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So uh, for many people that are now uh, following us live also, this is the moment they've been waiting for, and this is why they're joining us on the live stream, is Meredith Lee talking about the Datathon and announcing the winners of the f fourth, third, third. So I we'll can't count. <laughs> One, two, three, four, yeah. <laughs> the third with Datathon. Thanks so much, Margot. Hello, everyone. I am so excited today to share some results from our third annual WIDS Datathon. You may recall that the first Datathon we hosted uh, focused on financial inclusion data. The second Datathon was using high resolution satellite image data. And this year, let me tell you about this year. Uh, we focused on health data, particularly uh, in a collaboration with hospital intensive care units. And uh, with 130,000 patient visits, 160 plus uh, columns, and four times the number of teams participating compared to last year, we quadrupled, yes. That is worth a round of applause. Um, we were so excited that 80% of those registered for the Datathon this year were women in an area of online predictive analytics that typically has estimates of about 20%. So good job on flipping that statistic. 
Um, the 951 teams of up to four people spanned 85 different countries, so that's so fantastic to see. And over the last six weeks, these teams worked together around the clock and submitted more than 12,600 submissions. This is all possible because of months of work with our Datathon uh, team, spanning a number of different organizations from the private sector and the public sector. And I have to give special thanks to Marze Gassimi from the University of Toronto for alerting us to this opportunity with this data set, to uh, our colleague uh, Latanya Sweeney from the Harvard Data Privacy Lab, and to our collaborators at the MIT Global Open Source Severity of Illness Score, or GOSIS, initiative, as well as all of these uh, organizations you see here. If I could ask the folks in the room who worked on the Datathon team to stand up, we'd love to give you a round of applause and thank you so much for your leadership. We also have to give a special shout out to the dozens of WIDS ambassadors around the globe who hosted more than 20 different workshops to help team formation and to facilitate hands-on training throughout the last couple of months. Here are just a few images and there's hours of content now forevermore uh, there online for viewing. Thank you so much to the WIDS ambassadors. And now if we could get a drum roll, please, for our top three winners. In first place, we have Team Women Power from Israel. They did this with their own laptops nights and weekends. We'll be sharing more stories uh, over the next few weeks. In second place, we have Team Nullset from Ukraine. And in third place, Team Prevision.io from France. Congratulations. These teams have already started sharing uh, their problem-solving approach, and so fantastic to see. And we're super excited to announce for the first time an extension, a second phase of the Datathon with an Excellence in Research Award with the National Science Foundation Big Data Innovation Hubs. So we invite you all, whether you're working on a paper this month or not, to join our webinar this, uh, this Thursday. And we hope to see you next year. Congrats. Thank you so much, Meredith. And a big shout out to her. I mean, it's amazing what she and her team have done and how the Datathon is just increasing every year. It's very exciting. So we'll continue with our technical vision talks. And I'm really excited to announce uh, Rama Akiruya, Akirayu. <laughs> I write you. It's, I'm so sorry. You know, when I'm bad at pronouncing other people's names and, uh, and people get upset with me, I always tell them, though, try mine. Because my name, you would have to say, Margo Gerritsen with the G, so. <laughs> uh, now, when I was looking at Rama, um, she had a quote online that I just thought was wonderful. She works at this interface with language and AI. And she said in one of the interviews that I saw, if data is the new oil and AI is the new electricity, then speech is the switch to turn it on. So with that, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. So my last name is spelled as Akiraju. <laughs> By show of hands, how many of you can speak three or more languages in the room? Oh, wow. OK. That's quite a few, more than what I expected, but that's great. Um, language is hard, right? Um, mastering a language is pretty hard, especially if it's a teen language. <laughs> as a mother of a teenager, I know all about it. I go, what? That word means that these days? <laughs> um, now, imagine we have to teach that language to AI machines, and not only the language of the humans, but the language of the, the, the enterprises. So today I'll talk more about what it takes to teach AI systems the language of the humans and as well as the language of the enterprise. So polyglot enterprise AI is the, name, is the title of the talk. What is a polyglot? A polyglot is a person who speaks multiple languages. Um, so we are here talking about AI systems speaking multiple languages. 
So here are the key takeaways um, in case you miss the rest of the talk. To build polyglot enterprise AI, AI needs to be able to master not only the language of the humans, but the language of the enterprise. And I'll show that to you with more examples. And the second one, you don't have to perfect the language of the humans in order to really begin to address the language of the enterprise. There is no shame in really narrowing the problem and solving the narrow AI first, as opposed to trying to attempt to solve the broad AI. And the third point is that depending on the availability of the amount of labeled data and the transparency and, and uh, the requ such requirements that you have, you may have different options at your disposal. And uh, I would like to take you through some of those, what those options are today. So let's look at the language of the humans. How many languages are there in the world? Um, so I'll give the answer. About 6,500 to 7,000 plus languages, apparently. And 23 are the most spoken languages in the world. And typically, businesses do language, uh, b b b companies do business in about 170 plus languages. So this starts to give the scale of the problem. 170 plus languages is what companies have to master. Uh, AI systems have to master uh, in order for their systems to be really available in all those languages. So let's take a look at uh, the complexities of understanding human language. I took one NLP task, which is the machine translation. and. Um, I wanted to demonstrate what it means to really understand human language. You know, take some idioms, humor, and sarcasm, and throw it in in any favorite translator, machine translator program out there, and you'll be surprised. And I'll pick one. I picked uh, Telugu and Hindi languages um, because those are the three languages I speak in uh, two languages I speak in addition to English. So I'll, I'll take you through this one example: hit a roadblock. It's an idiom. Um, the the translation is. It's pretty funny for those of you who speak Hindi audience. Uh, in the audience, ek sadak mara. It's it's utterly ridiculous translation. Uh, selling point. Take that for example. Vikraisthal. It's literally translating to the place where things are sold, as opposed to really understanding the meaning of the the expression. Selling point. Um, yeah. So language is hard, and throw you know social media and ling lingo and other things that keep changing every day. It's pretty hard to keep up with it for AI systems. Now we have to add 170 plus of these languages. So uh, let's take a look at how we are doing, actually. When we look at um, uh, the current progress in the, in the space of NLP, 2019, I would say, is a defining moment. If you look at um, uh, some of the, the, the leaderboard tasks on NLP, um, I'm showing here some of the basic tasks. And it appears that computers are actually surpassing humans. Um, in some of the basic NLP tasks. I won't go through all of these, but uh, um, you know, the, the, the black line is the human, and glue score is the one that's primarily used, the dotted blue line. And there are many tasks that are out there on leaderboards with different data sets, and people are attempting um, so many different uh, algorithmic techniques to, to, to attempt the, at, at those uh, different tasks. And they seem to be you know, doing pretty well on those. Does that mean that we are actually mastering human language? How close are we to really understanding you know, uh, human language? Or how close are the AI systems to understanding human language? First of all, we should understand that glue score is a very poor representation of, uh, of all of the, the, the human language understanding. It's, it's one representation, one measurement metric that has been chosen by the NLP community. But they themselves would admit that that's not a very good um, uh, score. It's only limited to actually classification tasks. Um, it doesn't really represent some of the complexities of real human language. The, the question, question answering pairs of sorts of data sets that are given are very um, simple, and they don't represent the business world also. And mostly, the, these competitions and leaderboard things are limited to English. They don't scale all that well to other languages. So that's that. That's about the language of the humans. Now language of the enterprise. Let's look at what does it mean. Um, companies are build, applying AI to various different types of domains, right? To, to, for building chatbots, for building doctor's assistants, for in legal domain, healthcare domain, uh, financial domains, and so on. So many different domains. And they all have a vocabulary of their own. We don't encounter as many of these vocabularies in regular human language. So let's take this example. I don't want you to read all of this. Just focus on some of these yellow highlighted words. The one on the left is um, the doctor's note um, uh, on a patient. And you see words like meloxicam, lower sternum, troponin, um, acute coronary syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and so on. How often do you encounter that in regular human language? And the one on the right-hand side is a corporate contract. And here, you know, there are a lot of things about who owes what to whom by when, 
uh, sellers, buyers, their rights and, and obligations and so on. If we throw in a regular NLP task that masters one of the question answering systems at one, either of these two examples, they'll fall flat on their face. No hope, no chance. Because they don't understand the language of the enterprise at all. But if you look at the language of the enterprise, it's very, very hard. It's complex. There is not that much labeled data that's available. Um, and uh, it, there are a lot of privacy restrictions that really prevent data from going outside to really leverage crowds at large to get the data labeled. Um, of course, they require multilingual support. There is a lot of special vocabulary. Subject matter expertise is required. Um, and their subject matter experts are not programmers. Therefore, they can't really just simply go in and, and write some you know, additional expressions and such to, to add these vocabulary into the system. So um, enterprise data is complex, and it's, it's tucked away within enterprises, and it brings its own sets of challenges. So when I say polyglot AI, I don't necessarily just mean human, multiple languages as in the language that we speak in 170 plus. It's the language of, these, of the enterprises, like these kind of things, of the contract understanding, of uh, uh, understanding the vocabulary of uh, healthcare domain, of retail domain, financial domain, and so on. Um, so there, there uh, comes the first key, uh, key takeaway, right? It's polyglot en enterprise AI especially needs to be able to speak not only the language of the human, but the language of the enterprise. So, Understanding human language is hard, we said that. But uh, understanding enterprise AI, um, making AI speak enterprise language is even harder. So, but how do we make progress? Are we, are we at logjam, are we stuck? Well, here is where, you know, there is an insight that came to us as we were working on this. How about, you know, instead of trying to really address the broad AI, in the case of NLP, it's about really um, these systems being able to do Turing machine type of tasks, right? Being able to really, you know, do the broad AI. But how about, you know, we don't necessarily have to solve all of that. How about we narrow the domain and really be able to uh, address the specific problem at hand and address that, and as long as we are able to excel in that domain, it's fine, even if we don't solve the broad AI, right? So narrow the problem down, and it may not have to be, you know, really passing the Turing test. It could just be, does it understand on top of basic human understanding that it has, if it's able to pick up enough domain expertise for a particular industry, um, maybe that's just fine, that's the narrow AI, and you take it to a particular enterprise and actually deploy it there and let it further customize and learn from that particular enterprise's language for that particular company, it gets even better, and that's absolutely fine to address that narrow AI. There is no shame in, in actually solving a real problem instead of trying to attempt the full broad AI. And, and, and if you look at the learning curves, you can actually start to ride um, these learning curves um, by reducing the amount of training data, label data that you need because you're narrowing the problem. So you can accelerate learning faster. So now let's take a look at the same two examples that I gave earlier. Um, if we just applied the base human language understanding speech um, system um, and gave an audio spoken by a doctor, in the first iteration, it made the following mistakes. Where it said lower sternum, it ended up um, transcribing it as lower stardom. Uh, where was it supposed to be troponin? It ended up saying proponent. And for acute coronary syndrome, it heard it as good corn AR syndrome. For ulcerative colitis, it said a full sort of colitis. So few mistakes it made because it didn't have full understanding of that particular domain. All we had to do was to take that piece of text, actual with the correct transcription, just that piece of text, and customize our speech machine and rerun it, and there you go. All those mistakes that were in red now turned green, and the system was able to pick it up. So this is the power of really customizing and narrowing the domain. All you had to do was you know, have a base layer that's good enough, and then start to customize it to a specific domain. So again, I'm not giving specific ex uh, uh, experimental results here, which I will in just a bit, but intuitively, um, what this told us that you don't have to really p perfect the language of the humans in order to really attempt to solve the problem of the enterprise AI. You could actually begin to do it by narrowing the domain and solve the narrow AI, and you would get pretty good results and that are practical enough for you to use, use in enterprises. So now I want to talk about um, what does it really take to, to build these polyglot systems. In NLP, for natural language understanding specifically, there are three different techniques, broadly speaking, you could say. There is statistical approach, there is the rule-based approach, and then there is a, a third one, which is an interesting one, 
a human co-creation approach. And I'll take you through what these. Statistical NLP is pretty much machine learning. Everybody talks about it. Um, it has a lot. It takes a lot of labeled data and uh, uh, processes the data, learns the patterns, and produces prediction models. Right. So in a conventional approach, if we were to build a polyglot AI model, what we would do is we would be taking English data, labeled data, to build an English model. We'll be taking German data to build a German model. We'll be taking Chinese data, labeled data, to build a Chinese label model. This is how we were doing it pre-BERT, right? Uh, the universal language model. Of course, that's very inefficient, highly uh, co not cost effective, um, cumbersome, so many models to manage and maintain. Thank God we have BERT now. Um, we have this uh, multilingual model. We can train it with massive amounts of Wikipedia data. Now we have one universal model. Throw in all kinds of labeled data into it. Out comes one cross-lingual model that we can use and deploy one model to manage and maintain. Right. So the broad AI solution for it is throw in Wikipedia data because it's parallel data in different languages. You throw in and the system learns the, the word embeddings and the, the associations between words in different languages. And it's able to make um, this cross-lingual model. That's the broad AI. Now, what we want to be able to do is to take that pre-trained BERT and actually on, on the top layer, really start to now add this additional data. T think about this as the narrowing or the customization that I was talking about you know, in, the, in the triangle. So the top layer is now a, a fast forward neural network, a feed forward neural network and with softmax. And we start to feed in the specific uh, label data of a particular enterprise or a particular industry on top of the pre uh, trained BERT to now start to customize it further. So here is an example. You could take English um, insurance companies for customer support domain, very specifically, and start to feed it in through um, on top of the, the pre-trained BERT. Uh, and throw, throw in different languages, say German companies, customer support insurance domains data. Same thing for Chinese and so on. Um, on top of the pre-trained BERT, now we get one cross-lingual model for insurance industry, and for customer support use case. Specific, right? Very specific. I want to be really specific because that's the problem that I want to solve. I don't particularly care to solve Turing machine problem here. Um, now, we could go one step further and say, OK, there's a particular company called ABC Insurance Company, and they want to deploy their customer support chatbot. Now, I want to further customize this model for them. So now, again, the same idea. Take the universal NLU model you have, the insurance industry-specific model we have. On top of it, throw in this additional, very specific company-specific data, uh, the softmax layer on top. Now you get another model out, and this is the statistical NLP. So we applied this to our sentiment model uh, just to test it out to see how it works. And I'll, I'll just present these examples. So we threw in English, Spanish, Italian, Brazilian, Portuguese, and so on, eight, eight different languages labeled data. And the first column in the table talks about the accuracy when you build it with, a, with one single model. That is, take English data, build an English model. Take Japanese data, take, build Japanese model, not using BERT. Right? So that's the accuracy. Whereas the, 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 the third column on there um, shows really with um, uh, one, uh, the BERT model, language independent model, um, what happens if we, if, we, if we try to make a sentiment prediction across these three labels, positive, negative, neutral, um, the accuracy numbers. So obviously, this is showing us that uh, it's pretty encouraging, We're pretty good. Um, you know, our accuracy is on par or better, so that's great. BERT model is working. Now we wanted to see, what, can I do zero-shot learning? That is, um, without actually feeding any labeled data in a particular language, can I actually make the model predict in the sentiment in that language? Now, that's an interesting thought. How could you actually pr make predictions without giving any label data whatsoever in a machine learning model? Well, that's the power of uh, you know, BERT and statistical uh, model here, with, where you, know, you have word embeddings from multiple languages that are pre-trained. Um, it so turns out that um, uh, when we try to make a prediction in French with zero-shot learning, we're not bad at all, about 57% as compared to the 54% when you actually train a French model with labeled data, a single uh, model without using BERT at all. And on top of it, if you add some labeled data, it increases further to 64%. So that's pretty encouraging to start with. Of course, if you add more labeled data and if it sees, saw more instances, um, you'd probably get better uh, even further. So what's the problem? Why can't we just use this? Well, the problem is statistical NLP requires large amounts of labeled data. 
it's impractical in many, many domains, like the contract understanding domain that I had just shown. And it's not very transparent and it's not very explainable. Right? So the example on the left-hand side may, may be addressed with statistical NLP, but the example on the right-hand side cannot be because you, you cannot get so many contracts from a company be labeled by experts to tell you exactly what, who owes what to whom um, so that the system gets enough understanding to learn patterns. It's, it's too much to ask for. So that's where rule-based NLP comes handy. Right? Uh, rule-based NLP is talking all about these different kinds of uh, NLP stack tasks that you have um, already, uh, you know, like sentence segmentation, tokenization, part of speech tagging, lemmatization. Keep on building on that stack and write addition, write, uh, have a subject matter expert use a rule language to write rules. Um, so you are actually able to tell the system that you know, this verb, when this, it's followed by this kind of an entity, um, this is what it means, and it's considered to be an obligation in a particular domain, and so on. Um, and you go further and, and use semantic role labeling you know, to really identify who owes what to whom, or who, who did what to whom, and, and where. Um, and use preposition bank, uh, from, pre banks from different uh, languages, and uh, you know, start to build out this you know, cross-lingual or multilingual uh, information extraction. Um, and apply that um, to, to specific uh, domains where you don't have too much label data. So a rule that's built with an, uh, an SQL-like query language that was developed at IBM Research called Annotation Query Language would look like that on the top right corner. Uh, and if you take the text on the left-hand side and run it through that um, annotation query language, you would start to actually derive things like what you see, you know, what's an obligation, who's the purchaser, whether it's a purchase or not, and so on. Um, so you, this is what is uh, the rule-based one giving. However, these are complex to write, right? Um, who would, how, you, we have to really train people to write that SQL type of uh, languages. So there are disadvantages to this approach too, in the sense that it's helpful, useful to do um, large amounts of training data uh, with small amounts of training data, but you cannot really, um, um, you cannot really um, have a subject matter experts write those rules. Um, so the third approach that we have come up with is um, human rule co-creation. Basically use deep learning algorithms, machine learning, statistical NLP to train rules and expose those rules to humans so that they don't have to have the burden of writing the rules, but the rules are written a priori that they can then correct. That's the human co-creation rule learning approach. And uh, when we did tests with that, actually it, it does pretty well when humans are refining the rules that are already done by uh, machine learning models. So to summarize, I would say, you know, I've presented three different approaches. Each of them have different pros and cons on their own. Um, but uh, you, know, you have to really pick and choose based on your needs. So uh, to sum, sum up, you know, the key takeaways for building polyglot enterprise AI, you have to really make sure that the systems understand not only the language of the humans, but the language of the enterprise. Um, also, there's no shame in solving the narrow AI uh, as opposed to trying to do the broad AI. And also, depending on your availability of label data and you know, what are the transparency requirements that you have and such, you may have different approaches at your disposal, like the three that I mentioned. Um, so you may want to consider those things as you're building polyglot enterprise AI systems. Thanks very much, Rama. Thank wonderful talk. Thanks. Great. That's great. Well, we have one more talk left before lunch, and uh, I'm very excited about uh, Talithia Williams joining us here on stage today as well. You may know her from her book on power and numbers about rebel women of math. Uh, you may also know her from, uh, from Nova Wonders. She's a, a very talented woman, and I'm so glad you could make it here today at WIDS. Delicia. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm even more excited. Where, Donnelly, where are you? Because I want to get my picture. Like, I've been looking. I'm like, how do I want maybe like a post? Is that it? Yeah? OK. All right. Awesome. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about owning your body's data. I am the only thing that's keeping you from lunch. So yeah, I get to draw this out. No, I'm joking. I won't draw it out at all. Um, this talk is sort of built from uh, the TED Talk uh, that I've given. Don't, those are my mom. My mom watches it. She finds a different computer at the library just to show her support. Um, but talking about ways that we can use uh, data that we collect from our body to make decisions about our health. And so that's kind of where I'm going to take you today. 
This was an email that I got from Fiona. Um, she says, Dear Talithia, I'm ashamed to say that at 33, I've yet to learn uh, myself how my body works. My interest in this subject was peaked after I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Probably some of us may suffer from that as well in all of his sexy symptoms glory. Unfortunately, dealing with doctors was an exercise in frustration, she says. This prompted me to start researching how I could take control, understand, and aim for healing versus symptom management. Somewhere in all of this, I came across your TED Talk. In my experience, far too few women are aware of the reasons why their body acts the way it does, me included. And reading, reading da hard data is either too boring or flies over one's head. Not for any of us in this room, but okay, okay all right, Fiona. Uh, your example was simple yet beautiful and enlightened me uh, to the why behind one nuance of my amazing being, so thank you. Um, it was really special for me to get this email from her because it really sort of validated the need to help people think about the data that they produce from their own body and how they can take ownership of that and how they can use that in decision making. So question for you, what kind of data do you collect about your body or what types of data do people collect about your bodies? Let me see your hands. Get the blood flowing. Yes, right here. You got to yell it out. Your monthly flow, yes. Don't we do that, guys, in the room? Yes. <laughs> Sleep, data. Sleep data, yes. What else? Two hands back there, go ahead. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Body, temperature. Body temperature. Yes, yes. Go right ahead, I'm sorry. Exercise data. Exercise data. Weight. Weight. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. She said yours, we were like, yeah, who really takes their weight? Like, no, nah, I don't wanna see it, really. I can tell when, they, when it won't button. I'm like, I know, I know it's changing. Um, so we collect data with all types of devices. How many of you have on a device right now that is collecting data about your body? Yes. How many of you use any of that data that gets collected? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, you should, you should feel ashamed. Yeah, you should. We're gonna talk about how you can do that today. Next question, why is it important to understand your body's data? Yes. Change tells you that, that's right. Because if it's not changing, guess what? You're dead, so yeah. <laughs> right, change tells you, I'm glad you like that, yeah. What else, why is it important? Yeah. Keep track, of progress. Keep track of progress, that weight loss progress that we're all making progress on. Why else is it important? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, you can help others. Right, when my, my father-in-law got sick, I remember taking his data to the doctor because, you know, his dad, what, he, didn't, he was 86, he didn't look at it. But I started to see how his health was actually improving as his diet changed, absolutely. Right, lots of things that we can do when we collect that data. So um, let's talk about how we can use our personal data to sort of create a digital footprint, right? That's kind of where we're gonna go with this talk. Sleep data, you mentioned it. I think this is my husband's one, Evening, falling asleep at 9.35 p.m. <laughs> Look there, no time to fall asleep. Just, just knocked out, really, just, uh. Did he wake up? No, no. Was he restless? Yeah, six times or so. He was in the bed for almost seven hours. He was actually asleep for almost seven hours. Yours truly, on the other hand, I went to sleep earlier, believe it or not, and what happened? Woke up twice, maybe some kid was breastfeeding, somebody had to go pee, I don't know. It was twice, restless 16 times. But having this data is beneficial because now I can understand why, I, I, I was in the bed so long, I don't understand why I wake up tired. Oh, it's because I woke up literally, you know, 18 times last night for different reasons, my body was restless, right? So information that we get just by looking at your actual sleep. How many of you actually look at your sleep data, okay, or know your sleep patterns? Absolutely. My family's really competitive, and uh, even with the boys, with, we, we have three boys, and uh, we each had Fitbits, and we would do these family competitions to make sure that people stayed active. And so here's a, a snapshot of one of our competitions. You see Donald, he probably didn't win. I'm sure I came back that week. But um, 
at the top, me, uh, there's our son Josiah, Noah, right? We're all a, a part of this competition, but what it does show us is our activity during the day. So this particular day, you can see that I wasn't really getting up every hour, right? There are hours that pass without me moving, and it makes me conscious of that time that I'm not um, active. It also helps uh, us to, to raise kids that are thoughtful about their activity during the day, right? So they're getting up and moving around because their Fitbit is buzzing that they've been seated for 50 minutes and you want to get up and make this time. And so this is a way that we make, um, uh, make sort of this a fun activity in our family, right? By making it competitive, but it's also helping us to, to improve our health and to keep track of this data. I love that you can look at the aggregate of the data. Um, this was an interesting goal. The goal was four million steps in a year. And notice that uh, midway through September it was close to three million. And so it was like, oh, I wonder if I can push it to get to a four million step goal. Right, who knows if they've done four million steps in a year? Psh. No? So having these goals for our family actually improves our activity and improves our overall health because we're able to see the data. We're also able to see, like, where are these peaks happening? Where are we having really good days where we're getting 15,000 steps? What am I doing on that day? And how can I make more of those days happen? Um, the other thing that uh, my family likes to do is work out. Believe it or not, this is a picture uh, my husband teaches spin. And this was on Thanksgiving Day, because, you know, I mean, if you're going to eat poorly, I feel like if you work out in the morning, like, it justifies, you know, what, what's going to happen later. So we actually went and did spin uh, on Thanksgiving morning. We try to be a really active family. Uh, my husband also plays racquetball, and he's sort of that type A personality that writes everything down. He's very meticulous and detail-oriented. That's probably many of you in the room. He keeps track of his racquetball data. This is by his heart rate. So here you're looking at different heart rate intensity zones. So gray is the lowest zone, and then it goes to sort of a um, charcoal and blue, and then red is really high intensity, followed by yellow and then green. Uh, notice that he has notes in the corner, right? So he goes in to the app to put in notes to correspond to his data. I know, yeah, I, I married up. <laughs> Woo! Uh, here's his training data. He said racquetball singles with Zachary. One four of four games. Not, I mean, he's so modest, really. Um, and in fact, you can see where his heart rate intensity was picking up, right? Just looking at his heart rate trace, right? He's, he's uh, playing four games. He's going and going and going. He's got some pushes at the end. Great. You know, so the statistician in me is love and looking at his data. And so I'm skimming through and I'm like, oh, honey, wait a minute. A couple... This is not a week later. A week later, you're playing with Jimmy. You won one and you lost two. Oh, gosh, what, what happened? And so I wanted to uncover what was different about that day. I said, well, when I look at your data, you've got these peaks of where you're playing, but then you kind of have this lull in between. Like, I didn't see that with your, your previous data. What was happening? What were you guys doing? I mean, Jimmy's a different person, so yeah, there's some, you know, difference. But this data looks different from when you were winning. And he said, oh, yeah, when I played Jimmy, after each round, we'd go outside, we'd have a sip of water, I'd sit down, I'd rest, my heart rate, you know, I'd cool down a little bit, and then I'd go back in. I was like, and you went back in and lost? Right, you gotta stay in there and keep it going because Jimmy's beating up on you while you're chilling, drinking water, right? And so it was interesting to sort of see the difference in the data and not just for Donald, right? This works for competitive sports teams, football teams, right? Basketball teams at our institution. How can we help our students see, right? The difference in their data and whether or not they win or they lose, right? How might that influence what happens? Um, last thing I want to share, uh, what else we can learn from our heart data is how, uh, how our body is changing on the inside. So early on in our marriage, um, my husband suffers from allergies and uh, we, had, we were newlyweds and one night he couldn't sleep and, and he's up and he's like, honey, I can't breathe. And I'm like, can you, can you breathe out of your mouth, you know? And he's like, yeah, but I can't breathe out of my nose, it's my nose, you know? And I'm like, well, just... Like your, body, like, your body's not gonna let you not breathe out of your mouth. Like, let's just 
see about this in the morning. And he's like, no, no, I think we need to go to the ER. And so I'm like, fine, you know, I, I don't want you to die on my watch. This is just the first month. Your, you know, your parents are going to think I did it. And so, um, and so I get up and I drive him to the ER. I kid you not, that was my thought. It wasn't his health. It was like, people are going to blame me in my cooking. Like, I, eh, let me just take you to the doctor. So we get to the ER and um, we walk in and I say, you know, hi, my husband's having trouble breathing, you know, and I'm like out of his nose, but the mouth is working fine, you know. Um, <laughs> and the doctor sort of looks him up and down and he's like, let's take you to the back. We're going to run an EKG and to do a cascade and we're going to, and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, no, no, he's, it's allergies. I'm sure it's allergies. And so we get rushed to the back and we're telling the doctor what's happening. And I'm like, hey, you guys are overreacting. He just, he, he took this medication and he took some Afrin and then he did a nasal decongestion. And, and the doctor was like, we're just gonna, you know, we got this, we might have to go to surgery. And I was just like, time out, like what is, am I really killing him? And so, <laughs> and so we're there and then, so, he, so my husband's getting a little frustrated cause he's sort of like, well, I didn't know it was, was I that bad, you know? And I'm like, well, you, you ride your bike. Like how can, you know, how can your heart not be that good? You ride your bike all the time. And so anyway, this doctor, um, his shift was ending, so a new uh, person on call came in. This is about 4, 4.30 a.m., and we're, we're, we're ragged because we've sort of been, you know, uh, on this roller coaster of what's happening to his health. And this new doctor, he comes in, and he says, tell me, you know, what's up? I'm, lo I'm looking at why you guys are here. We think he's having a heart attack. And I said, well, I don't think that's it. He... He, he bikes a lot and, and, you know, and then we started walking him through the evening. Like we got home and he took this medication, he took some Afrin, he took a decongestant. And he said, oh, you never want to mix those two because they clog your nasal passages. Let me give you this instead. And we were like, but, like well, we told the other doctor that too and he thought it was a heart attack. And you're saying you don't want to mix these two because it did exactly what it did for my husband. It clogged his nasal passages and brought us to the ER. And he said, well, when a 300 pound man walks in the ER and says he can't breathe, you assume he's having a heart attack and you ask questions later. And so part of me was like, well, I, I mean, I, I guess, but he's not having a heart attack and, you know. So, this is my husband's actual heart rate, uh, heart trace data from October of 2010 through July of 2012. He started in the hypertension, pre-hypertension zone of his heart rate data. And over the course of uh, a year and a half or so, got down to a very healthy, normal zone. And what was interesting to me was that this data of his heart health was really describing a process that was happening uh, on the outside, right? We, we moved to California, that in and of itself, that'll make you vegan, like as soon as you, you just, we were in Texas where no one is vegan, no one's vegetarian, I'm you know, sorry for those of you watching from Texas, yay, Texas. Um, so we moved from Texas to California and we were like, oh my gosh, these farmers market, like is this what a strawberry tastes like? Are you kidding me? Um, and so he lost over 150 pounds, and our kids have also been the beneficiary of that. We've got gardens, and we get, um, we're now, we've now actually become vegan, like we're one of some of those people. Um, but it's really changed the family dynamic and led to a, a healthy family lifestyle because we were able to look at this data, right, and see how the data was changing us and how we could also work to change that data. So three points I want to leave you with, four points I want to leave you with today, um, kind of my take home message. Uh, many of you, as you raise your hand, you're already taking these daily measurements about your body, but I want to challenge you to try to understand those and how can you uh, infer your health from that data, right? So what is it that you can do now that you know that you only took 3,832 steps yesterday? How is that going to change your behavior? So how are we going to let data change our behavior? Share our data with the doctor and with our loved ones and also get them to share their data with us, right? We're data-centric folks in this room. We're not afraid of the data. We may see patterns that our family doesn't see.
We may see th uh, health challenges that are coming on that we pick up just by looking at their data. So how can we um, be a conduit for helping them understand their health? And then I love this last part, thinking about how, uh, as a professor, I'm always thinking about how to broaden participation in statistics and data science. Um, what are gateways to the field outside of calculus? Calculus is a high hurdle to get folks into data science and statistics. What are other ways to enter our profession? And students are big on data, especially personal data, especially if it has something to do with maybe sports data. So how might we think about courses that might be a gateway to the major outside of sort of the traditional very heavy math calculus based track because I think that would help encourage students to pursue data science. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> that, was, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Alicia. Wow, that was amazing. I, and it's good, it's lunchtime, because now you can do, uh, go outside and, and step around a little bit and, and let us know how many steps you took. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, before we, we uh, leave for, uh, for break and, and I tell you about the breakout sessions, a shout out to Purdue and a shout out to WPI. They're closing down pretty soon at the uh, East Coast, and, uh, but they've been with us at, at WPI, but they've been with us most of the day. Um, a few things about the, the lunch. So lunch is available outside uh, for you. Many of you have signed up for break that, breakout sessions. If you do not know where you need to go, just go outside these doors here and there will be people with signs that will take you and walk you over to rooms, especially those outside in Sieper. If you have not signed up for a breakout session yet, uh, I was just thinking about deep learning here in this room in McCall. Uh, you could join that or you could join, for example, data ethics in, in the CEPR building. And again, just follow um, the students with the signs who are ready for you outside. Uh, other than that, uh, during lunchtime, we'll also be live streaming with interviews by uh, the Cube. And we'll see you back here at 2 o'clock. I hope you have a wonderful lunch. You can connect, enjoy the California sunshine. And we'll see you this afternoon.
Live from Stanford University, it's The Cube. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagare, and we're live at Stanford University covering WIDS, Women in Data Science Conference, the fifth annual one. And joining us today is Daphne Kohler, who is the co-founder, who, sorry, is the CEO and founder of Incitro. Daphne, welcome to theCUBE. Nice to be here, Sonia. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about Incitro, how you, how it, you got it founded, and more about your role. So I've been um, working in the intersection of machine learning and biology and health for quite a while, and um, it was always a bit of a, an interesting journey in that the data sets were quite small and limited. We are now in a different world where there's tools that are allowing us to create massive biological data sets that I think can help us solve really significant societal problems. And uh, one of those problems that I think is really important is drug discovery and development, where despite many important advancements, the costs just keep going up and up and up. And the question is, can we use machine learning to, do, to solve that problem better? And, and you talk about this more in your keynote, so give us a few highlights of what you talked about. So uh, in the last, um, you can think of drug discovery and development in the last 50 to 70 years as being a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty. The glass half full is the fact that there's diseases that used to be a death sentence or a sentence to a lifelong of pain and suffering that are now addressed by some of the modern day medicines. And I think that's absolutely amazing. The other side of it is that the cost of uh, developing new drugs has been growing exponentially in what's come to be known as Irum's law, being the inverse of Moore's law, which is the one we're all familiar with, uh, because the number of drugs approved uh, per billion US dollars just keeps going down exponentially. So the question is, can we change that curve? And you talk in your keynote about the interdisciplinary culture. So tell us more about that. I think in order to address some of the critical problems that we're facing, one needs to really build a culture of uh, people who work together at, uh, from different disciplines, each bringing their own um, insights and their own ideas into the mix. So at Incitro, we actually have a company that's half life scientists, um, many of whom are producing data for the purpose of driving machine learning models, and the other half are machine learning people and data scientists who are um, working on those, but it's not a handoff where one group produces the data and the other one consumes and interprets it, but really they start from the very beginning to understand what are the problems that one could solve together, how do you design the experiment, how do you build the model, and how do you derive insights from that that can help us make better medicines for people. And um, I also wanted to ask you, you co-founded Coursera, so tell us a little bit more about that platform. So I founded Coursera as a result of work that I'd been doing at Stanford, um, working on how technology can make education better and more accessible. Um, this was a project that I did here, a number of uh, my colleagues as well. And um, at some point in the fall of 2011, there was an experiment of let's take some of the content that we've been we'd been developing um, within it's within Stanford and put it out there for people to just benefit from. And we didn't know what would happen. Would it be a few thousand people? But within a matter of weeks with minimal advertising other than one New York Times article that went viral, um, we had 100,000 people in each of those courses. And that was a moment in time where, you know, we looked at, it, at this and said, can we just go back to writing more papers? Or is there an incredible opportunity to transform access to education to people all over the world? And so I ended up taking a what was supposed to be a two-year leave of absence from Stanford to go and uh, co-found Coursera. And um, I thought I'd go back after two years, but the um, but at the end of that two-year period, the there was just so much more to be done and so much more impact that we could bring to people all over the world, um, people of both genders, people of um, the different social economic status, every single country around the world. We, I just felt like this was something that I couldn't not do. And how did you, why did you decide to go from an educational platform to then going into machine learning and biomedicine? 
So I'd been doing Coursera for about five years um, in 2016, and um, the company was on a great trajectory, but it's primarily a, a, a content company, and around me, machine learning was transforming the world, and I wanted to come back and be part of that. And when I looked around, I saw machine learning being applied to e-commerce and to natural language and to uh, self-driving cars, but there really wasn't a lot of impact being made on the life science area, and I wanted to be part of making that happen, partly because I felt like, uh, coming back to our earlier comment, that in order to really have that impact, you need to have someone who speaks both languages. And while there's a new generation of researchers who are bilingual in biology and in machine learning, there's still a small group, and there are very few of those in kind of my age cohort. And I thought that I would be able to have a real impact by building a company in this space. So it sounds like your background is pretty varied. Um, what advice would you give to women who are just starting college now who may be interested in a similar field? Would you tell them they have to major in math or, or do you think that maybe like there are some other majors that may be influential as well? I think there's a lot of ways to get into data science. Uh, math is one of them, but there's also statistics or physics. And I would say that especially for the field that I'm currently in, which is at the intersection of machine learning data science on the one hand and biology and health on the other, one can um, get there from biology or medicine as well. But what I think is important is not to shy away from the more mathematically oriented courses in whatever major you're in, because that foundation is a really strong one. There's a lot of people out there who are basically lightweight consumers of, of data science and they don't really understand how the methods that they're uh, deploying, how they work, and that limits them in their ability to advance the field and come up with new methods um, that are m better suited perhaps to the problems that they're tackling. So I think it's totally fine and in fact there's a lot of value to coming into data science from fields other than math or computer science, but I think taking courses in those fields, even while you're majoring in whatever field you're interested in, is going to make you a much better person who lives at that intersection. And how do you think having a technology background has helped you in, in founding your companies and has helped you become a successful CEO? In companies that are very strongly R&D focused, like, um, like in Citro and others, having a technical co-founder is absolutely essential because it's um, fine to have an understanding of the, whatever the user needs and so on and come from the business side of it, and a lot of companies have a business co-founder, but not understanding what the technology can actually do is highly limiting uh, because you end up hallucinating, oh, if we could only do this, and that, that would be great, but you can't. And um, people end up oftentimes making ridiculous promises about what the technology will or will not do because they just don't understand where the landmines sit and, um, and where you're going to hit uh, real obstacles in the, in the path. So I think it's really important to have a strong technical foundation in these companies. And that being said, where do you see Incitra in the future and, and how do you yeah. see it uh, solving, say, uh, Nash that you talked about in your keynote? So um, we hope that Incitra will be a fully integrated drug discovery and development company that is based on a completely different foundation than a traditional pharma company where they grew up in the old um, approach of um, that is very much a bespoke scientific um, analysis of the biology of different diseases and then going after uh, targets or, um, or ways of dealing with the disease that are driven by human intuition. Where I think we have the opportunity to go today is to build a very data-driven approach that collects massive amounts of data and then let analysis of those data really reveal new hypotheses that might not be the ones that accord with people's preconceptions of what matters and what doesn't. And so hopefully we'll be able to, over time, create enough data and apply machine learning to address key bottlenecks in the drug discovery and development process so that we can bring better drugs to people and we can do it faster and hopefully at much lower cost. That's great. And um, you also mentioned in your keynote that you think the 2020s is like a digital biology era. Yeah. So tell us more about that. 
So I think if you look, uh, if you take a historical perspective on science and think back, you realize that um, there's periods in history where one discipline has made a tremendous amount of progress in a relatively short amount of time because of a new uh, technology or a new way of looking at things. In the 1870s, that discipline was chemistry with the understanding of the periodic table and that you actually couldn't turn lead into gold. Um, in the 1900s, that was physics with understanding the connection between matter and energy and between space and time. In the 1950s, that was computing where silicone chips were suddenly able to perform calculations that up until that point only people had been able to do. And then in the 1990s, there was an interesting bifurcation. One was um, the era of data, which is related to computing, but also involves elements of statistics and optimization and neuroscience. And the other one was quantitative biology, in which biology moved from a descriptive science of taxonomizing phenomena to really probing and measuring biology in a very detailed um, and, and high throughput way using techniques like microarrays that measure the activity of 20,000 genes at once, or the human genome, sequencing of the human genome, and many others. Um, but these two fields kind of evolved in parallel. And what I think is coming now, uh, 30 years later, is the convergence of those two fields into one field that I like to think of as digital biology, where we are able, using the tools that have and continue to be developed, um, measure biology in entirely uh, new levels of detail, of fidelity, of scale. We can use the techniques of machine learning and data science to interpret what we're seeing and then use some of the technologies that are also emerging to engineer biology to do things that it otherwise wouldn't do. And that will have implications in biomaterials, in energy in the environment, in agriculture, and I think also in human health. And it's an incredibly exciting space to, to be in right now because just so much is happening and the opportunities to make a difference and make the world a better place are just so large. That sounds awesome. Daphne, thank you for your insight and thank, thank you for you being on much. the Cube. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Sonia Tagari. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. Okay. Great. Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagare, and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS, Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Lillian Carrasquillo, who is the Insights Manager at Spotify. Lillian, welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, thank you, Sonia, for having me. So tell us a little bit about your role at uh, Spotify. Yeah, so I'm actually one of a few insights managers in the personalization team. Um, and within my little group, we think about data and algorithms that help power the larger personalization experiences throughout Spotify. So from your daily mix and Discover Weekly to your year-end rap stories to your experience on home and the search results. That's awesome. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the personalization um, team? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a variety of different product areas that come together to form the personalization mission, uh, which is mission is like the, the term that we use for a big department at Spotify. Um, and we c collaborate across different product areas to understand what are the foundational data sets and the foundational uh, machine learning tools that are needed to be able to uh, create features that a user can actually experience in the app. Great, um, and so you're going to be on the career panel today. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that? I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah the WID team has done a great job of bringing together a, like a, you know, diverse is very uh, it's a it's an overused term sometimes, but a very diverse group of people with lots of different types of experiences, which I think is core to how I think about data science. It's a wide definition, mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's great to show 
younger and mid-career women, all of the different career paths that we can all take. And what advice would you would you give to women yeah. who are coming out of college right now about data science? Yeah, so my, my big advice is to follow your interests. So there's so many different types of data science problems. You don't have to just go into a title that says data scientist or a team that says data scientist. You can follow your interests and do your data science, uh, use your data science skills in ways that might require a lot of collaboration or mixed methods um, or work within a team where uh, there are different types of different different types of expertise coming together to work on problems. And speaking of mi mixed methods, um, Insights is a team that's a mixed methods research group. Yeah. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So I personally manage um, a data scientist and a, and a um, user researcher, and the three of us collaborate highly together across our disciplines. We also collaborate across research science, um, the research science team right into the product and engineering teams that are actually delivering the different products that users get to see. Um, so it's highly collaborative and the idea is to understand the problem space deeply together, be able to understand what is it that we're trying to even just form in our head as like the need that, that a user or end human end user human has mm -hmm. um, and bringing in research from research scientists and the product side to be able to understand those needs and then actually um, have insights that another human, you know, a product owner, can really think through and understand um, the current space and like the product opportunities. And to understand that user insight, um, do you use A-B testing? We use a lot of A-B testing, so that's core to how we think about um, our users at Spotify. Um, so we use a lot of A-B testing, we do a lot of offline experiments to understand the potential consequences or impact that certain interventions can have. Um, but I think A-B testing, you know, there's so much to learn about best practices there. And when you're talking about a team that does foundational data and foundational features, you also have to think about unintended or second order effects of algorithmic um, A-B tests. So it's been just like a huge area of learning and a huge area of just like very interesting outcomes. And like every test that we run, we learn a lot about not just the individual thing we're testing, but just the process overall. And um, uh, what are some features of Spotify that customers really love? Anything you can oh, dish man. on? Anything that's like, we know you. So daily mix, people absolutely love. Every time that I make a new friend and I tell them what they work on, they're like, I was just listening to my daily mix this morning. Um, Discover Weekly for people who really want to stay you know, open to new music is also very popular. But I think the one that really takes it is any of the end of year wrapped campaigns that we have. Mm -hmm. Just the, the nostalgia that people have even just for the last year. But in 2019, we were actually able to do 10 years. And that amount of nostalgia just like went through the roof. Like people were just like, oh my goodness, you captured the time that I broke up with that, you know, that person <laughs> five years ago. Or, or just like, oh, when I discovered that I love Taylor Swift, even though I didn't think I liked her or something like that, you know. Are there any surprises or interesting stories that you have about um, interesting user uh, experiences? Yeah, I mean, I can give I can give you an example from my experience. So recently, um, a few few months ago, I was scrolling through my home feed and I noticed that one of the highly rated things for me was um, women in country, and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't consider myself a country fan, right? And I was like having this moment where I went through this path of, wait, that's weird. Why would why would this recommend, why would the home screen recommend women in country, country music to me? And then w when I click through it, um, it would show you, you know, a little bit of information about it. It's because it had, you know, Dolly Parton, it had Margot Price, and it had the high women. And those were all artists that I've been listening to a lot, but I just had not formed an identity as a country music. And then I clicked through it and it was like, oh, this is a great playlist. And I listened to it. And it got me to the point where I was realizing I really actually do like country music when the stories are centered around women. <laughs> that it was really fun to discover other artists that I wouldn't have otherwise jumped into as well, based on the fact that I love the story writing and the songwriting of these other um, country acts. That's so cool that yeah. you discovered that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have uh, a degree in industrial mathematics, and yeah. you went to a liberal arts college on purpose yeah. because you wanted to try out different classes. So how has that diversity of education really helped you in your yeah. career? Yeah, so my undergrad is uh, from Smith College, which is a liberal arts school, very strong liberal arts foundation. And when I went to visit, um, one of the math professors that I met told me that he, you know, he considers studying math not just to make you better at math, 
but that it makes you a better thinker and you can take in much more information and sort of ass question assumptions and, and try to build a foundation for what the problem that you're trying to think through is. Um, and I just found that extremely interesting. And I also, you know, I have an undeclared major in Latin American studies and I, I studied um, like neuroscience and quantum physics for non-experts and film class and all of these other things that um, I don't know if I would have had the same opportunity at a more technical school. And I just found it really um, challenging and satisfying to be able to push myself to think in different ways. Um, I even took a poetry writing class. I did not write good poetry, but the experience <laughs> really stuck with me because it was about pushing myself outside of my own boundaries. And would you recommend having this kind of like diverse education to, to young women now who are looking into going I to I absolutely to would. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a, some, some people believe that instead of thinking about STEAM, we should be talking, instead of thinking about STEM rather, we should be talking about STEAM, which adds the arts education in there, and liberal arts is one of them. And I think that now in these conversations that we have about biases in data and in ML and in AI, um, and understanding fairness and accountability, accountability, sorry, it's a hard word apparently. Um, I, I think that a strong uh, cross-disciplinary, um, collaborative, and even on an individual level, cross-disciplinary education is really the only way that we're going to be able to make those connections to understand what kind of second order effects we're having based on the decisions of parameters for a model. Right. You know, in a local sense, we're optimizing and doing a great job, but what are the global consequences of those decisions? And I think that that kind of interdisciplinary approach to education as an individual and collaboration as a team is really the only way. And speaking about bias, um, earlier we heard that um, diversity um, is great because it brings out new perspectives. Yeah. It also helps to reduce that unfair bias. Mm -hmm. So how at Spotify have you managed, or has Spotify managed yeah. to create a more diverse team? Yeah, so I, I mean, it starts with recruiting. It starts with what kind of messaging we put out there, and there's a great team that like thinks about that exclusively, and they're really pushing all of us as managers, as ICs, as leaders to really think about the decisions and the way that we talk about things and all of these micro decisions that we make and how that creates an inclusive environment. Because it's not just about diversity, it's also about making people feel like this is where they should be. Right. On a personal level, you know, I talk a lot um, with younger folks and people who are trying to just figure out what their place is mm -hmm. in technology, whether it be because they come from a different culture or, or, or um, you know, they might be gender non-binary, they might be women who feel like there isn't a place for them. Um, and it's really about, you know, the things that I think about is because you're different, your voice is needed even more, right. you know, and right. like your voice matters and we need to figure out. And I always ask, how can I highlight your voice more? You know, how can I help? I have a tiny, tiny bit of power and influence, you know, more than, than some other folks. How can I help other people um, acquire that as well? Lillian, thank you so much yeah, for your insight thank you. and thank you for being on the Cube. Yeah, thank you. I'm your host, Sonia Tagare. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more. Live from Stanford University, it's the Cube. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagari, and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Lucy Bernholtz, who is the senior, uh, senior research scholar at Stanford University. Lucy, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so you've led the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford for the past 11 years. So tell us more about that. Sure, so uh, the Digital Civil Society Lab actually exists because we don't think digital civil society exists. So let me back, take that apart for you. Civil society is that weird third space outside of markets and outside of government. So it's where we associate together. It's where we as people get together and do things that help other people. It could be the nonprofit sector, it might be political action, it might be the eight of us just getting together and cleaning up a park or um, protesting something we don't like. So that's civil society. But what's happened over the last 30 years really is that everything we use to do that work has become dependent on digital systems. And those digital systems, so I'm here I'm talking gadgets from our phones to the 
infrastructure over which data is exchanged, that entire digital system is built by companies and surveilled by governments. So where do we as people get to go digitally where we could have a private conversation to say, hey, let's go meet downtown and protest X and Y, or let's get together and create an alternative educational opportunity because we feel our kids are being overlooked, whatever. All of that information that get exchanged, all of that associating that we might do in the digital world, it's all being watched. It's all being captured. And that's a problem because both history and political science, history and democracy theory show us that when there's no space for people to get together voluntarily, take collective action, and do that kind of thinking and planning and communicating it just between the people they want involved in that, when that space no longer exists, democracies fall. So w the lab exists to try to recreate that space. And in order to do that, uh, we have to, first of all, recognize that it's being closed in. Secondly, we have to make real technological process. We need a whole set of different kind of dig different digital devices and norms. We need different kinds of organizations and we need different laws. So that's what the, the lab does. And how does ethics play into that? It's all about ethics and it's a word I try to avoid actually because especially in the tech industry, I'll be completely blunt here. It is, it's an empty term. It means nothing. The companies are using it to avoid being regulated. People are trying to talk about ethics, but they don't want to talk about values. But you can't do that. Ethics is a code of practice built on a set of articulated values. And if you don't want to talk about values, you're not really having a conversation about ethics. You're not having a, a conversation about the choices you're going to make in a difficult situation. You're not having a conversation over whether one life is worth 5,000 lives, or if everybody's lives are equal, or if, if you should um, shift the playing field to account for the millennia of systemic and structural biases that have been built into our system. There's no conversation about ethics if you're not talking about that thing. And those, those things, as long as we're just talking about ethics, we're not talking about anything. And um, you were actually on the ethics panel just now. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you guys talked about and yeah. what were some highlights. So I think one of the key things about the ethics panel here at WIDS this morning was that, first of all, it started the day, which is a good sign. If It shouldn't be a separate topic of discussion. We need this conversation about values, about what we're trying to build for, who we're trying to protect, how we're trying to recognize individual human agency, that has to be built in throughout data science. So it's a good start to have a panel about it at the beginning of the conference, but I'm hopeful that the rest of the conversation will not leave it behind. We talked about the fact that um, just as civil society is now dependent on these digital systems that it doesn't control, data scientists are building data sets and algorithmic forms of analyses that are, both of those two things, are just encoded sets of values. And if you try to have a conversation about that at just the math level, you're going to miss the social level. You're going to miss the fact that that's humanity you're talking about. So it needs to really be integrated throughout the process. Right. Talking about the values of what you're manipulating and the values of the world that you're releasing these tools into. And um, what are some key issues today regarding ethics and data science, and what are some solutions? So, uh, I mean, this is the Women in Data Science Conference. It happens because five years ago, or whenever it was, the organizers realized, hey, women are really underrepresented in data science, and maybe we should do something about that. That's true across the board. It's great to see hundreds of women here and around the world participating in a live stream, right? But as women, we need to make sure that as you're thinking about, again, the data and the algorithm, the data and the analysis, that we're thinking about all of the people, all of the different kinds of people, all of the different kinds of languages, all of the different abilities, all of the different races, languages, ages, you name it, that are represented in that data set, and understand those people in context. In, their da in your data set, they may look like they're just two different points of data. But in the world writ large, we know perfectly well that women of color face a different environment than white men, right? They don't work, walk through the world in the same way, and it's ridiculous to assume that your shopping algorithm isn't going to affect that difference that they experience in the real world that isn't going to affect that in some way. It's, it's, it's fantasy 
to imagine that it's not going to work that way. So we need different kinds of people involved in creating the algorithms, different kinds of people in power in the companies who can say, we shouldn't build that, we shouldn't use it. We need a different set of um, teaching mechanisms where uh, people are actually trained to, to um, consider from the beginning what's the intended positive, what's the intended negative, and what is some uh, likely negatives, and then decide how far they go down that path. And um, we actually had on Dr. Ruman Chowdhury from Accenture, yeah. and um, she's really big in data ethics, and um, she brought up the idea that just because we can doesn't mean that we should. So can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, well, it, it, just because we can um, analyze massive data sets and possibly make um, some kind of mathematical model that based on a set of value statements might say this person's more likely to get uh, this disease, or this person's more likely to excel in school at, in this dynamic, or this person's more likely to um, uh, commit a crime. Those are human experiences. And while analyzing large data sets that in, in the best scenario might actually take into account the societal creation that those actual people are living in, um, trying to extract that kind of analysis from that social setting, first of all, is, is absurd. Second of all, it's going to accelerate the existing systemic problems. So you've got to d use that kind of calculation over just because we could maybe um, do some things faster or with larger numbers are the externalities that are going to be caused by doing it that way, the actual harm to living human beings, are, should those just be ignored just so you can meet your shipping deadline? Because if we expanded our time horizon a little bit, if you expand your time horizon and look at some of the big companies out there now, they're now facing those externalities and they're doing everything they possibly can to pretend that they didn't create them. And that loop needs to be shortened so that you can actually sit down at the, at, you know, some way through the process before you release some of these things and say, you know, in the short term, it might look like we'd make X profit, but spread out that time horizon, you know, I don't know, two X, and you face uh, an election in the world's largest, longest lasting stable democracy that people are losing faith in. Is that a, the right price to pay? for a single company to meet its quarterly profit goals? I don't think so. So we need to reconnect those externalities back to the processes and the organizations that are causing those larger problems. Because essentially having externalities just means that your data is biased. Data are biased. Data about people are biased because people collect the data. There's, there's this idea that there's some magic de-biased data set is, is science fiction. It doesn't exist. It certainly doesn't exist for more than two purposes, right? If we could, and I don't think we can, de-bias a data set to then create an algorithm to do A, that same data set is not going to be de-biased for creating algorithm B. Humans are biased. Let's get past this idea that we can strip that bias out of human-created tools. What we're doing is we're embedding them in systems that accelerate them and expand them. They make them worse, <laughs> right. Right? right? They make them worse. So I'd spend a whole lot of time figuring out how to improve the systems and structures that we've already encoded with those biases and using that then to try to inform the data science. We're going about, in my opinion, we're going about this backwards. We're building the biases into the data science and then um, ex exporting the, those tools into bias systems. And guess what? Problems are getting worse. That, so let's stop doing that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your insight, Lucy. Thank you for being on theCUBE. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm Sonia Tigari. Thanks for watching theCUBE. Stay tuned for more.
Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host Sonia Tagari and we're live at Stanford University for the fifth annual WIDS Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Nung Ho, the Director of Data Science at Intuit. Nung, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me here, Sonia. So tell us a little bit about your role at Intuit. Yeah, so I lead the applied machine learning teams for our QuickBooks product lines and also for our customer success organization. Within my team, we do applied machine learning, so we specialize in building machine learning products and delivering them into our products for our users. Great, um, and today, today you're giving a talk. Um, you talk about how um, organizations want to achieve greater flexibility, speed, and cost efficiencies, um, and you're giving a, a technical vision talk today about data science in a cloud world. So what should data scientists know about data science in a cloud world? Well, I'll just give you a little bit of a preview into my talk later, because mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. But I think one of the most important things um, of being a data scientist in a cloud world is that you have to fundamentally change the way you work. A lot of us start on our laptops or um, a server and do our work there, but when you move to the cloud, it's like all bets are off, all the limiters are off, and so how do you fully take advantage of that? How do you change your workflow? What are some of the things that are available to you that you may not know about? And in addition to that, some, some things that you have to rewire in your brain to operate in this new environment. And so I'm going to share some experiences that I learned firsthand and also from my team in, into its cloud migration over the past six years. That's great, I'm excited to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you work at Intuit, Intuit has sponsored WIDS for many years now. Um, last year we, we spoke with Kavitha Sangwan mm -hmm. from Intuit, so tell us about this Intuit sponsorship. Yeah, so at Intuit, um, we are a champion of gender diversity and also all sorts of diversity. And when we first learned about WIDS, we said we need to be um, a champion of the Women in Data Science Conference because for me personally, oftentimes when I'm in a room um, going over technical details, I'm often the only woman. And not just that, I'm often the only woman executive. And so part of the sponsorship is to create this community of women, very technical women in this field, to share our work together, to build this community, and also to show the great diversity of work that's going on across the field of data science. And so Intuit has always been really great for, for embracing diversity. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about, about that experience, about being part of Intuit, and also about the tech women um, part. Yeah, so one of the things at Intuit that I really appreciate is we have employee groups around specific interests, and one of those employee groups is tech women at Intuit. And tech women at Intuit, the goal is to create a community of women um, who can provide coaching, mentorship, uh, technical development, leadership development, and um, I think one of the unique things about it is that it's not just focused on the technical development side, but on helping women develop into leadership positions. Um, for me, when I first started out, there were very few women in executive positions in our field. And data science is a brand new field, and so it takes time to get there. Now that I'm on the other side, one of the things that I want to do is be able to give back and coach the next generation. And so the Tech Women at Internet Group allows me to do that through a very strong mentorship program that matches me and early career mentees across multiple different fields so that I can provide that coaching and that leadership development. And, and speaking about um, like diversity, uh, in the opening address we heard that diversity creates perspectives and it also takes away bias. So yep. why is gender diversity so important to Intuit and how does it help um, take away that bias? Yeah, so one of the important things um, that I think a lot of people don't realize is when you go and you build your products, you bring in a lot of biases in how you build the product. And ultimately, the people who use your products are the general population. For us, we serve consumers, small businesses, and self-employed. And if you take a look at the diversity of our customers, it mirrors the general population. And so when you think about building products, you need to bring in those diverse perspectives so you can build the best products possible because the people who are using those products come from a diverse background as well. Right. Um, and so now um, at Intuit, like instead of going from a de de desktop-based application, we're at a cloud-based application, mm -hmm. which is a big part of your talk. Yep. Um, 
uh, how do you uh, use data to um, for A/B testing, and and why is it important? Yeah, oh, A-B testing. That is a personal passion of mine, actually, because as a scientist, what we like to do is run a lot of experiments to say, okay, what is the best thing out there? Um, so that ultimately, when you ship a new product or a feature, you send the best thing possible that's verified by data, and you know exactly how users are going to react to it. When we were on desktop, it made it incredibly difficult, because those were back in the days, and I don't know if you remember this, but Back in the days when you had a floppy disk, mm -hmm. right, or uh, even a CD-ROM, that's how we shipped our products. And so all the changes that you wanted to make had to be contained in there, and you really only ship it once per year. And so if there's any type of testing that we did, we would bring our users in, have them use our products a little bit, mm -hmm. and then say, okay, we know exactly what we need to do, ship that out, so you only get one chance. Now that we're in the cloud, what that allows us to do is to test continuously via A-B testing. Every new feature that comes out, we have a champion challenger model, and we can say, okay, the new version that we're shipping out is this much better than the previous one. We know it performs in this way, and then we get to make the decision, is this the best thing to do for our customer? And so you turn what was once a one-time process, a one-time change management process, to one that's distributed throughout the entire year, and at any one time, we're running hundreds of tests to make sure that we're shipping exactly the best things for our customers. That's awesome. Um, so um, what advice could you give to the next generation of women who are interested in STEM, but maybe feel like, oh, I might be the only woman, I don't know if I should do this? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing for me was finding mentorship. And Initially, when I was very early career, and even when I was doing my graduate studies, for me, a mentor was someone who was in my field. But um, when I first joined into it, an executive in another group who was a female said, hey, I'd like to take you aside, provide you some feedback, and this is some coaching I want to give you. And that was when I realized, hey, you don't actually need to have that person be in your field to actually guide you through to the next step. And so for women who are going through their journey and are early on, I recommend finding a mentor who is at a stage where you want to go, regardless of which field they're in, because everybody has diverse perspectives and things that they can teach you as you go along. And how do you think WIDS is helping um, women feel like they can do data science and be a part of the community? Yeah, I think what you'll see in the program today is a huge diversity uh, of our speakers, our panelists, through all different stages of their career and all different fields. And so what we get to see is not only the time baseline of women who are in their PhDs, all the way to very, very well-established women. The provost of Stanford University was here today, which is amazing to see someone at the very top of their career who's been around the block. Um, but the other thing is also the diversity in fields. When you think about data science, a lot of us think about just the tech industry but you see it in healthcare, you see it in academia, and so just seeing that wide diversity of where data science and where women who are practicing data science come from, I think is really empowering, because you can see yourself in there, and representation does matter quite a bit. Absolutely, and um, where do you see data science going forward? Oh, that is a uh, tough and interesting question, actually, and I think that, uh, in the current environment today, we could talk about where it could go wrong or where it could actually open the doors. And for me, I'm an eternal optimist. And one of the things that I think is really, really exciting for the future is we're getting to a stage where we're building models not just for the general population. We have enough data and we have enough compute where we can build a model tailored just for you, for all of your likes. And for me, I think that that is really, really powerful because we can build exactly the right solution to help our customers and our users succeed. Um, specifically, me working in the personal and small business finance space, that means I can help that cupcake shop owner actually manage her cash flow and to help her succeed. Right, to me, that, I think that's really powerful and that's where data science is headed. Nang, thank you so much for being on theCUBE and thank you for your insight. Thank you so much, Sonia. I'm Sonia Tagare, thanks for watching theCUBE. Stay tuned for more.
Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host Sonia Tagare and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Yashu, the head of data science at LinkedIn. Yeah, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your role and about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is, uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, the biggest professional social network uh, where we have a massive uh, economic graph that we have been creating with millions, actually close to 700 million members and uh, millions of companies and jobs and, and of, of course, you know, with students of skills and, and also at schools as well as part of it. And, uh, and I lead the data science team at LinkedIn and, and my team really uh, spans across the global presence that LinkedIn's offices have. Um, and uh, yeah, really working on various different areas that both thinking about how we can iterate and understand and improve our products that we deliver to our members and our customers and also at the same time thinking about how we can make our infrastructure more efficient, thinking about how we can make our sales and marketing uh, more efficient as well. So really span across. And um, how has the use of data science um, evolved to de deliver a better user experience for users of LinkedIn? Yeah, so first of all, I think we, uh, LinkedIn is a, uh, in general, we, we truly believe that everybody can benefit from um, better data. Uh, better data access uh, in general. So uh, we, we certainly, uh, with uh, using data to continuously understand better of what our members are looking for. Uh, uh, as a, a simple example is that we, whenever we uh, launch a new feature, uh, we are not just blindly decide ourselves that it's the better feature for our members, but we actually understand how our users react into it, right? So we use data to understand that, and then certainly making decisions uh, and, and whether we should be eventually launching this feature to all members or not. So that's a very prominent way for us to uh, use data. And obviously we also use data to understand and just uh, uh, even before we're building certain features, is this sort of feature that's right uh, feature to build? Uh, we do both uh, uh, survey uh, and understand the survey data, but also at the same time understanding just user behavior data for us to be able to uh, come up with better features for, for users. And do you use A-B testing as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So we uh, we we do a lot of A-B experiments. That's what I, I was not trying to use that word, but like uh, a, that terminology, but this is what we, we use to uh, have an understanding of is the features that we are developing that we are putting in front of our users, is that what they enjoy as much as we think they would enjoy? Right. Um, so you had a talk today about uh, creating global economic opportunities with responsible data. So give us some highlights from your talk. So, uh, so for, first of all, uh, um, at LinkedIn, we, uh, we truly believe in the vision that we are working towards, which is really creating econo economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And if you're kind of starting from that and thinking about that is our uh, sort of the, 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 the axiom that we're working towards, and then thinking about how you can do that, and then obviously the, the sort of the table stake or just the, the um, uh, the, the fundamental thing that we have to start with is to be able to preserve the privacy of our members as we are leveraging the data that our members entrust with us, right? So how can we do that? We have some early effort in, think, in, in using and developing differential privacy uh, as a technique for us to do a lot better with regarding preserving that privacy as we are leveraging the data. Um, but also at the same time, it doesn't end there, right? Because you're thinking about uh, creating opportunity. It's not just about let's preserve the privacy, but also when we are leveraging the data, how can we leverage the data in a way that is able to create opportunity in a fair way? Uh, so, so there is also a lot of effort that we're having uh, with regarding how can we do that and what does fairness mean? Uh, what are the ways we can actually turn some of the key concepts that we have into action that is really able to drive the way we develop product, the way that we're thinking about responsible design, and the way that we build our algorithms, uh, the way that we measure in every single dimension. And, and speaking about that bias, um, uh, at the opening address, um, they mentioned that diversity is really great because it provides many perspectives um, and also helps reduce this bias. So how have you at LinkedIn been able to create a more diverse um, team? 
so first of all, uh, I think it's certainly there. Uh, there is a. Um, uh, we all believe that diversity is certainly um, better as we're building product. Thinking about if you have uh, a diverse team that is really a a representation of the customers and the members that you're serving, then, then you definitely are, are better to be able to come. You come. You are able to come up with better features that is able to serve the needs of the the population uh, of our member. Um, but I'll just also at the same time, um, that's just the right thing to do as well, right? Thinking about. Um, uh, we we all uh, have had uh, experiences. This way, we may not, you know, feel as much belong when we walk into a room that we are the only person of uh, that we identify with to be in that room, and and we we certainly wanted to be able to create that environment um, for all the employees uh, as well. And and thinking about, I think there is also uh, studies that has done as what makes a high performing team. Uh, some of the studies that's done at Google with uh, uh, the the psychological safety uh, aspects of it, which is really there's a lot of brain science that says when you make people feel they belong, that they will actually be so much more creative and innovative and everything, right? So we have that belief. Um, and But uh, tactically, there are many things that we're doing uh, from uh, all the dibs aspect, right? How can you bring diversity, inclusion, and belonging? Um, and uh, you know, starting from uh, uh, hiring, right? So we, we certainly are very much emphasized uh, on can, how, how can we increase the diversity of individuals that we're bringing to LinkedIn. And when they are uh, at LinkedIn, can we make them feel more belong and then feel more included in, in every aspect? We have different inclusion groups, uh, right? We have, I mean, obviously, I'm very much involved in women in tech uh, at LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, both uh, uh, many efforts that we, we do to help women at LinkedIn in engineering and in other groups as well to feel they belong uh, to this community. At the same time, there is uh, concrete actions that we're taking too, right? That we are helping women to uh, have a much better understanding and aware of some of the ways that we operate that is slightly different from maybe our male colleagues would operate, right? There are certain things that we're doing to change the current processes, hiring processes, promotion process, that we are able to bring more equal footing to the way that we're thinking about gender gap and gender diversity. Right, that's great. And what advice would you give to women who are just starting college or who are um, just out of college who are interested in going into data science? So, uh, I want to say the the biggest learning for me uh, is just have that can-do attitude. Uh, you know the uh, the um, woman biologically and or just in like in every way we are, we're not any uh, less than men, and uh, you certainly have seen many uh, strong and very talented women uh, that we have in the field. So don't let uh, people's perception or biases around you to bring you down, and then thinking about what you wanted, and then just go for it, and then go for the the advice that you can get from people. And then there there are so many, and the, we can see in the conference today, so many talented women that you can reach out to who are willing and very willing to help you as well. And in this uh, age of AI and ML, um, where do you see data science going in the future? That's a really uh, uh, interesting question. So, uh, in, in the way that you know, data science, I want to say it's a field that is really broad, mm -hmm. uh, right? So, if you're thinking about uh, uh, things that I would consider to be part of data science, may not necessarily be part of AI. Uh, some of the the, the causal inference uh, that is extremely popular and important, and then there, uh, there, um, uh, the the I think the the fields will continue to evolve. Um, uh, there are going to be, uh, and then the fields are continually overlapping uh, with each other as well. You cannot do data science without understanding or have a, str have a strong uh, skill in AI and in machine learning. And you also cannot have, you can't do great machine learning without understanding the data science either, right? So thinking about some of the, the talk uh, that Daphne Kohler earlier uh, was sharing, as in, uh, you know, you can you can blindly run your algorithm and without realizing the bias uh, that all the the algorithm is really just detecting uh, the machines that's used in the in the images versus you know actually detecting the difference between broken bones or not, right? Like so, so I think having 
I, I, I do see there is a continuously big overlap, and I think the, the individuals who are involved in both communities should continue to be very comfortable being in that way, too. Right, right. Yeah, thank you so much for being on theCUBE, and thank you for your insight. Of course, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm your host, Sonia Tagare. Thank you for watching theCUBE, and stay tuned for more.
Okay, we are going to start in 30 seconds. So please come in, find a seat, settle in for the afternoon. Hi, Patricia. Okay, 10 seconds warning. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. We're going to be starting here. So, yeah, you're ready. I know, Sarah's ready, so we're ready. <laughs> How were the breakouts over lunch? Were they good? Breakouts over lunch, useful? Yeah? How, how did the Berkeley group do over lunch? Yeah, <laughs> you're, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Okay, if I can get your attention, then, uh, then we'll start. I would like to announce our first speaker for the afternoon. We, uh, we have three more hours to go, or just a little bit under. Uh, there will be many wonderful talks. There will be a career panel, as we normally have. Uh, we will talk about the artists that we have with us today. Uh, you haven't seen them yet, they will come at the, during the reception time and they're phenomenal. So we'll talk to you about this a little bit later. And uh, right now I'm just really excited to uh, do a shout out to Wits Calgary. Uh, they're here with us still as well, so that's fantastic. And uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you our next speaker. Uh, we have a very strong connection to Berkeley. Uh, there's folks here in the audience, they came from Berkeley, even, <laughs> even though they have their own wits going on there today, but they, it was their words, they said, yours is better. That, that you don't hear this too often from across the bay. Uh, <laughs> But we had Persis this morning, the provost from Stanford, and now we're gonna have, and I'm so happy she could make it today, Suze Lee uh, Liu from Berkeley. She is the dean of the School of Engineering in Berkeley. Uh, by the way, Berkeley just had an amazing announcement yesterday uh, for a very big donation for data science uh, initiative, and that was, is, uh, congratulations, that's splendid. And I'm so glad you could make it with us today. Um, what I like so much about you is that you're not just an amazing academic leader, but she is also an incredible uh, industry person. She co-founded a startup. She's a dean and she co-founded a startup before then as well. So a leader in academia, a leader in industry. Um, she's very high on EQ and for those of you uh, who know what it is, you know the E stands for engineering, right? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Hey. Thank you, Margot. All right, thank you, Margot, and good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? I noticed that there's no title for my talk um, in the program, but um, yes, I think Margot was trying to uh, lead uh, up to my, the title of my talk, which is Why a World with AI Needs More EQ, and E means emotional um, quotient, or basically emotional intelligence. Uh, so first off, I'd like to just say how much um, I appreciate being invited here uh, to speak at this conference. Um, hello to everyone here and also everybody who's watching live online. I want to thank Margot and Karen and Judy, the organizers of this conference, for inviting me to give a talk. 
Um, so it's always nice to come back to Stanford. I don't think that she mentioned that I, I earned every single one of my degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University. So I actually feel most comfortable here wearing red. <laughs> so for those of you who aren't familiar with the rivalry between UC Berkeley and Stanford, we have a friendly uh, sporting, uh, sports team rivalry. And, um, but really, it doesn't uh, translate to competition so much in academics. In fact, earlier today, I was meeting with um, the dean of engineering here at Stanford, Jennifer Widom, and we had a great chat about um, initial possibilities for collaboration between our colleges. All right, so today I just wanted to share with you, since I am actually not a data scientist, um, I wanted to first introduce a little bit about myself, how um, basically I'm related to maybe this AI revolution, and then talk about some of the reasons why I chose to step up and serve as dean of engineering, because I think there's some serious challenges ahead in a world where AI um, can actually you know, take over or uh, exceed human intelligence, and, why, uh, and what we're doing at Berkeley to ensure that uh, the outcomes are you know, going to be human compatible and uh, benefiting the good of society. Okay, so it's telling you sort of my connection to AI. Um, this chart is a plot showing exponential growth over time, over a period of 120 years, um, how the, the technology for computing has advanced. Okay, so the, the vertical axis is the calculations per second per constant dollar, uh, constant thousand uh, dollars, I guess uh, appropriately, you know, um, I guess taking into account inflation. Uh, so we can see that this trend of exponential improvement in computing performance is a projected, we, most people do expect it to continue to, to uh, continue for at least another decade. And we can see that the, you know, the level of computational speed of a human brain eventually will be reached. And that's, uh, estimated to be in about the middle of this century. Now, I actually was a student here in the 1980s through the early 1990s, and that's kind of really in the, in the, reg uh, the re regime where integrated circuits, you know, integrated circuit technology, Silicon Valley sort of um, coming onto the scene was really hot, and that's why I ended up majoring in electrical engineering. Now, I moved over to Berkeley um, after I graduated, a few years after I graduated, and you, know, you might already know today that the computing devices today, these computer chips that are in all of the electronic devices, they're the brains of your computers, your laptops, you know, in the cloud um, servers, but also in your mobile devices. Um, those devices comprise, are, are highly complex. A single chip of silicon can contain over a billion transistors, up to 10 billion transistors. And so a whole system, ecosystem, of how to design these uh, new chips. Every, so every year you have a new product that can, uh, can um, do more. And, and basically the industry has sort of um, segmented itself into different layers of abstraction. So I've re represented this in, in terms of a stack of um, information technology um, stack. And so I just wanted to point out you know, that in academia we've actually contributed a lot to the AI enable to enabling the AI revolution today. You know, when I was a student here in the 80s, I took a course on artificial intelligence, but the computing technology was not yet advanced enough to really realize the power, right, the, the full potential of AI. So over the last 20 plus years, computing technology has advanced, so now AI can be you know, real time. There are all kinds of exciting applications of data science. So first of all, at Berkeley, these are just examples from Berkeley. SPICE is a, uh, stands for simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. So basically, how do you design billion component systems and make sure that they work properly and you know, in, on time? Software is, is used to automate that, and that's SPICE. Uh, the reduced instruction set um, architecture for, for microprocessor was developed at Berkeley. And basically, this technology or this com computing architecture is used in mobile devices today. It's a lower power. Um, the operating systems, Unix, was uh, open source at Berkeley, the Berkeley Software Distribution Operating System, uh, formed the basis for operating systems used today, let's say in the Apple Mac um, operating system, and also in Microsoft Windows. Now, where do I come in? I'm at the bottom there. That's like the lower back, okay? It's not the tailbone. Um, but you know, at the bottom, we, we actually also have to have innovations in materials and the transistor designs, the little miniature electronic switches to operate at hi higher and higher speeds and also to be able to be miniaturized to atomic 
uh, dimensions. And so that's um, how I contribute to this stack. And so the FinFET is a new transistor design that's used in all leading edge microprocessors today. And most recently out of Berkeley, you, you probably are much more familiar with this than I am, in the Spark, um, basically cluster computing um, framework to really uh, speed up data analytics. Okay, so basically um, academia has really contributed to innovations um, that are enabling AI today. And that's my connection. And we all envision that in the future, um, a lot of things will be automated. We'll have you know, in interconnected devices as well as people. Um, we'll have not only smart uh, transportation that we're starting to see come on the scene, but in, in manufacturing, smart factories, um, smart uh, in personalized medicine and, um, and healthcare, um, and, and so on. Right? So all the infrastructure can, can um, benefit from AI. So from you know, water distribution, energy distribution, transportation networks, and so on. So this is the vision of the future. And there are going to be significant impacts on society, not only benefiting us, you know, making our lives hopefully more pleasant, but it really is gonna change the nature of the workplace, of the, the nature of jobs, okay? So this is something that uh, people are, we're starting to talk about for uh, several years now, okay? And so I'm just citing some work that was, some reports from a few years ago. So if you look at this um, chart, it just, list the top trends that are gonna impact business models. So we already see today new types of businesses enabled by um, e-commerce and so on and, and big data. Um, so there's no ar argument that mobile, the mobile internet, cloud, you know, big data technology is gonna change the nature of jobs because a lot of work is gonna be automated. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the level of risk, there are various categories you can put Job, every job into uh, each job can be put into a category of how risky, how at risk is it of being eliminated due to automation? And so, um, on this chart, women the, per, the percentage of jobs held by women is shown in dark blue, and percentage of jobs held by men is in light blue. And the different sets of bars are going from the left, low risk of being re replaced or automated, and to the right is very high risk. So you can see that the jobs of the highest risk to be um, eliminated due to automation are dominated by women. Um, also, if you look at the low risk jobs, the, the, risks, the jobs that um, are at lowest risk of being replaced, um, the, what women earn in those jobs is much less than what men earn. Uh, these bars compare men and women um, average wages, median and, and mean, okay? Um, and of course, the tech industry will continue to grow. AI you know, enables a lot of transformation for all industries, so there will be a lot of jobs. But generally, the, um, the sectors of the job market that are gonna be growing um, are dominated by men. So even though men will also lose jobs, um, but the, they won't lose as many. For every single 20 lost jobs for women, only one is projected to be gained, uh, one new STEM job is projected to be gained. And that's in stark comparison to only, uh, only four lost jobs for every STEM job gained for men. All right, so I think everybody's aware, everybody in the audience today probably is aware that um, you know, men uh, dominate in terms of the workplace, uh, the percentage of workers. Um, for the left two bars show computing men, the taller bar, and then computing women. And then also the situation is probably even more disparate for engineering. And the different colors represent different race, race and ethnic, ethnicities. All right, so first of all, women, um, there are not as many women working in high tech today, in either computing or engineering. Um, so let's say roughly 25% of jobs held, technical jobs held today are held by women. But what's more disturbing is at the bottom of this slide showing that um, for science, engineering, and technology jobs, uh, more than half are almost half or more than half of the women who start actually within 10 or 10 years or so um, move out of those jobs. And they usually move into some, a lot of them move, about half of them move into some different type of job and uh, like out, out of technology altogether, okay? Or maybe starting their own company. All right, so this basically, these are the problems, right? So low representation, high attrition. And I've talked to a lot of women who grad, uh, alumni and asked them, well, why did you end up leaving the tech 
um, track? Why did you end up going into whatever HR or sales and marketing and so on? And very often the, the answer is that they didn't see a career path for moving upward, like moving to higher levels of management or you know, to executive management or you know, being CEO and so on. So this chart is um, published by McKinsey and Company. They do a, a nice uh, report every year on women in technology. So it shows that sort of the percentage of women in light blue at the bottom um, that occupy jobs at the entry level and going to the right, that's higher and higher levels of management. So what you see here is attrition um, in, uh, in levels of women. So as you go higher and higher up in layers of management, the percentage of women is dropping um, fast. And it's even worse for women of color. So this is an issue of intersectionality. So those are issues. Um, Okay, so first of all, like, is that a problem? <laughs> I hope that people know that it is, but just a couple of examples. Um, the second one I'll show here probably is mo most uh, relatable to some of the researchers here. But a common example I talk about with uh, young girls is the, the, is the, the example of um, airbag you know, systems in, used in cars to keep people safe in case of an accident. So this is a, a dummy that's used for testing airbag deployment systems in automobiles, and uh, the very first, actually for the longest time, the dummies were sized and weighted uh, based on a male anatomy. So even though uh, airbag systems were actually mandatory starting in the 90s, it wasn't until the year 2010 that the De US Department of Transportation required that car manufacturers use dummies that were weighted and sized more like women as part of their, you know, in, in their testing to, to develop their airbag deployment systems. And, and basically, car manufacturers have found that generally, yes, the, uh, the women are about more than 50% li more likely to get injured in a car accident and where, where the airbag is deploying, because first of all, we're generally sh shorter, and the airbag might hit our head or neck. And also our neck, you know, our anatomy, we are not, we don't have this muscular, um, like, you know, neck and, and strong spinal sort of support. So this is an example, and, and people, researchers who've studied this do admit, well, it's probably because the men, the, these systems were designed by engineering teams that weren't diverse enough and didn't think about, you know, that maybe half the passengers in cars are, are female, right? Not all sized and weighted like men. Okay, so this might be closer to home. So voice recognition systems. So it turns out that um, voice recognition systems, I, I didn't, uh, recognize this, um, actually are, is, uh, yeah, voice, in a, voice AI is, is going to become, a, uh, projected to become like an $80 billion business within the next couple of years. And Google reports that almost 50% of all queries today are by, by voice, okay? And they claim that they have a 95% accuracy um, rate. So the question is accuracy for what kinds of people? Um, so the very first voice recognition systems um, only recognize male voices. And interestingly, this is also the case for automobile manufacturers. You know, today we, we have voice recognition systems in the cars, right? We talk to the cars. And um, automakers have admitted for years that their speech recognition system doesn't work well for women. And the recommended remedy, do you know what the recommended rem remedy is? Yeah, speak more like a man. That's obviously, that's, this is what VPs have said, right? Women should be taught to speak louder, direct their voices towards the microphone. Same, yeah, same for people who, who have, you know, are not native English speakers and so on. So this shows, these are just examples of lack of empathy of the, the managers, the, the engineers who design these systems that are meant, of course, not only for men, right? If you want to make money, you have to have a product that works for both men and women. All right. So I think it's pretty clear, it should be obvious, Di diverse teams or organizations really, because they comprise a wider range of viewpoints and skills, that leads to greater collective intelligence. So these issues, lives literally were lost you know, with the airbag deployment systems. This is, might be just an inconvenience, but imagine um, that today, um, speak recognition is used like for inter interviewing people, like for immigration, um, job hiring, and so on, and imagine the kind of bias, if there's a bias against women and minorities, what kinds of decisions could you know, affect people's lives if these voice recognition systems are not you know, designed 
to work for all people. And we should just recognize that um, there are more dimensions of diversity than gender and um, race and ethnicity, you know, inner dimensions as well as outer dimensions. This is a really nice quote from uh, Dr. Franz Cordova. She's the director of the National Science Foundation, um, just stating that uh, what we hope is obvious. Diversity of thought, perspective, and experience is essential for excellence in research and innovation in science and engineering. And uh, for the people, the executives who need to be further convinced, if we look at um, companies on the left who are in the, up, the first quartile of, in terms of gender diversity, first quartile in their, in, in among all businesses, um, they have a higher likelihood of financial performance, which is above the industry uh, median. Okay, so compared to if your company is in the lowest quartile in terms of gender diversity. And the difference is even greater if you have, uh, in terms of uh, ethnic diversity. So diversity makes sense business-wise. And, and so companies should be motivated to uh, foster diversity in their workforce. So that's the, the, the situation, the challenge. Um, and that's what, one reason why I decided to come, uh, become dean, because I wanted to do some things to try to, to counteract this and to ensure that as the pace of technology advancement accelerates, people are not left behind. The digital divide does not grow. Now, the question is, okay, what is the root cause of this, of this disparity, the gender gap? Well, I think there are a lot of um, reasons. One could be just outright discrimination, but there are also subtle reasons. So unconscious bias is one. So this is attitudes or stereotypes that really affect our actions, bottom line, right, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So how many of you have, are aware of the Harvard Implicit Association Test? This is great. So it's a free test online. Um, I usually have some of my students when I teach take this test just to increase awareness of you know, hidden biases. So this chart here just shows of the people who've taken this Implicit Association Test online for free um, to see if they have implicitly some association between gender and career, the ma majority of them do have some uh, automatic subconscious in, uh, association of males with careers and females with um, family. So we really should check our bias in order to address it, right, to try to counteract it. So this is a nice um, example of a study um, that was done, I guess, the New York Times. What they did was they sent email to a, a couple of thousand, 2,500 professors at hundreds of universities just an inquiry, can, you, can I have a meeting? I'm interested to be your PhD student. And they changed the name, and, and from the name you can change, you can imply gender and race and so on. And it was clear that white males, if your name sounded like a white, you were a white male, you were far more likely to receive a response. Just a other, couple of other really quick examples. A lot of us choose people in our research groups or to hire into our companies based on first, first pass would be looking at your CV, right, your resume. And so this study was done with uh, 200, over 250 professors in physics and biology at eight large public universities. They each evaluated eight CVs for postdoc positions. And the only thing that was different in their, what they did was they changed the, the people who conducted the study, changed the names, only the names, nothing else, to sort of imply somebody was female or African American or, you know, and so on. So the results showed that for the exact same CVs, in general, the males, uh, were rated to have a higher level of competence. That's a dark blue bar on the left, uh, compared to women, which is the gray. In terms of higher ability, again, women, uh, men, even though it's the exact same CV, um, were deemed to be more hireable. It's kind of nice that women seem to be more likable, but that doesn't help you get a job, right? Um, and then looking at race, race and ethnicity, um, again, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Latinx and blacks uh, did not fare as well, um, even though the CVs were identical, right? So there's obviously some bias, implicit bias. How about letters of recommendation? Sometimes we ask for a recommendation. We don't base our decisions for hiring based only on CVs. Uh, letters of recommendation, a separate study analyzed 300 levels, uh, letters of recommendation for medical faculty at a large US medical school. They found, and this is great data, you know, text analytics can do this very um, quickly. Male candidates generally are, are more often described as researchers and professionals, successful and having innate ability. And more often female candidates were described as 
teachers and students, very nurturing, working hard to get to where they are. Um, and then looking for key adjectives, like when we hire faculty, when we want to know that they will have the potential to become a star, you know, or what is their, their claim to fame, their home run. Uh, it, it turns out these standout adjectives, um, the data shows uh, from 886 letters that are much more often used for male versus female candidates. So there's um, you know, bias. So you should keep that in mind when you're looking at CVs and letters of recommendation or when you're writing letters of recommendation. So the question is, how do we solve this problem? Well, first of all, we need to increase our own awareness, OK? Um, because of time, I'm going to skip this. So what I, now I'm going to talk about what we're doing at Berkeley. So my associate dean for um, students has developed this new course. I know that you, I don't expect you to read this, but basically it's Engineering One. We offer to all students, but freshmen especially, Engineering Your Life. And uh, some of the modules in this course are uh, tools for personal leadership. So basically reflecting on your own personal life story, you know, bringing, basically understanding yourself. And the next module is tools for self-discovery and knowledge mastery. And then tools for diversity and teamwork, tools for social, societal service, and then personal leadership plans. So this is something, um, it's been a really successful course. Students really appreciate it. Um, so that's one thing, sort of increasing awareness. Um, so we don't have bias, so we can hire more diverse people into our organizations. But diversity is not only what's important. If we don't include those people, if those people don't feel like they belong, they can't contribute to the full potential, and our teams therefore can't reach our full potential. And we have to also recognize that people come from different backgrounds and experiences so that equ equity is not the same as equality, right? People come from different, have different abilities and so on. If we want people to participate equally, we have to take that into account to, achieve, to truly achieve equity um, and inclusion. So at Berkeley, another thing we've done, and there's a website here, um, we have started a series of uh, workshops to empower our engineering students, staff, and faculty to be agents of change, positive change. Um, and so what we have is engaging you know, interactive workshops to have people practice, learn about and practice skills for, um, well, so first of all, increasing awareness of our personal biases, but how to interrupt exclusionary behaviors and how to advance equity and inclusion. Okay, so, so far we've taught, talked about creating inclusive classrooms, how to have fair faculty searches, and how do we grade for equity. And then finally, uh, oh, so those of you who are not at Berkeley, you can always also benefit from another resource. We have uh, an engineering library and a collection of books and other uh, published articles that talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it, we have an online version. So all of these re re resources are available online. I encourage you to check that out. This is a good book, Invisible Women, and that's like re relevant to data. This shows how big data, um, basically, if it doesn't, if you don't tag it men or women, it'll just automatically assume it's you know, male, associated with male. Finally, as in terms of agents of change, we can incentivize companies to actually pay attention to data, look at the, the diversity of their workforce. And so I'd like to encourage you all to, to visit this website. We have a corporate diversity and inclusion survey that um, ha we have various companies who want to recruit our students come and fill out a survey to see if they track diversity metrics, what they do to foster equity inclusion. This is a resource for students who are trying to decide which companies to work for. So I'd encourage you to look at that as a resource as well. So I'd like to close by thanking um, the people with whom I've worked for the last more than five years to come up to speed on this issue and to find solutions from um, not only from the College of Engineering but from the Women in Technology Initiative at University of California. Basically, this initiative is really trying to increase the persistence and success of women in tech fields. And I want to invite you all, if you have, are not aware of it, we have a symposium this Friday at Berkeley um, about cybersecurity, featuring leading women in the cybersecurity field and a lot of interesting panel discussions. And we'll give some awards to recognize contributions of women to cybersecurity. So in closing, I know Margot is going to give me the hook. Um, <laughs> so women in technology initiatives. So as a professor, you know, I have a chance to give a lot of talks like this. So I'd just like to share with you you know, we have such amazing students and, you know, here at Stanford and at Berkeley, and they are inspiration for the faculty. So one of the students that I talked, um, gave a talk to last semester sent me an email last semester 
saying, I was attending a lecture with a neuroscientist who claimed that the male brain is better at working with deep technology than the female brain. And that was one of the reasons that men currently dominate engineering. And so she asked me, well, what did I think of that? And so on. So what I ended up doing was sending her a very long email to explain you know, about the, um, how the brain is plastic and how it's shaped, you know, our abilities are shaped by our experiences and so on. And so what she, she responded to me saying, you know, I've, I printed out your, your um, message and I keep it like next to my desk and I look at it whenever I you know, feel like I don't belong. And I thought it was just really cool because uh, what she did was she ended up adding additional reasons why she should persist in engineering. And what I like the most is that it's like because you are not alone. And so I think everybody here, this is proof positive, this conference is proof that we are, we women, girls are not alone. And I'd like to thank you for all you're doing um, for to advance the field of technology, you know, data science and so on toward a better future for all of us. And uh, thank you for your kind attention this afternoon. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. There's uh, such, such fantastic work happening in, uh, in Berkeley in this field. And I know that's uh, also because of this amazing Dean of Engineering. <laughs> so thank you. We are changing topic a little bit, and I'm, I'm really happy to introduce the next speaker, Nung Ho from Intuit. And she has a PhD in astrophysics. So we've seen people from all sorts of different areas, electrical engineering, mathematics, physics, the humanities, and now astrophysics. And what I loved is that she called herself on her CV um, a supernova hunter in the past. So welcome to the supernova hunter, uh, Nung Ho. All righty. So good afternoon, everyone. How y'all feeling? Good? All right. Hopefully everybody is feeling refreshed. You've had food, you've had coffee, and between me and 30 more minutes is more coffee. So I am delighted and honored to be here today among such an established and diverse group of data science practitioners. I can tell you that I have been in many audiences where the diversity and abilities of the group is not as varied as here today. And it's especially of note that this is the beginning of International Women's Week. And so give yourselves a round of applause. We're just getting started. So I'm here today to talk to you about what does it mean to do data science in the cloud? Right? Over the past six years that I've been at Intuit, I've gone through and seen us through our entire end-to-end -end cloud migration journey. And there are some things that I wish that I knew at the beginning, during, and even at the end that I hope to share with you today. And as we mentioned, I was a national physicist in a previous life, so what the heck am I doing at Intuit? So I can tell you that hmm, this is not working. Give me one second. There it is. All right. So at the start of my PhD, for the first time in my life, I had no money at the end of the month, and I didn't know why. Right? For the first time, I had a salary, which was awesome. I'm making money. But I had bills to pay. I had a car payment. I had all of these things. And I didn't know where my money was going. And if you've been through the US educational system, no one teaches you how to create a budget at all. And so I was at a loss, right? Um, but the only thing I knew how to do was open up Google, and I typed in budget tracker, and Mint.com came up. And I can tell you it was love at first sight when I first signed up to Mint. It automatically connected to my bank account. It pulled in my transactions. It uh, made predictions and put those transactions into approximately the right category. Note the approximate part, because I'm going to get back to it. And I actually got to see my budget. And I'll tell you, spoiler alert, a lot of it went to restaurants. I love to eat out, and it was really biting me in the bum back then. So second month, I log back in, take a look at my budget again. This is the beginning of the month. I'm trying to be proactive. And what do I see? Some of the things that I spent time correcting before were put back in the wrong categories yet again. And this began to annoy me a little bit. Third month, I log in, same thing. And it felt like everything I was doing was going into a black hole. If you can imagine being an actual physicist, you go to work, you see a black hole, you go home, you see a black hole. It was not awesome. 
And so I really fell out of love with Mint, right? I abandoned the product. I said, this is too much work. It wasn't getting smarter. I'm doing all this work already. So I wrote a script to pull the CSV from my bank and made my own budget. A couple years down the line, I'm on the job market now. I'm transitioning out of astrophysics into data science. And a good friend of mine said, hey, you should consider into it. I think you'd really like the work that they do there. And so I racked my brain. And I was thinking into it, into it. How do I know into it? So again, I went back to Google, pulled it up, and said, oh, they made Mint, which is not super awesome. Right? I had really bad <laughs> memories. And so I said, OK, well, I'll go for the interview. Why the heck not? And when I went there, some of the people I met really changed my mind. For a company that's been around for 30 years, Intuit was at the beginning of a transformation in how to leverage all the data that our customers give us to build better products. And the future of the company was to moving towards this revolution that AI is going to help us drive towards. And I asked them a simple question. I said, if I came to Intuit, can I fix Mint? And they said, yes. I said, cool, sign me up. And so I've been at Intuit for the past six years now. And six years is a really long time in the valley. Right? So I know our products inside and out. But for those of you who are not as familiar with Intuit as I am, we're the makers of TurboTax, in addition to my favorite Mint, as well as QuickBooks. And we serve our small businesses, consumers, and self-employed with a mission to power prosperity around the world via an AI-driven expert platform. And if you can imagine, that's an extremely lofty goal. And for me, it's a personal mission to be able to leverage my skill set to help our customers. And this message actually resonates with me quite a bit, because at Intuit, my job is to lead the applied machine learning team to build better products for our small business customers. And why do small businesses matter to me so much? Other thing you need to know about me is I come from a family of 11 children. I am the youngest in that family. That's me in orange. Last time in my life I'll ever be able to wear orange, so feast your eyes on it. But what's unique about my family is that half of my siblings are small business owners. And one of the statistics that you'll hear that's often cited is that half of all small businesses fail within the first five years. Being a good statistician, that means 2.5 of my siblings are going to go out of business. <laughs> And so to me, it's really a personal mission to be able to apply my skill set and build better products for our customers so that they go beyond surviving to thriving and then prospering in the future. But it's a very complicated problem to solve. Right? Personal finance is something that flummoxed me as a PhD student. When you add in the complexity of a small business, all of the things they have to worry about, can I make payroll? Do I have enough cash flow? Can I pay my bills? And this is a problem that doesn't really go away just simply because you have a lot of data. And you can't do this on your laptop. You need massive amounts of compute. And that's why about six years ago as a company, we declared that we were going to move into the cloud and begin this transformation. Now, for me, as someone who just joined, I didn't really know the reality of the situation. You think you snap your finger, and boom, you're in the cloud, I'm done. But it's actually a really long journey, right? Because the reality of the situation is that you're moving from working on your laptop or an on-premise data center to completely changing your workflow in the cloud. And you don't just move your data. You move your applications. You move your services. And you need to make sure that the cloud environment you're in is fully secure as well. And so what I want to share with you are some of the lessons that I personally learned as well as what my team learned when we went through this cloud migration journey over the past six years. And I hope that regardless of where, the, where you are in your journey, you find this useful. So I think the top question on everyone's mind is how do you choose from all the options? Right? At this point, cloud adoption is mainstream and the competition is fierce. These are the top six cloud providers. Two years ago, there were only three major cloud providers, and every year there's a new entrant into the market. And if you take a look at what these cloud providers offer, it's really hard to distinguish. They offer a whole bunch of stuff, right? But why do you, as a data scientist, need to care which cloud provider your institution goes to? Because regardless of whether or not you're in academia, industry, healthcare, finance, you are going to move to the cloud. Stanford University is moving itself to the cloud as we speak right now. And so my position is as a data scientist, the reason why you need to care about which cloud provider and what they offer 
is because of the AI services these cloud providers are increasingly releasing, right? And this is where differentiation happens. Here are just some of the major services that these cloud providers offer. Speech and text transcription, machine translation, natural language processing, conversational agents. And for me, I didn't really appreciate the fact that these AI services can actually make a difference in how quickly you can ship a product until I myself went through it. About two and a half years ago, we were looking to build a chatbot to be placed in our TurboTax product. Because I can tell you, people don't like doing taxes, but people really hate calling in for help. Right? No one loves picking up the phone and saying, hey, Comcast, fix my internet. And so what we wanted to do was actually build in a help agent in our products that can come up and help our customers resolve their issues without needing to call in. But in order to do this, we needed to have a conversational agent capability, a natural language understanding service that was scalable, extensible, and was highly accurate. And if you remember, we're a financial services company. And so we don't have this expertise. So what we did was we went through and said, do we build this or do we buy it? And when we went there and looked at all the different cloud providers, we realized actually they each provided something that was very much battle tested, had been in production for other companies. And we ended up using one from one of the major providers and that actually helped us leapfrog ourselves multiple years. We were able to deliver a chat agent into TurboTax within just a couple months and build on top of it. And so what I really think you um, should come away from this section understanding is that it really doesn't have to be one cloud fits all. Regardless of which cloud provider your organization is in, take a look at the AI services that other cloud providers are offering because it really could actually expand your data science team beyond what it could do right now. And construct the best solution for your organization as you go along and use these services. Second thing for me that was actually really difficult was embracing a new workflow. I thought I had already been at the forefront of uh, working in a new way, right? Everything was done in a virtual machine. I fully specified my dev environment. If my laptop crashed, I could bring it up within the same day. And so for me, when I thought about moving to the cloud, it would be I would drop my laptop into the cloud and I would just go on with my day. But if you start with working in a laptop environment, it's actually fairly limiting and you're not leveraging the full power that the cloud can offer. Because if the instance type that you're on runs out of memory, you should be able to automatically pull up a couple more nodes, distribute your workflow across that, and then send your job out. And that's not something you can do on a laptop, right? No matter if you're already using virtual machines right now on your laptop, you cannot do that auto scaling. And so you need to move to a cloud native tech stack. And so for me, the difference was when we moved to containers, that allowed us to just build our code, write our systems much more cleanly. That actually allowed for better collaboration as well because it did not depend on the dev environment you're in. I could send my container file to a coworker and they can specify their dev environments on their machines and run the same code yet again. And not just that, it allowed you to scale. And so if you can imagine, right, if you run out of compute, you get to, um, sorry, can I have some water? <coughs> Apologize. All right, cool, I'm back. <laughs> so if you run out of compute, right, and you need more memory, if you're already working in a cloud native stack, you can spawn your job across 100 nodes and get that done at the same time via Kubernetes without changing anything about your configuration. And that's where the real power lies in the cloud. And once we got to that point, it actually opened up a new door for us to be able to solve a problem that we didn't think we could solve previously. Now, if you know anything about small businesses, it's that every single small business is unique, just like every single individual is unique. And so when you want to solve the cash flow problem for small businesses and build out time series, you can't aggregate all of their data, build out one time series, and then apply it to everyone and say, here you go, good to go. 
It simply cannot be done. And so if you want to solve the cash flow problem for small businesses, you need to be able to build an individual time series at runtime for every single small businesses. And when you have four million customers, that need means you need to build four million simultaneous cash flow or time series uh, algorithms and then ship that out within a certain limitation. And when I was working on my laptop, I can tell you, when I pulled in 100,000 transactions, it killed over and died. I have to get a new one. And so when you think about a billion transactions for four million customers, that's a scale that is just unimaginable. And it wasn't until we moved into the cloud, changed the way we did our work, that we could actually think about distributed training. Right? A lot of us, especially me, think about distributed computation for just crunching your data in preparation for machine learning. But what I recommend you think about are how to actually distribute your training job so that you can start moving to the era of building personalized models for every single one of your users because it is possible now and it's only possible if you move to a cloud native tech stack because the scaling that comes with it requires minimal code changes. And so this is just a simplified architecture diagram of how we distribute our four million time series across our billion transactions and partition it into multiple jobs utilizing every single core within our 100 node cluster. And all of this is done with the same container file. No changes on that end. And that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. So I've talked about which cloud to choose and how to change your workflow. But for me, changing my mindset took a really long time. So I lead an applied machine learning team. So it's not just about me changing how I thought about costs and how I thought about where my job was. It's imbuing that within my organization and getting my team to change as well. And so I think a lot of us are familiar with Costco. It's where you buy in bulk. And the analogy here is that when we think about computation, in the old world, we buy computation in bulk, right? You go and you pay some data center some amount of money and say, I'm going to own these machines for the next three years. If you use all of it, great. If you don't use it, doesn't matter. It's use it or lose it. And that's a classical argument for why you should move to the cloud. Because on the cloud, you just pay for what you use. And for me, in my everyday life, when I go to the store, I look at the price per ounce. I don't look at the whole unit, right? And so I've been trained in my personal life to think of that. But bridging that gap when we moved into our cloud provider and working in this way was inordinately difficult to do. And so why was that? And that's because for a lot of us, um, it's just those neural pathways. You're trained to think about price per unit in one way, and you don't think about it in your professional environment. You've never had to do that before. And the one example that really sticks out to me that I think about often, and I actually think about this almost every single day, was going back to the Mint transaction categorization problem. By this point, we had already trained a new model. We'd shipped it out into production, but we were looking for slight performance gains. And about three years ago is when we said, okay, let's take a look at some of the new deep learning architectures. We said, let's take two million transactions, put that through a convolutional neural net, and see what we get. Do we get the performance gains we're looking for? That took three days. And in those three days, I went to get coffee, I read some research papers, I twiddled my thumbs, I opened the terminal to take a look at it to see when it was done. Right? That took a significant amount of time. And that was something that was widely accepted at that time as normal. When we moved into the cloud, do you know how long that same job took? It took one hour. And that was because we could use the right machines and we can scale to the right GPU instance. And so that made me rethink my approach and think, actually, you should really move to a decisions per minute framework rather than thinking about price per node, right? That's a factor of two boost in decisions. Within one hour, we could say, is this the right thing for us to do and move on? And the last point that I just want to touch on, I know Margot is going to pull me off the stage too, um, is something that Daphne touched on. Right? You've heard me say a couple of things about working as a cloud native data scientist using containers, using Kubernetes. Why do you as a data scientist need to care about that? 
And my position is that it makes us all better data scientists if we understand the end-to-end -end flow and get involved in not just the engineering aspect, but how do our results show up to our users? We could not have pushed our engineering team to build distributed training for us if we didn't say that this is the only way that we can solve that customer problem for cash flow. And so I really highly recommend that you don't think of yourself as someone to build algorithms and throw it over the wall. Be involved in the whole process. And so because of uh, being in the cloud, utilizing the AI services that exist, changing our workflow to be cloud native, um, we were able to solve some very difficult customer problems that are live today in the product and were unimaginable to me when I started six years ago to be able to solve. And so regardless of whether you are at the beginning, middle, or at the end of your journey, I hope some of these things have been helpful to you. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, awesome. Well, from an uh, astrophysicist we're now working in the cloud, which is actually not so strange, probably. We are now go to a civil engineer working with water. Uh, and it's my uh, real pleasure to introduce my colleague from Stanford, Nusha Ajami. Uh, she is the leader of the Urban Water Policy Unit here on campus. And uh, she gave a wonderful talk just recently at WITS at Stanford Earth. And I'm so happy you could make it here, too. Nusha. Thank you. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, big shift from uh, Intuit to water. Um, uh, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, oh. OK, I had another slide, which is not showing here. But I guess just, just to let you know, water scarcity is a huge issue in the world, one of the biggest problems we are having. And this problem is not going away. Uh, that easily, partly because the population is growing, people moving to these urban areas. We have competing environmental de uh, demands. Uh, we have learned over time that we can just harness the water that, that there is. We have to leave some for the, um, for, uh, the fish and everything else in the environment. And also, climate change is definitely exacerbating this problem. On top of that, we have aging infrastructure that's even further causing problem in this system. So my slides are moving by themselves. I'm not sure what's going on. But you know, they want to go fast. I guess we're uh, running out of time a little bit. Um, just, and, the, and if you think about it, for, I'm sure in the past, past year at least, you have read a lot about droughts and water scarcity in different parts of the world. And this is not a California US problem, but it's actually a really growing problem in the world. And um, one thing I, I, what, what I want to focus on today is we had a very specific mindset in the 20th century to deal with water. Uh, we built centralized large infrastructure that was supposed to bring water to us and deal with access to water. And a lot of this was actually did two things was uh, very much prominent in this approach. One was that uh, we assume there's abundance of water. As soon as we run out of one source, we can just go and tap to another one. And another one was we assumed we will always have rain and snow to help us uh, you know, meet our future demand. And the reality is, if I don't know how many of you looked at the newspaper today, but this has been the driest February uh, ever in, the, uh, in California for 150 years, right? So we have not even received a drop of precipitation. Um, and um, OK, so they started just to go away. Um, uh, anyway, the driest uh, year, and that is actually a big issue. Um, OK. So, the problem with this kind of approach, which is top-down, we'll build infrastructure and people will come, is that humans are not part of this process. So is the environment. We can't really tap into the environment forever. The reality is we have ecosystems that are dying. So we need to change this approach or at least look at it differently. The problem is we know this is not going to be sustainable. But look, this, is, this map shows the number of dams that are being built right now uh, at this moment either uh, under construction or planned to be built in the world. And you can see that the whole 
centralized large infrastructure dam building process is not really coming to an end, and it's actually growing. Um, now, if, if this was a business and I was running it, I would have said, okay, is the demand really there? Am I building this, these dams for the right reason? Or is it just because this is how I was taught to deal with this issue? This is a supply chain issue. Now I want to walk to you through the how water demand has changed over time. This is the water demand for the city of Seattle. The, uh, the black line shows how the demand has changed since the 1940s. And all the dotted lines shows the forecast for water demand for the city of Seattle. One thing you should remember is that since the 40s, the city of Seattle's population has grown, has doubled actually. It was about 300,000 people, now it's more than 700,000 people. And look at the water demand, look at the black line, and what you see is even though the population has more than doubled, the water demand hasn't changed that much. We have uh, really progressed in the way we use water. We have technologies that are using a lot, uh, that help us to use less water, different fixtures, different rules, and actually regulations that were put in place. So water demand is not really going up even though population is growing and our economic wealth and well-being is growing. And if this was a business that I was running and I was so off the whole time predicting what's coming next, I would have invested in all sort of wrong solutions, right? The next big this, the next big that, because I was expecting this water use to be doubled or tripled over time. This is not a Seattle issue. This is actually very common all across the US, and I put some examples here for you. Uh, you often hear Southern California and Los Angeles as a way of uh, when people talk about water, but actually very similar story. Their populations had doubled, but their water use hasn't changed at all. So this means that actually that approach that I'm gonna go bring water to people as the population grows is not really a sustainable way of thinking about water and we have to incorporate this human dimension and human dynamics into the decision making process and also need to consider this feedback loop in our decision making. Okay. So, my team actually works on trying to, uh, to better understand this human dynamics and better understand how people's water use is changing over time and how that would eventually impact water infrastructure or infrastructure planning in the long run. Um, I'm going to bring you, I, I'm going to talk about one example here um, large landscape irrigation actually and how people are using it. So, this is a map of uh, green uh, grass, the amount of grass we have in the U.S., lawns in the U.S. So you might probably have not had guessed, but we, the, the biggest crop we are growing in the U.S. is lawns, <laughs> okay? Last time I remember I ate lawns was, I can't even remember. So we don't even need them. We just like them because it's leisurely, it's beautiful. We like to look outside and see how nice it is. But the reality is they use four times more water than corn, okay? And they use, and we are growing them everywhere. And, and the Western US is actually, um, which is a very dry region, it's, it sort of trying very hard to use, come up with enough water to make this happen. But actually, I was having a conversation with someone from Michigan that were telling me exactly the same thing. So it's, I guess it's not a Western US problem at all. Um, so I'm going to bring you down to California. And in, Cal in California, we actually, 50% of our water is used in outdoor spaces. Uh, about 34% of that in the household, how, uh, residential buildings, but 10% of that water is used for landscape irrigation. And landscape irrigation, large landscape irrigation is basically, is uh, all the malls and institutional buildings, and if you live in a large HOA building, all the grass that you, they maintain for you, that's how much, that's, those are the spaces we, we call large landscape. And for California, this is about 0.9 million acre feet per year. Now, what does that mean? That is the amount of water of 2 million households, not people, households can use for one year. We use that much water to maintain all this manicured, beautiful grass, okay? So if we can sh shave off some of that water, that can go a long way, right? So 
we, want, we were very interested to see how such a, what kind of conservation behavior do we see in this kind of spaces, and is there a way we can sort of use that as a way of planning for future infrastructure. This, the story I'm gonna tell you is gonna be from the city of Redwood City, right off uh, north of uh, Stanford. Um, they're actually, the reason we work with them is because they have smart meters, which collect data every 15 minutes. They send data to people, and, um, and also they collect that data information on water use per, um, per uh, meter. And um, very in interestingly enough, they also have invested in recycling. So they have a recycling plant that, that recycles the water, and that water is provided to uh, some of their customers for their outdoor water use. And remember, we are talking about large landscapes, right? So for the outdoor water use. So we had a very nice, nice experiment without us necessarily needing to select people. They have a group of people that receive water from the tap, port portable water, and we have another group of people that receive water from, um, from recycling plants. And these two groups actually, uh, during the recent drought in California, how many of you remember we had a huge drought in California just recently, right? So this is from 2013, 2016, and, um, and it was, a, it was a very severe drought, and a lot of people, especially outdoor water use, was under restriction. They were try, there was a lot of effort to try to make people use less water. And people who actually, in this specific experiment that we have, um, people who had access to recycling water, recycled water, they were not under restriction. They were actually encouraged to use water because this was the infrastructure that they missed, the city invested in. It's expensive to run it. They want to sell this product. Again, remember, water is a product that's being sold, so they want people to buy that product because it's expensive to generate that recycled water. However, the portable water that was coming from natural sources, it was under restriction. Now, interestingly enough, these people were under the same re different regimes or restrictions. However, they were receiving the same kind of information overall. Actually, Fanny gave a very interesting talk earlier this morning, which talked about knowledge and how much information we gain and how do we make decisions. We actually, during that period in California, we, we, there was a lot of media coverage of the drought in California. It was a period of calm. Tons of uh, articles were being written uh, on this issue. We actually developed a search algorithm that basically scraped the web for all the articles that had been written called Articulate. And what you see here, actually, the blue line shows the Google searches. How many people went online and searched, is, the California, in, is California in drought? Is the drought over? What are conservation? Different, different ter search terms. And the, uh, and the red line shows the, um, shows the the number of articles that was written. And you actually saw that little uh, red and blue on the bottom in the previous slide too. That basically shows if California, if it's in red, it's in a drought, if it's in blue, if it's, it's in a wet year or a normal year. So these people were under the same regime, uh, different regimes for water restrictions, but they were actually under the same amount of information bombardment from the media. And interestingly enough, if you look at the, one, the, the, the bar charts, they're below zero because they're conserving water, so they're using less water. So the blue ones are the people who are using portable water, and the purple ones are people who are using recycled water. And what you see is, even though the recycled water users were encouraged to use more water, they still saved, right? They did not use the, the, the same amount of water they used to because they were actually receiving this information that we are in a drought, we should change our behavior. In, another interesting way of looking at this was basically looking at uh, neighborhood norms. Again, this is the city of Redwood City, and you can see the, the group in the bottom on the left red part are people who mostly receive portable water for their outdoor space, and the people in the corner top, right, top left are the ones who are receiving uh, recycling water. And, and those, um, the, the Geddes Ort statistic basically shows how people are changing their behavior based on their neighborhood norms. And here what you are seeing is, Recycled water people are also saving, 
And not only they are saving, over time, this, this movement is growing, right? Now, they are blue versus red because, port remember, portable water people were under restriction to, save, to use less water, right? So they were saving a lot more. But even the blue shows, even though they were not under restriction, they were still saving water. We could not have done this if, an, if we did not have access to all that data and haven't done a lot of work in matching different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, the, you know, buildings and different units to, diff, to the meters, to the data, to all these different pieces. This would not have been possible. And I really appreciate the, um, the, the earlier talk, the fact that you know, Stanford's um, uh, parallel computing and cluster computing was extremely useful for making these things happen quickly. Um, so as you see, as the years go by, more people start saving and this neighborhood norms grows. The last thing about this talk that I wanted to give, that the, about this uh, study that I want to talk to you about, is about how income had impact in the way people saved water and how their behavior changed over time. So 2014 was very dry, and the, the blue line that you see shows the trend in water conservation, you see that people were saving, but not that much. By 2014, we had a lot of restriction in place on how much water people should use. So you see there's a drop in water use in that line. And then by 2016, some of the restrictions were lifted. However, and however, some people in a lower income communities or some of the uh, you know, less high income people continued saving water. However, you see in the affluent neighborhoods, the water use started going back up. That's why you see there's a, there's a slope in that, in that blue line at the end. Okay, so this was, a, this was an example to show you. What, one thing I would say is um, what, when you go back and look at these people, you see some of these water use never comes back because people go replace their lawns, by actually native uh, uh, landscaping, or they just get rid of all their lawns and do other things with their space. And that means that they're structurally changing the way they use water, okay? So that means that we, instead of building a recycling plan and asking people to use water, maybe we should actually more closely look how we can make them use less water. So basically moving from uh, supply side management to demand side management, which is more driven by how humans make decisions and how those decisions can impact our long-term sustainability. Water scarcity is not going to go away. It's one of the world's most pressing problems. And I, I know Margot and I were talking yesterday and she wanted me to talk about how these kind of things impacts people. And I would say the biggest, the, the commun disadvantaged communities and underserved communities are the ones that are most impacted by these decisions. Because as we build more large centralized infrastructure, the cost of water goes up, so somebody has to pay for that, so everybody needs to pay for that. And also on top of that, they are the one who at the end end up having problems with access to clean water. With that, um, I hope I'm, ha I'm here. I'm happy to help the, to answer any other questions you may have, but I appreciate being here. Thank you so much, Nisa. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about those slides. It was great. This is such a wonderful example of how data analysis can help with uh, understanding such an important topic as water usage and help also set policy. So uh, thanks for shining a light on that. And uh, I don't think we've ever had problems with slides before, so we'll figure out what happened. We'll do data analysis on it. <laughs> it's time for another uh, caffeine break and bio break. Just wanted to ask you to please be back here just before 3.30. We're starting exactly at 3.30 and hope you have an enjoyable break.
live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host Sonia Tagare and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Emily Glassberg Sands, the head of data science at Coursera. Emily, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, so great to be on. So tell us a little bit more about what you do at Coursera. Yeah, absolutely. So Coursera is the world's largest platform for higher education. We partner with about 160 universities and 20 industry partners, and we provide top learning content from data science to child nutrition to about 50 million learners around the world. Um, I lead the end-to-end -end data team, so spanning data engineering, data science, and machine learning. Wow, um, and, and we just had Daphne Kohler on earlier this morning, who's the co-founder of Coursera, Absolutely. and she's also the one who hired you. Yeah. So tell us more about that relationship. Well, I, I love Daphne, I think the world of her. Um, as I will talk about shortly, she actually didn't hire me from the start. The first okay. answer I got from Coursera was a no, that the company wasn't quite ready for someone who, who wasn't a full-blown coder, uh, but I eventually talked her into bringing me on board and she's been an inspiration ever since. I think one of my first memories of Daphne um, was when she was painting the vision of what's possible with online education. And she said, um, think about the first movie. The first movie was literally just filming a play on stage. You'll appreciate this, <laughs> given your background in film. And then fast forward to today and think about what's possible in movies that could never be possible on the brick and mortar stage. And the analog she was um, creating was that the first MOOC, the first massive open online course, was very simply filming a professor in a classroom. Uh -huh. um, but she was thinking forward to today and tomorrow and five years from now and what's possible in terms of how data and technology can transform how educators teach and how learners learn. That's very cool. Um, so how has Coursera changed from when she started it to now? So it's evolved a lot. Um, so I've been at Coursera about six years. Uh, when I joined the company had less than 50 people. Today we're wow. 10 times that size, we have 500. I think there've been um, obviously dramatic growth in the platform overall, but three main changes to our business model. Um, the first is we've moved from partnering exclusively with universities to recognizing that actually a lot of the most important education for folks in the labor market is being taught within companies. So Google is super incentivized to train people in Google Cloud, Amazon in AWS, folks need to learn Tableau and a whole host of other softwares. So we've expanded to including education that's provided not just by top institutions like Stanford, but also by top institutions that are companies like Amazon and Google. Um, the second big change is we've recognized that while for many learners an individual course or a MOOC is sufficient, some learners need access to full degree, a diploma bearing credentials. So uh, we've moved to the degree space. We now have 14 degrees live on the platform, masters in computer science and data science, but also in business, accounting, and so on. Um, and the the third major change is I think just sort of as the world has evolved to recognize that folks need to be learning throughout their lives, there's also general consensus that it's not just on the individuals to learn, but also on their companies to train them and governments as well. And so we launched Coursera for Enterprise, which is about providing learning content through employers and through governments so we can reach a wider swath of individuals who might not be able to afford it themselves. And how are you able to use data science to track individual um, user preferences and user behavior? Yeah, that's a great question. So you can imagine, right, 50 million learners, they're from almost every country in the world, they're from a range of different backgrounds, have a bunch of different goals. And so I think what you're getting at is that so much of creating the right learning experience for each person is about personalizing that experience. Um, and we personalize throughout the learner journey. So in discovery, uh, up front, when you first join the platform, we ask you, what's your career goal? What role are you in today? And then we help you find the right content to close the gap. As you're moving through courses, we predict whether or not you need some additional support, whether it's a fully automated intervention, like a behavioral nudge, emphasizing growth mindset, or a pedagogical nudge, like recommending the right review material, uh, and provide it to you. And then um, we also do the same to accelerate support staff on campus. So we identify for each individual what type of human touch might they need, and we serve up to support staff uh, recommendations for who they should reach out to, whether it's a counselor reaching out to a degree student who hasn't logged in for a while, or a TA reaching out to a degree student who's struggling with an assignment. So data really powers all of that, understanding someone's goals, their backgrounds, the content that's going to close the gap, as well as understanding where they need additional support and what type of help we can provide. And how are you able to track this data? Are you using A-B testing? Yeah, great question. So um, the uh, we call it eventing level data, which basically tracks what every learner is doing as they're moving through the platform. Um, and then we use A-B testing to understand the influence of kind of our big features. So say we roll out a new 
search ranking algorithm or a new learning experience. We would A-B test that, yes, to understand how learners in the new variant compare to learners in the old variant. Mm -hmm. um, but for many of our machine learned systems, we're actually doing more of a multi-arm banded approach where on the margin, we're changing a little bit the experience people have to understand what effect that has on their downstream behavior, separate from this mass hold in or hold out A-B test. And so today you're giving a talk yeah. about uh, Coursera's latest data, data products. Give us a little insight about that. So I'm covering three data products that we've launched over the last couple of years. The first two are oriented around really helping learners be successful in the learning experience. So the first is predicting when learners are going to need additional nudges and intervening in fully automated ways to get them back on track. The second is about identifying learners who need human support and serving up really um, easily interpretable insights to support staff so they can reach out to the right learner with the right help. And then the third is a little bit different. It's about once learners are out in the labor market, how can they credibly signal what they know so that they can be rewarded um, for that learning on the job? And this is a product called Skill Scoring where we're actually measuring what skills each learner has up to what level. So I can, for example, compare that to the skills required in my target career or show it to my employer so I can be rewarded for what I know. And that can be really helpful when people are creating resumes by, by, by uh, ranking how, how much of, of a skill that they have. Absolutely. So it's really interesting when you when you talk about resumes, so many of what so much of what's shown on resumes are traditional credentials. Things like what school did you go to, what did you major in, what jobs have you had. And as you and I both know, there's unequal access to the school you go to or the early jobs you get. And so part of the motivation behind skill scoring is to create more equitable or fair or accessible signals for the labor market. So we're really excited about that direction. And do you think companies are taking that into consideration when they're hiring people who say have like a, a five out of five skill in mm -hmm. computer science but they didn't go to Stanford? Yeah. Do you think they're taking that? Absolutely. I think companies are hungry to find more diverse talent. And the biggest challenge is when you look at people from diverse backgrounds, it's hard to know who has what skills. And so skill scoring provides a really valuable input. We're actually seeing it in use already by many of our enterprise customers who are using it to identify who of their internal employees is well positioned for new opportunities or new roles. For example, I may have a bunch of back-end engineers. If I know who's good in math and machine learning and statistics, I can actually tap those folks to transition over to machine learning roles. Uh, and so it's used both as an external signal, an external labor market, as well as an internal signal within companies. And, and just our last question here, yeah. um, what advice would you give to young women who are either out of college or, or just starting college yeah. who are interested in data science, yeah. who maybe you know don't haven't majored in a typical data science major? Yeah. What advice would you give to them? So I love that you asked who haven't major, majored in a typical data science major. I'm actually an economist by training. Um, and I think that's probably the reason why I was at first rejected from Coursera, because an economist is a very strange background to go into data science. Um, I think my, my primary advice to those young women would be to really not get too lost in the data science, in the math, in the algorithms, and instead to remember that those are a means to an end, and the end is impact. So think about the problems in the world that you care about. For me, it's education. For others, it's healthcare or personal finance or a range of other issues. And remember that data science provides this vast set of tools that you can use to solve the problems you care about most. That's great. Thank you so much for being on theCUBE. Thank you. I'm Sonia Tigare. Thank you so much for watching, watching theCUBE and stay tuned for more. Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, and welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagari, and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS, Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Nusha Jami, who's the Director of Urban Water Policy for Stanford. Nusha, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your role. So I direct this urban water policy program at Stanford. We focus on building solutions to, for resilient cities. We try to use data science and also the mathematical uh, models to better understand how water uh, use is changing and how we can build future cities and infrastructure to address the needs of the people in the U.S., in California, and across the world. 
That's great. And you're going to give a talk today about um, how to build water security using big data. Sure. So give us a preview of your talk. Sure. So uh, the 20th century water infrastructure model was very much of a top-down model. So we built solutions or infrastructure to bring water to people. Um, but people were not part of the loop. They were not, the way that they behaved, their decision-making process, what they use, how they use it, wasn't necessarily part of the process. And we assume there's enough water out there to bring water to people and they can do whatever they want with it. So what we are trying to do is you want to change this paradigm and try to make it more bottom up uh, to engage people's decision making process and the uncertainty associated with that as part of the infrastructure planning process. Um, so I'll, be talk a, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And where is the most water usage coming from? So interestingly enough, in developed world, especially in the, in the Western United States, 50% of our water is used outdoors for grass and uh, outdoor spacing, which we don't necessarily uh, are dependent on, our lives don't depend on it. Um, I, I'll talk about the statistics in my talk, but um, grass is the biggest crop we are growing in the U.S. while we are not really needing it for uh, food consumption and also it uses four times more water than, uh, than uh, um, uh, corn, which, wow. is, which is a lot of water. And in California alone, if you just think about some of the spaces that we have, the grass uh, or green spaces we have outdoors in, the in, the, uh, in, in these uh, malls or uh, institutional buildings or different outdoor spaces we have, some of that water, if we can save it, they can provide water for about a million or two million people a year. So that's a lot of water that we can be able to, we can save and use or, or actually uh, repurpose for needs that we really have. So does that also um, boil down to uh, like ev people uh, watering their own lawns or is it the problem for much bigger grass sure. usage? Actually, interestingly enough, that's only 10% of our water, outdoor water use. The rest of it is actually the residential water use, which is what you and I, the grass you and I have in our backyard, and uh, we're watering it. So that water is even more than that amount that I mentioned. Wow. So we use a lot of water outdoors. And um, again, uh, some of these green spaces are important for community building, for making sure everybody has has access to uh, green spaces and people, kids can play soccer or play outdoors, uh, but really our individual lawns and outdoor spaces, if they are not really uh, native, um, uh, you know, landscaping, it's not something that we use enough to justify the amount of water you use for that purpose. So taking longer showers and all this stuff is, is very minimal compared to... Uh, no, not at all. Actually, those are also very, very important. That's another 50% of our water that we use in our urban areas. Um, uh, it is important to be mindful the way we wash dishes, the way we uh, take shower, the way we uh, brush our teeth and not wasting water while we're doing that. And a lot of other individual decisions that we make that can impact our water use on a daily basis. Right. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about right now in California, we just had a dry February, sure. which is the first in 150 years. And, you know, this is a huge issue for cities, agriculture, mm -hmm. and for potential wildfires. Sure. Um, so tell us about your opinion about that. So um, the... The 20th century infrastructure model I mentioned at the beginning, one of the flaws in that system is that it assumes um, that we will have enough snow in the mountains that would uh, melt during the spring and summertime and would provide us water. The problem is climate change has really, really impacted that assumption, and now we are not getting as much snow, which is, comes back to the fact that 
this February, we have not received any snow. We are still in the winter and we have spring weather and we don't really have much snow on the mountain, which means that's going to impact the amount of water we have for summer and springtime. This year, we had a great last year. We got enough water in our reservoirs, which means that uh, we can potentially make it through. Um, but when you have consecutive years that are dry and we don't receive a lot of water precipitation in the form of snow or uh, rain, that will become a very uh, problematic issue uh, to meet future water demand in California. And do you think this issue is um, along with not having enough rainfall, but also about how we store water, or do you think there should be a change in that policy? Sure, I think that is definitely has something also in the way we store water. We definitely, we are in the 21st century, we have different problems and challenges. It's good to think about uh, alternative ways of uh, storing water, including using groundwater sources, groundwater as a way of storing excess water or moving water around faster and making sure we, we use every drop of water that falls on the ground and uh, also protecting our water supplies from contamination or pollution. And do you see us ever going to desalination in order to get clean water? So interestingly enough, I think desalination definitely has worked in other parts of the world uh, when, they have, when you have smaller population or you have already tapped out of all the other options that are available to you. Desalination is an expensive solution. Uh, costs a lot of money to build this infrastructure and also again depends on uh, you know this centralized approach that we will build something and provide resources to people from uh, from that location so it's very costly to build this kind of solutions I think for for California we still have plenty of water that we can save and uh, repurpose I would say, and also we still can do recycling and reuse. We can capture our stormwater and reuse it. So there's so many other cheaper, more accessible options available before we go ahead and build a desalination plant. And you're going to be talking about sustainable um, water resource management. So sure. tell us a little bit more about that too. So sustainable water resource management and uh, Occasionally I use also the word, word like building resilient water future. It's all about diversifying our water supply and being mindful of how we use our water. Every drop of water that we use, it's degraded and needs to be cleaned up and put back in the environment. So it always starts from the bottom. The more you save, the less impact you have on the environment. The second thing is you want to make sure every drop of water that we use, we can use it as many times possible and not make it, not, not take it, use it, lose it right away, but actually be able to use it multiple times for different purposes. Another point that's very important is actually majority of the water that we use on a daily basis is, doesn't need to be extremely clean drinking water quality. For example, if you tell someone that we are flushing down to our toilets drinkable water, it would surprise you that we would spend this much time and uh, resources and money and Welcome back to the afternoon session for WIDS. And I just want to say how amazing it is to see all of you here still and to hear the level of the discussion. So everybody's still awake and everybody's still here and it's 3.30, we've been going the whole day, but it is just absolutely wonderful to see all your energy and, uh, and your enthusiasm. Now, before we start with the career panel, uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce you, and hopefully they're in the room right now, otherwise I'll just talk to them, uh, about them. I mean, the two artists that we have, Andrea and Patricia, are you in the room? If so, get up. They may actually be putting their stuff together, but let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we really like this interface of art and uh, data science. And so like last year, when we had two artists, we asked two 
artists working in that space to come and exhibit. And uh, I will tell you again, just before the reception, but we have Pat Patricia Alessandrini from Stanford, and she's gonna give a demo, the use of artificial intelligence in music. And she will do that in the living room, at the piano, at the start of the reception. And we have uh, Andrea Gaglia uh, Gagliano, and she's from Getty Images, and she's a, a machine learning expert who works on, on visualization and images. Yesterday we talked in the podcast, and she said that she does things like uh, detecting super cheesy smiles, uh, <laughs> which I thought was amazing. So that's SCSD, the acronym, Super Cheesy Smile Detection. So apparently that is something you can do in machine learning. Uh, but she has an amazing exhibit of 16 beautiful portraits, and you'll be surprised at this. I won't tell you what this is about. Just go and see it later at reception. But now I want to uh, turn it over to Martina, and you're going to take uh, all these amazing guests here through the career panel, so thanks very much for that. Martina Lovchenko. an honor to be on stage with this utterly amazing group of women. You've heard from astrophysicists and statisticians, you're about to hear from an economist, and this is the part of the day where we focus on you and the difference that you can make in your choices about your career and how you direct your talents to make the world a better place by way of example of the amazing people that are here on stage with me. And you have their bios inside your program. I encourage you to read them because they will blow you away. So I will just introduce them individually so you know who's who as we're speaking. But immediately to my right, you already know Talithia Williams, who's an associate dean and associate professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd. Next to her is Rukmini Ayer, who is a distinguished engineer at Microsoft for the Bing and the Research and AI groups. Next to her is Denise Ross, who is at the National Conference for, on Citizenship and also senior fellow at Georgetown. And next to her is Lillian Carquios, who is an insights manager at Spotify as well as a data scientist. So you can imagine everyone in here is asking themselves, all right, academic pedigree. We have a bunch of PhDs and master's degrees up here on stage. Is it, is it really deterministic in the path that I choose? And I'm just curious, how many people on stage today, when you got your various degrees, knew or had a sense of what you'd be doing today? I did. Okay, so, <laughs> so half of our group did. All right, so maybe we'll start with you, Rukmini, since you had a sense. Yeah. You started off with civil engineering, but then you pursued a PhD in electrical engineering. Yes. And chose to stay in industry. So tell us how you made that decision and how you wind up on your path to where you right. are today. Right, so I, um, I started my first year in civil engineering, and it's because I read Anne Rand's Fountainhead, um, and that was all it took. <clears throat> and at the end of the first year, the counselor told me that, hey, your math and physics grades are really great, but you're barely passing your engineering drawing class. And so he really recommended I do computer science or computer engineering then. And I really didn't want to sit in front of a computer. So I said, okay, what's the worst you know, among the whole slate of degrees? And I said, I'll be an electrical engineer because it was still engineering, and computers didn't feel like engineering. Uh, so I went into electrical engineering, third year in electric, uh, fourth year in electrical engineering, I did my a bachelor's project. And when I was doing that project, I realized, I, I did a project in speech recognition, and I saw dynamic programming for the first time, and I fell in love. And I knew from then that I was going to work in this field. And had my civil engineering self read a little bit more, I would have maybe figured it out earlier. Uh, but I actually think I'm very resilient because I keep moving around. I choose, you know, I'm, I choose things because I'm interested in them. And I usually uh, like to solve problems, so I end up you know, veering towards where the biggest problem is. And so from that perspective, I think all these changes have just made me more resilient um, and made me appreciate the diversity of people that you need to bring together when you're really trying to solve something hard. And Talithia, you did not put up your hand, but you also pursued a PhD in statistics. So how did you wind up? Academia tends to be more deterministic. So at what point did yeah. you know that that was the path you wanted to be on? Such a great question. So um, I went to Spelman College for undergrad, which is a historically black college for women in Atlanta. And so it was very empowering to be taught by black women who had PhDs in all these different areas. And so I started in a PhD program in mathematics. 
and took a biostatistics elective. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at a data set of mothers, uh, some of whom had smoked during gestation and some who had not. This is uh, looking at historical data. And did like a linear regression. And I'm just like, why are we, first of all, why are women smoking during pregnancy? Like everybody <laughs> knows. And so we're looking at this data and you know, clearly for women who smoke during pregnancy, they had shorter gestations and lighter birth weight babies. And you know, a professor said, so you know, what's your conclusion? And we're just like, duh, smoking you know, is harmful to your baby. And then he talked about how the tobacco industry refuted the, the data when it first came out. Like, oh no, it's not smoking. It's mother's ethnicity, it's background. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, look at the data, like the only difference in these women is whether or not they smoke. And so that was the moment where I was like, I'm gonna be the one who looks at data and like pulls <laughs> information against the man. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the moment. And then I, I switched <coughs> PhD programs. So I then applied to stats PhD programs, uh, left my PhD program in math and, and went on into statistics. Yeah. And Academia is a choice for you chose industry, industry you chose yeah. academia. Was there a reason why you thought, I want to do that in academia as opposed to in industry? Right, summer's off. <laughs> good reason. Smart. Sorry, yeah. Smart. Yeah. Good summer, reason. spring break, I wanted to have kids and wanted their schedule to match mamas. That was pretty much it. Yeah. That is an excellent reason. I, started, uh, I started in research, so I was in research labs, but I quickly veered towards products and I really like solving product problems, and I'm not such a huge fan of publishing, so I ended up, you know, uh, I just veered in that direction, and then I found success there too, so yeah, I think each to his own path. It was re definitely reinforcing. Yeah. So Lillian, for you, you mentioned that you very intentionally wanted to be, get a master's degree and very intentionally went to a liberal arts college despite being STEM oriented. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how yeah. you made that choice. So I, when I was a teenager and going into deciding a college, I absolutely knew that I wanted to study math. That was like not even a question for most people that knew me because I just had a deep curiosity and it had really become part of like how I looked at problems and, and thought about things. And uh, I, so when I was looking at colleges, um, Smith College to me like really uh, was a special place to me beyond it being a women's college, which is really meaningful when you're talking about being a math or engineering student. Um, there was also a place where I could be challenged to think about things differently. So I was very comfortable in my math space. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be somewhere where it was hard and challenging and intellectually um, uh, challenging. So I, you know, I had an undeclared minor in Latin American studies because I just took so many courses in that area. I took sociology courses. I took neuroscience for non-experts, like film courses, logic class. Um, so I just got exposed to a lot of different ways of thinking. And I just found that to be extremely necessary for me to also then be able to go deeply into math. Something about that balance really helped me. Um, and I raised my hand earlier about deterministic paths because uh, at the point where I was going into grad school, I'd been out of school for a couple of years and decided to do a master's. This is before there were any data science programs anywhere for a master's. So what I did was I did this program called an industrial math degree, um, which they offered at WPI in Massachusetts. And it's basically an, an, um, uh, an applied math degree, but you focus on an area in industry. So it's for folks who want to go into grad school in order to go back into industry rather than PhD. And I was able to add a machine learning track to my degree. And so I knew that I wanted to work in technology with data and understand analytics through machine learning. Um, and I was able to do that through this program. And Denise, you're the only one on stage that has chosen government and service as your professional path. And I'm curious if you observe within that field, how much does academic credentials or pedigree matter and did it play a consequential role for you in the path that you chose? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I've spent a few years in the Obama White House and uh, I remember be, when I would be introduced to people, um, it wasn't any credentials that I necessarily had. It was the fact that I had come out of the city of New Orleans. So when someone would introduce me, this is Denise Ross, and she used to work at the city of New Orleans. Wow. So I had this authenticity because I was in New Orleans. You know, I was just sort of doing the um, 
heads down doing the hard work of democratizing data um, when Katrina happened. And then we had a really important mission because um, the federal levies had failed, 80% of the city had flooded, and we were flying blind. We couldn't make basic decisions about like what child care centers which should we reopen first, and um, you know where should we put up the health clinics, and which parks, which and great, and play, great playgrounds should we rehab first. So um, you know my my role was with the team was to help rebuild the data as we rebuilt the city. What's interesting last um, night there were a bunch of us that got together <coughs> from the conference for dinner. And one of the topics that came up at dinner was the view of data science from different vantage points. And in Silicon Valley, it's highly revered. It is, the, it is how the future that all of us were talking about, all this AI, it's coming <coughs> from data science. But that in industry, and in traditional industries, that they don't quite get the role of data science yet. <laughs> and one of the things that you were describing there is, okay, the levies failed, and how, how do we use data to help us make and shape and inform these decisions? So especially, Government, nonprofits, all of that, they tend to be less forward leaning in their understanding <laughs> of technology. <laughs> so what is your observation of how, how can data science stand itself up in those more traditional industries and be seen for the potential that it truly has? Yeah, well, I was really fortunate because I, I moved into um, local government when um, the, the federal government had already set a precedent. So Obama had really leaned forward in data transparency and public engagement. And so at the local level, there was this incredible optimism because what we had in New Orleans after the storm was an asymmetry of information. So we couldn't, the, the problem was bigger than government and it was bigger than the people. And we had to align efforts in, it in order to be able to solve the problem. Um, and what government had to do was, uh, was release the data that only it had. Mm. Um, and, but their, their information systems were in shambles. <laughs> And so uh, it would really best be described as a pathological complexity mm. inside, inside of government. Um, but what was amazing is that I, there was this incredible talent, this latent talent, that just hadn't had the opportunity to um, really rise to their fullest potential. So when you're working in government, it's really about finding the talent that already exists and helping them be the best, you know, best civil servants they can be. So, Rukmini, you're in a massive organization. Yes. And finding talent, since we're speaking of finding talent and developing it, yes. where that is extremely <clears throat> important. And how do you find that talent? How do you interview for it and select it and assess it? Yes. Especially when I'm sure Microsoft gets like the gold-plated resumes around the world from around the world. Yes, it does. <laughs> are you guys hiring? <laughs> we are hiring. Okay. We are always <laughs> hiring. Uh, and in, you know, if you're in Microsoft <laughs> Research, they get you. I think what is the the diamond plated resumes too. Um, so, so we hire across the spectrum, both industry veterans as well as students uh, coming out of their masters and PhD programs. And <clears throat> the traditional interviews, I think a lot of you, you here must be Silicon Valley veterans. You can regurgitate textbooks. There are those type of interviews. There are the puzzle solving interviews, which gives you a migraine at the end of it. So I'm sure Microsoft has those types of interviews too. Typically, my interview, I ask more open-ended questions. Uh, and I'm really looking for people who care more. They, they don't just care about what they build. They care about who uses it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people who ask me questions about, hey, who's your consumer? And what kind of challenges do your consumers face with your products? I'm really interested in those people because they really care about the end-to-end -end use of technology versus just hey, I built this really large neural network with this open source software and it does 95% accuracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I really want to see more than that. So that's mm -hmm. one. And this, the second type of people that I really like are people who, who question a lot. Like, you know, even if I say, oh, we have really large models, they ask details. What do you mean by a large model? Aren't you overfitting on data? They ask questions that tell me that they're thinking very deeply about machine learning and data science, and it's not just uh, you know, terms and phrases that you use. And I'll add, as someone that doesn't interview candidates for data science, but interviews, a, I probably do two or three interviews a week, just that questioning mindset where you're asking questions and fr pr framing and probing to understand is just as important as the answers that you come up with. Yes. Um, Lillian, you, you talked about the fact, so you're an insights manager now, mm -hmm. where you're basically trying to have the user at the center 
and take all of these inputs and figure out, well, how does that all add up to an improved experience, more personalized experience? Yeah. So tell us a little bit how those teams get constructed yeah. and what you think is the most positive dynamic and, and, and how you use all those levers together. Yeah, so at Spotify, it's extremely collaborative and there are lots of very deep thinkers who are experts in their little corners and it takes a lot of talent on top of that to be somebody that can bridge those experts together. And so I'm, I'm trying something new where um, I really care about human-centered design um, in technology and I really care about human-centered evaluation of AI and ML products. So I'm trying to drive that forward. There are lots of other people who care too, but we haven't had an organized front together. So what we're trying to do is really think about the different pieces that different teams really care about. So the MLEs might care a lot about performance, machine learning engineers, excuse me, might care a lot about performance of a model and might care about precision and accuracy. Um, the product managers, who are the, basically the, the business thinkers in an engineering team, might really care about the final business metric. Is this optimizing for the thing that we're trying to improve, that I promised my boss I was going to do, that he promised his boss he was going to do so, all of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the research scientists are a different group that are interested in the horizon of the state of the art research in this area. And so my team is an insights team. We have mixed methods. So we have user researchers who do lots of foundational and qualitative research, one-on-one -on -one with users or at scale for, through surveys or other research, and we have data scientists who dig deep into the data, create metrics, and try to bridge sort of the data to how humans are actually behaving. Um, and so our team is trying to be the, the bridge along all of that so that we can take that state-of-the-art horizon thinking and put it into the product and make it feel so that everyone feels like they're winning by being able to t tell the story from each of their perspectives in a way that makes sense and in a way that makes them feel like they're having an impact in a positive way. Um, so that's the approach that I'm taking and the idea is definitely put the human in the center and figure out how to translate that for each of the different types of experts that we're collaborating with. I think that really reinforces uh, Sue Jay's point earlier about AI requires really high EQ and that's something that all of us need to take away in however we apply our jobs and our work. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about advocacy versus mentorship. And the distinction that I'm drawing there is mentorship is an expert that is sharing their expertise with you so that you can learn. And advocacy is somebody that is ahead of you on their career path that actively advocates on your behalf to help you with your career. And Talithia, you'd mentioned that as you were going up that you were seeing these really cool black women that were professors. Did you have examples where people advocated on your behalf that really made a difference in your career? Absolutely. I mean, um, I think that uh, definitely in grad school, there were times where I was ready to quit. And uh, my department chair, who ended up becoming my advisor, was a huge advocate um, in terms of me staying in the program, but also, you know, helping to communicate my love for statistics in spite of the ways that I felt like I was not doing well. Um, and when she came back to me, she was like, people don't view you the way you view yourself, right? And so I was sort of really hard on myself. Um, but then also, you know, going out on the job market and being able to make those phone calls and say, I've got a great student. Um, I want you to think about her for your position um, has, has been fantastic. Um, and then just having mentors uh, outside. So now in my professional life, when I think about what the next step is for me, I look at folks in those positions and I'm you know, really sort of putting myself out there and asking them, you know, ways that I can be invited to the table. Uh, it's hard when you're not there, and especially when there aren't a lot of people who look like you who are already at the table. And so um, many of my advocates are majority men, right? White men who, you know, really want to see change in higher education leadership who are really saying, you know, we need to bring uh, different voices to the table. Um, because it's hard on the outside to say that, but you need someone on the inside who's pushing that, so. Yeah. I'm curious for the rest of the panel, how many of you had primarily white men as your advocates? It was a mix for me. So yeah. I, um, I, I can think of two real pivotal um, uh, sponsorships that I, that, I was benefit, that I benefited from. And one was when I was at the city of New Orleans. Um, this was uh, after I came back from maternity leave. I had twins. And, uh, and my boss says, what do you want to do when you grow up? 
And I said, I really want to work on climate change. And um, about six months later, the White House called, and they wanted to they wanted someone to talk to uh, talk, to talk on stage at the launch of the Climate Data Initiative. And Alan handed the phone to me. He was like, the White House oh, wow. called. You know, why don't you wow. take it? Which is sort of the most awesome boss move, right? That you can. <laughs> that is an awesome boss White House move. Awesome boss move. Yeah. He, he's a black man. Um, and uh, he, you know, he just. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and and he, he gets the best boss award. Um, and then the second time I benefited was when I was at the White House. Um, I was finishing up my Presidential Innovation Fellowship, and my colleague Clarence <laughs> Wardell and I had um, co-founded this project called the Police Data Initiative. It was sort of a side thing, um, but it was after Ferguson, and we both thought, well, what you know, the the national dialogue is. Um, there's a lot of people wondering, like, what is is police violence getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it better in some places, worse in others? We had no data to inform the national mm. discussion. And so Clarence and I had this idea, like, well, what if, what if police departments released the data they had mm. on use of force? Maybe that would change the national dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had this little side project that turned into one of the most tangible responses to the president's 21st century, 21st century policing task force. But our fellowship was running out. And so DJ Patel, who um, co-coined the term data, you know, data scientist, um, he put Clarence and my name on a post-it note on his monitor. And he worked the building oh, to try wow. to figure out a way to get us badged into the White House so we could you know, finish out Obama's term doing this policing work. And, and interestingly, Clarence and I ended up in different, very different roles, but um, DJ found a spot for both of us so we could still do the policing work. That's an amazing wow. story. All right, so take wow. note, everybody. Take some post-it notes. Keep them on your desk for who you need to help along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I should say yeah. that my, um, I've had also white male mentors very strong mentors. I mean, some who have kept me in my career. You know, when I had my child and I came back, at some point I was really overwhelmed and I was thinking of quitting. And my manager at that time said, you know, there's something called lie low. I know you haven't heard that term, but you could lie a little low, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, that really, good. you know, helped me ride, my, ride those couple of years, the initial couple of years. But I guess the biggest mentor I have is my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a rare woman in the field of electrical engineering working in AI and uh, she was doing excellent work. And she was a role model and a very, she had very strong expectations of her students. So she taught us to present, she taught us to write. Um, she, you know, she advocated for us. She was, she was a mentor, teacher, advocate, all of it put together. But so I think she would be my strongest mentor. Um, but there have been a host of allies all the way um, through Microsoft. She sounds amazing, <clears throat> and I would say for those of you that are at the point in your career where you can be what the <laughs> what Rukmini's PhD advisor is, take a page from that playbook. That is an extraordinary impact. Yeah. Lillian, I know you and Rukmini are working on the WIDS High School program. Yeah, yeah, so I just want to say that yeah. Rukmini is one of my angels. Uh, <laughs> 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 she connected me to the WIDS um, outreach program for high schoolers and then to this panel, so thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so we're, we, you saw me for two seconds on that video this morning, um, and apparently many high schoolers are gonna be hearing about a day in my life. Um, it was secretly two days because I got sick halfway through the first one, so. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really excited to share just a different, you know, one of the many different ways that you can be a data scientist today. Um, and just how different everything is. And I did, I think I made some jokes about spending too much time in meetings because one of the things that I want young people to know is like how important collaboration and being able to talk about data science to non-data scientists really is. Uh, so that was sort of the, the part that I tried to highlight. Um, I just think it's really important that we be able to tell the stories of what we're working on to non-experts. Imposter syndrome. Got to talk about it. And I'm just curious for the people in this room, how many people here, including the folks on the stage, so there's, everyone has doubts and fears, but have genuinely <coughs> felt like an imposter? Put your hand up. All right. So I do just want to make a note. Pay attention to that next time you're in a challenging conversation or a hard meeting. And remember what you just saw, which was at least half, maybe two-thirds of the room's hands went up. 
about how many people might look really confident and be acting like they're all that in the meeting, but on the inside are feeling a little tender. It's, it's one of the things that helps us collaborate better is to remember that about one another. So three of my panelists had their hands up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. William, you didn't. Yeah. So let's talk yeah, about so you. How only, did you master this? See, know, I'm going right? to get on my soapbox for a second here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference between being humble and still having low confidence because you're new and you're still learning and having imposter syndrome. I am, I, I am very lucky that something inside of me, and I'm, I'm sure it comes from my Boricua roots, <laughs> that uh, has always been like, OK, I have something to say, and I'm going to say it. And even if I'm wrong, I'm going to learn from whoever else corrects me. Uh, but imposter syndrome isn't something that I've ever really felt in the data science or math field, because I just feel so in love with the work that I do that even if I am incorrect, I know that I can learn from the mm -hmm. things that I'm doing incorrectly. Um, but I absolutely had low confidence early in my career. So I just think it's really important that we make that distinction because that low confidence in your skills um, means that there's something for you to learn. It means that you should reach out to other people to learn and get feedback. Um, and we're, we're all gonna go through that. Um, and I think, you know, I'd love for the conversation to change a little bit about how we can all help each other gain confidence in areas we're not so confident in, and less about whether or not you belong in that room, because every single one of you belongs in this room and in that room, wherever that is for you. So I can talk a little bit about <clears throat> the, the area of machine learning and AI is moving really fast. Mm. And so when you begin your career as an engineer or as a data scientist, you're really focused on one area, you're focused on one problem, and you really know the depths of it. But you know, as you, like where I am right now, I cover game theory and auction theory and all these areas, and sometimes I just feel like, oh my god, I gotta read these three textbooks before I know everything there is to know <laughs> about game theory. And then the little voice in my head says, no, that's not your job. There are three other people who are experts in that area. But there is that, you know, you, you do feel sometimes that the information is out of your control, like you really don't know the depths of it. Um, so it does happen now and then yeah. that, you know, you do feel, because the area is just moving really too fast. Like, I, you know, you do a tutorial. I did a tutorial in April. I prepared the material in March, and there was a conference in March, and there were three new papers that the audience asked me about. So, you know, this is how fast the area is moving. So you do feel that, and you got to just remind yourself that no one is asking you to really have a PhD in every field that you're talking about. Um, it's good to read and know as much as possible, but I think that's where some of the imposter syndrome starts. At least for me, that's where it begins with, that I like expertise, and so I feel like I should have expertise in everything, and I think we should remind ourselves that that's not how it's supposed to be. And I'm sure that is true for everybody in this room. We like being experts. That's why you're in data. Yeah. So, uh, so part of what you're articulating is the distinction between expertise and openness yes. and the desire we have to, sh to display expertise and how hard it is sometimes just to show openness and vulnerability. And <laughs> Talithi, one of the things I appreciate about your presentation was like, hey, here's me, here's my family, here's our data. <laughs> I'm sharing it with the world. It's a TED Talk. My husband's a TED Talk. So how did you get comfortable writing that line and, and being really open about your, your life and being vulnerable in that respect? Yeah, I mean, um, and I want to go back to the imposter syndrome too. I think being open, um, those were just the, the comments that I heard from people. That's really what people want to hear. Like they want to see transparency. They want to identify with you in the ways that you struggle. Um, I think the, the more sort of accoutrements that, that come, the more people sort of put you in this other category. And so I'm always ready to get on stage and be like, let me tell you how not other I am. Let me tell you how, <laughs> you know, I was in Walmart the other day, right? Like, and so, um, and so I, I love that about sharing the data because I think it just makes uh, my life relatable and also makes it... Um, a possibility to folks who may think like, oh, I just, I could never, like you sure can, um, and here's how you can do it. I think for me, the imposter syndrome, it's funny, when I was at Spelman, I didn't have any imposter syndrome, right? I was like, oh, great, I do math, I love math, I could sit in that space and like just take in the mathematics. I think it was when I got to Rice and I was the only woman and the only African-American and I was like, whoa, am I supposed to? Is this the right place? 
Um, and so even though I think that environment was really uh, supportive and hospitable, um, there were places that I got, I remember my fourth year as a stats PhD student, I was going to a stats conference in my area, super excited, you know, and I'm getting there and I'm like, oh, you, you know, folks who'd authored the books, right, how geeky is that? I'm like, can you sign my book? I learned, you know, math stats from you. Um, but yeah, I remember like walking up to a table and, and you know, the person's like, oh, ma'am, are you at the right conference? Because there's another one down the hall. And oh, I was God. like, mm, yeah, you know, I can read this big banner, you know. Um, <laughs> or, and so, I mean, I did you not. Um, and so like, I mean, I didn't say yeah. I was just like, oh, you know. Um, and, and so like, those are the moments I think where other people's opinion of me you know, even though like technically I know I'm those, supposed yeah. to be here and I know, you know, um, that little voice is like, but you know, she said, or, you know, someone says, oh, can you refill the coffee? And I'm like, oh. mm, yeah, nope, not here for that either. You know, I'm all for coffee. Don't get me wrong. Happy to, you know, um, but yeah, sometimes the assumption of people in my feel is that I don't belong. And so, you know, I have to wrestle with that, you know, when I'm going on stage and in front of people, you know, and like kick that voice out. Um, and so that's, for me, that's the imposter syndrome is really owning the space and, and believing that I deserve to be here, even when I know there are people who think I don't, right? It's not like a, do they, do they not? Like, no, they said it, they were clear and they were like, oh, okay, you're here, all right. Um, but yeah, for, for me, that's yeah. the issue. Yeah, yeah so, so the, maybe we're oh. naming things differently because I definitely 100% relate to what you just said yeah. about other people giving you a questionable a life, yeah. Yeah, reaction. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, it's a personality thing. I just sort of like stomp in there. I'm like, <laughs> yes, I am here. <laughs> but, but I do think we, we encounter those feelings and I think it's yeah. like finding good ways of coping with them in a way yeah. that empowers you rather than makes you feel like you should leave. So you don't cur curse them out, is that what I hear you saying? <laughs> Sorry? You don't, you don't cuss them out? No. Oh, no, I just like give them a look. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a non-verbal one. Oh, non-verbal, yeah. it's a non-verbal, okay. Yes, right. So I wanna make sure, speaking of empowerment, we have a couple, uh, time for a few questions if folks wanna ask some questions. Uh, I've got a microphone right over there with someone right next to it. Hi, so, I uh, am also in state service and I'm very new to data science in general. Um, and I'm being put in the position to teach it <laughs> to other people in government. And um, so one question I had was, what one piece of advice do you have for those that are new to the field or approaching it from a very different background. Um, mine is marine ecology. I like to poke fish. Um, <laughs> on how to enter into the field and persist successfully through time. So I, I can answer that. Um, build on the strengths that people already have uh, because you probably are already doing a lot of data science in your head. I mean, even, even people who don't, aren't scientists, you know, they do, um, they do the math when they're grocery shopping. You know, they might be sports fans and follow the mm -hmm. stats. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of math and analysis that we do day to day. And so what I do when I'm working with government folks is ident I identify something they've already done um, and sort of lift it up. And I also um, uh, you know, help identify what their pain points are because that's what they're gonna be most motivated to fix. So I don't come in with an agenda necessarily. I might have an agenda, but I don't lead with it. Um, I lead with what are their pain points and how can we use data to stop that phone from ringing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, then they own it. And Talitha, you'd mentioned in your talk about gateway ways to understanding data. Yeah. And what has worked really well for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I think for me, really, I'm connecting the material to the student, right? The more that they're connected to, or even the, not necessarily the student, but the person that we're working with, the more, like you say, we can re relate it to their bottom line or their interests or something that's going to bring them in and kind of hook them. You like what I did there? Hook? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that's my advice. <laughs> All right. Next question. Hi, um, my question is around kind of building a confident demeanor when sometimes you're the only woman in the room. And the reason I'm thinking this is more complex than it would sound 
is I'm always fluctuating. I've had two jobs in the data world, and my first job, I was told that I was overconfident, that there was an air about me down to the way I walked, and that I was very off-putting. And then at my new job, I don't know if I overcorrected, but they tell me, we're not sure if you have enough confidence. Like, if you could go into a meeting and really command the room, you need to boost your confidence. And when, after a year, when I had a chance to kind of establish myself and tell my manager, like, my previous journey, I didn't want that to be my lead-in, he couldn't even picture me getting that feedback in my old job. So I'm kind of confused sometimes. I want to be commanding, but it's very delicate, I feel like, as a woman. Maybe I'm generalizing. I, I don't think you're generalizing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, Cillian. Yeah. You, you have to integrate a lot of different voices in a room. How yeah. do you think it, it it's, work? Um, there is such a thing as both explicit and implicit bias in giving feedback. So uh, I think the, you know, I have been in that exact same position, is what I'll say. And for me, um, it was really coming to a point where there's a boundary between how I behave and how I live my values and try to connect with people that I work with versus how other people perceive it. And it's important to be able to distinguish the two for your own sanity, right? To be able to like be you. And I honestly, it, the moment for me came when I came back from, so I'd started from getting very personal. I started my job at Spotify already pregnant very secretly, <laughs> and uh, because that's what American women do. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but I, so it was very stressful startup into Spotify, but Spotify is a great environment. So it wasn't, um, it was a lot of it was internal, right? And I didn't realize that until I came back from maternity leave and that additional stress of pretending to be okay all the time like went away. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna be real. I'm just gonna be like, this is what's going on and I'm gonna be myself to as much as I can be and sort of try to meet other people halfway but also not rely entirely on what they thought. In that particular point though about feedback, I think um, uh, it's about continuing to push a little bit gently, sometimes assertively, to your current manager about concrete things, concrete steps, concrete recommendations, trainings, et cetera. Uh, and that gives you two things. One, it gives you a more concrete understanding of what they're thinking about and where they're coming from. And, it put, and the second thing that's really important is it pushes them to think about, is this a real thing or is this about something else? And it really helps them get to the point where they have to challenge their own conclusions and sometimes it just goes away. Just having that conversation makes them be like, oh yeah, that wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but sometimes it can actually help them help you more and help you get, get real steps to working toward where they imagine you could be. I have a very specific technique to also add to that, which is asking questions as opposed to proposing solutions. And you might phrase it very much in the design thinking way. How might we, or I'm curious if, and that lets the other people in the room feel like they're contributing to the conversation and that you can then direct. And so it's a more subtle way to inject yeah. your expertise. So it's a way of being confident but being inclusive to the, your, the first bit of feedback that you got. So we've got one minute left, so I'm going to do a super fast speed round before we wind things up. Can, um, can I, I, I do want to oh, let yes. you know that you should be yourself. And the first set of feedback that you got was wrong, and the second set is also sounds wrong to me. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you know, yeah, don't exactly. assume that people who are giving you feedback know more about you than, they, than you do. And so I, I'd say, I, exactly. I think the first version of you sounded great to me. The second version of you sounds very calm. So <laughs> yeah. combine the two, and you know, there you go. <laughs> uh, question some of the feedback that you get too. But be yourself. In the end, you spend more than 40 hours, in my case, even more than that at work. And you can be playing in a role at work. So you've got to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Great advice. All right, so real quickly, we're just going to up, go, up and back. Um, least favorite word, go. Best. Indifference. Disrupt. Optimize. <laughs> <laughs> and most favorite word. Ooh, I forgot. Come back to me. Um, my most favorite. Team. Data science is a team sport. <laughs> DJ's quote. Learning. Uh, inclusive excellence. 
That's right. And mine is belief. So we will leave you with those words of hopefully of inspiration to believe in yourselves in an inclusive learning type environment and to go forward and bring all your amazing data science potential to the world in whatever career path you choose. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Martina. You can, yeah. You. That's great. Well, uh, we have two more talks and uh, I'm really, really excited about Emily joining us here. Emily Klasberg Sands from uh, Coursera. And I was looking a little bit at her uh, bio that was not in the book. And I found this interview with you some time ago where it was said that when you were a little girl, your dad used to uh, uh -oh. Oh, <laughs> reward you by giving you fish whenever you accomplish something. Yeah. And so I thought I'd give you a fish, but I forgot it. So I, I, I drew some fish for you, Thank you. On, on, your, on the program, and this is my, my artwork That's to you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. This is my mind. Fantastic. Well, I'm delighted to be here today, and the Women in Data Science Conference is my favorite day of the year, really. So thank you all for, um, for uh, staying through this afternoon. Uh, my name is Emily, and I lead the data team at Coursera. Any Coursera learners in the room? Oh, fantastic. Um, more than imposter syndrome. I love it. Um, so, so today I'm going to walk you through three stories of how we're using data science to advance education. But before I dive into those, um, I want to go back a few years, not to the goldfish that I used to be rewarded with, um, but to 2013. Uh, I was just entering the fifth year of my PhD program, and I'd flown out here to the Bay Area to interview with Coursera. The company at the time was small but mighty. There were about 40 employees only, but you could already tell that Coursera had the potential to dramatically increase access to education. Um, and I was invigorated by the interview. I couldn't wait to start contributing. And so you can imagine my disappointment when the hiring manager called to let me know that they wouldn't be moving forward with my candidacy. Um, the explanation was that the company was still really early stage, including in the data infrastructure and the tooling, and there were questions about whether someone with a background like mine, remember my doctorate was in economics, uh, would be able to contribute. And the truth is the feedback was completely valid. I had actually come on site to interview for a role in the partnerships team and was handed off during the on site to a group in engineering. I had no background in engineering. I'd never worked at a tech company before. All I knew was that I wanted to contribute to education. So, this is Montfortin School. It's a small rural school in uh, south of Bozeman, Montana. It's my school. And this is Forest Park Trailer Park, where many of my classmates lived. A couple days a week, I was pulled out of class to be put in what's called the Gifted and Talented Program. And I remember going home to my parents and saying, but isn't everyone gifted and talented? Why do they have to pull me out? It's really embarrassing. And my parents' answer was, yes, everyone is gifted and talented, but not everyone has had access to the same opportunity. At 18, I left Montana, and I went out east for school, and I became obsessed with understanding the sources of inequality and, more importantly, what we could do about them. In New York, I met this incredible playwright, Julia Jordan, who was convinced that women have a harder time getting their plays into production. And I proceeded to spend a year working on observational and experimental studies to understand whether that was, in fact, true, and if so, why. Uh, in one example, Julia and her friends wrote four scripts for me that had never before been seen, and I sent them out to hundreds of artistic directors and literary managers around the country, varying only the pen name on each script. So is it purportedly written by Mary Walker or Michael Walker? And asking if they were interested in putting the play on stage, and if so, why? And what I found is that, unfortunately, there was discrimination in playwriting. The exact same script, when purportedly written by a woman, was less likely to make it onto stage. But as important, I also found out that the theater community cared. They wanted the best plays to be in production, and this insight spurred change. In graduate school, I continued to use data to understand who gets access to opportunity. I was shocked to learn that over half of jobs are found through personal networks. Well, referrals are valuable in some ways, but they often come at a cost in terms of diversity because people tend to refer people who look like them. So I ran a series of field experiments in an online labor market to understand why firms hire referred workers. Are referred workers really that much more productive on the job, or is there some nepotism at play? So it's the same fascination with understanding opportunity, who has it, what we can do to expand it, that led me to want to work at Coursera. 
And lucky for me, eventually I convinced the hiring manager to change his mind. Uh, and today I lead the end-to-end -end data team across data science, data engineering, and machine learning, working on building a better product through data. What excites me most about data science is the opportunity it affords each of us to contribute to the problems we care about most. I'm going to share three stories today of how we're using data science to solve problems in education. The first is about helping learners stay motivated and on track. The second is about helping teachers better support those learners. And the third is about ensuring individuals have the skill signals they need so they can be rewarded for what they know in the labor market. So let's start with the first. A big problem we see in learning is retention. This is true both on campus and online. At Coursera, only about one in five active enrollees go on to complete the course. Now, not all of the drop-off is bad. In some cases, learners say, hey, I got what I needed in just the first couple modules. But in other cases, learners drop off because they lose motivation or because they're stuck on an assignment. And these are barriers that we can break down. Two years ago, my team landed a feature called in-course help. So it's a system of personalized learning interventions that reach out to a learner as she's moving through her experience and support her in staying on track. Here's an example. When a learner first enrolls, she's encouraged to get started with compelling statistics, like how much more likely she is to complete the course if she starts in the next hour. As she's moving through, we reinforce her progress, like reiterating the value of incremental learning. And when she looks stuck, we can help her get unblocked, like recommending the best review material for her based on the area she's struggling with. Different learners, of course, benefit from different messages. And so an Explore Exploit ML system can help ensure we land the right interventions for the right learners. We start with this pool of potential message variants. So the getting started nudges are one, review materials another. There are many versions of these which can be served at hundreds or even thousands of places within courses. We run all of those through a message level model that understands on average, will this message be net positive for learners and decide which to include in our product. From there, we take each combination of messages and learners and run it through a learner level model, which incorporates features of the individual, largely behavioral, as well as of the message, and decides which are most valuable for her. With the remaining probability, we randomize whether or not learners receive messages, so we have a fresh and unbiased source of training data. And then for each of the now nearly 100 million interventions that we've served, we see downstream behavior. Does the learner choose to engage with the message? Does she report it helpful? Does it have an impact on her downstream learning outcomes? And these learning behaviors feed back to power both. Uh, this was designed, developed, and deployed in the summer by an intern named Marianne Sorba, who is looking at me with crazy eyes right now, but um, really fantastic work. In some cases, we can also use machine learning to create the message variants themselves. So take the case of wanting to recommend review material uh, for a learner struggling with an exam. To start, we collect training data from instructors and ask them to tell us what's the best material for a learner struggling with this question. Now, we have about 300,000 questions on the platform. Instructors don't have time to tag them all. They've only tagged about 5%. But we can use that as source of truth in a predictive model where features of the model include, for example, uh, semantic embeddings as well as learner behavioral features. So when learners failed this question and went on to review material, did they end up being successful in the question later? In order to predict for the other 95% that haven't been tagged, what's the review material we should recommend? Personalized learning interventions like these are driving double-digit increases in the rate at which learners progress and complete content. Um, they break down barriers, both behavioral and pedagogical, through the learning experience. But it's not just in education where these methods um, are relevant. In healthcare, less than half of Americans follow doctor's orders in taking their prescription medication. In personal finance, about a third of Americans have saved less than $5,000 for retirement. And by building personalized intervention systems, be it in education or in health or in personal finance and beyond, we can start to better support each individual uh, in making the best decisions for her future self. Fully automated interventions are, in many cases, sufficient to support learners. But once in a while, we all need a little human touch. Does anyone here have children at home? A good share. Um, more than at most conferences, this is Tucker. He's my eight-month-old. And between work and Tucker, I'll admit to not having a lot of time for other things I care deeply about. For example, much of this talk was written from the mother's room at Coursera. Um, and so I can only imagine what it's like to be an online degree learner, the vast majority of whom have a full-time job and have a family and are also layering on top a full degree program. Um, one of the things that can really help is human touch. 
an enrollment counselor that reaches out and asks why you haven't logged in, a TA or tutor who provides support on a particular assignment. But in order to provide that human touch while still keeping the cost of our degree programs low, we need to do everything we can to make that human support really efficient. Last year, we built this feature called the Student Support Dashboard which for all degree learners is predicting what grade they're gonna get in their currently active courses and critically includes human readable insights for why at-risk learners are at risk. The underlying predictions are unique in a few ways. First, uh, our courses are all very different and so we have to co uh, train course specific models. Second, we have to deal with the cold start problem. So a lot of degree courses are being offered for the first time and we have to dynamically identify what is the right training set to use for those new courses. But I think most interestingly, we need to provide these human readable insights for where the predictions are coming from. So let's dig in a bit there. To start, our future engineering focuses on student activity features. And there are kind of four big buckets which I've included up here. We could include features to improve, say, the accuracy of the model about the course itself, or features about the student's demographics, but these are much less actionable for support staff uh, to use in reach outs. From there, we need to understand, for any given learner, if we were to permute her value, for example, to the median, would it meaningfully impact her grade? If so, we serve up these human readable insights included with the prediction. So you could take the case of two different learners. Both are at risk of failing a course. One learner is at risk because she hasn't logged in for 14 days. She's very likely to benefit from a reach out from an enrollment counselor. But another learner is consistently logging in and just failing the assessment time after time. She really needs help from a TA. At Coursera, these at-risk models, again, coupled with the human interpretable insights, allow us to provide that human touch uh, at low cost while still keeping um, degree programs well-priced. More generally, machine-assisted solutions like these can accelerate professionals from radiologists to career counselors in supporting um, others uh, and using their time efficiently to do the work that only humans can. Once we get learners successfully through the learning experience, we also need to support them in being rewarded for what they know on the job. There's a lot of folks out there who have the required skills for open roles. We've heard from a ton of people in data science who don't on paper look like they would be data scientists. And folks who might not look from a traditional resume based on where they went to school or uh, what they majored in or the past jobs they have often have the skills required to do the job. And this is becoming increasingly true as we're moving to a world where people are learning throughout their life. So the old model of learn, do, retire, only my credentials from the beginning mattered, is no longer the world we live in, right? We saw this room, so many of us are investing in learning throughout life, and we need to be able to signal that to the labor market. Relying exclusively on traditional resume signals doesn't just make the labor market inefficient, it actually makes the labor market unfair. And the reason is that people who have access to traditional credentials generally are people who are of higher socioeconomic status. So the World Economic Forum recently released this report. They're basically calling for skills as the new currency in the labor market. Uh, and included in the report is Coursera's skill scoring offering, um, which I want to touch on briefly. Skill scoring is aimed at creating more clear signals for individuals to understand their skills relative to their target career and for companies to understand talent. It's an application of our broader skills graph, which is a data asset we've built out at Coursera over the past few years. At a high level, what we're doing with skills graph is we're taking a robust library of skills and we're connecting them to each other, to the content that teaches them, to the careers that require them, and to the learners who have or want to have them. Skill scoring starts with understanding what skills are taught in each unit of content. So instructors and learners, as they're moving through content, are tagging skills to courses. Many of you may have seen a pop-up that said, what skill are you learning? Thank you for answering. Uh, of course, learners and instructors can't tag everything, but we can use their tags as a source of truth with natural language processing-based features to predict for all other content what skills are being taught in any given unit of content. From there, we can measure what skills each learner has based on her performance on all of the assessments she's attempted on the platform. But for a given skill, say statistical programming, how can we get from tens of millions of attempts across hundreds of courses and millions of learners to a reliable estimate of each learner's skill score? 
So to start, here are four desired properties of our solution. First, we need the algorithm to produce stable and reliable estimates even in the presence of time varying skills. We're learning because we want to be developing our skills. The expectation is the skill is changing over time. The algorithm needs to support that time varying component. Second, since our assessments are spread across hundreds of courses, we need to account for selection effects, where in particular, higher skilled learners are more likely to attempt harder assignments, and we don't want to penalize them for doing so. Third, we need updates to learner skill profile to be explainable, so as your skill score evolves, you should understand what's happening under the hood. And fourth, we need the updates to be computationally feasible across millions of learners and thousands of courses, including in the online context. So when you submit an assignment, you should be able to real time see the evolution of your skill score. Any chess players in the room? Oh, I get the, the semi hands. Good. I knew we'd have at least a few. So for skill scoring, we built out an adaptation of ELO and related rating systems. These are often used in chess. Uh, also for rankings in team sports. I could have asked any basketball fans in the room. We treat each learner and assessment item as players in a tournament. So every time a learner attempts an assessment, it's considered a match. And this is a summary of, of how the skill updates work. So mu is my initial score and mu primed is my updated score. Correspondingly, sigma and sigma primed are the baseline and updated um, levels of certainty represented in, in standard deviations. And then the values with subscript O are for opponent. Um, S is the outcome of a match. For a learner, if I pass the assessment, I win the match, so S equals one. If I fail the assessment, I lose the match, so S equals zero. And you can see the explainability and computational simplicity of the updates. So if I come up against an assessment that's harder than my current skill level and I pass it, then my level increases. And very simply, that change in my level is just a function of the prior on my ability, the prior on the difficulty of the assessment, and the level of certainty in each. Learners use skill scores to, among other things, understand how their skill profile compares to folks in their target role. So for example, of data scientists on Coursera, what skills do they have? Uh, and therefore, what do I need? And what learning can close the gap? In parallel, companies are starting to use skill scores to identify talent well positioned for new opportunities. For example, of back end engineers, who has the baseline math to be able to transition to a machine learning role? So as any labor economist will tell you, we pursue, people pursue education for two reasons. The first is to develop human capital or skills. And the first two case studies, personalized intervention system and interpretable student at risk models, are really designed to support that human capital development. But the second reason that we pursue education is to have a valid signal in the labor market. So we can be in the job uh, that's best positioned for what we know and realize our full potential. And that's what skill score is aimed at accomplishing. Stepping back, the world is changing at a faster and faster clip, driven primarily by technology and globalization. Uh, I cribbed this from Thomas Friedman in his most recent book, Thank You for Being Late. He talks about how the rate of technological change is exceeding the rate at which humans are able to adapt. And this is creating serious dislocation for many people. We need to, he says, bend that curve of human adaptability. We need to learn at a faster and faster rate, and not just you and me, but billions of people around the world. Um, the good news is that data and technology can also be part of the solution. And that's why I feel so lucky to be both a data scientist and um, a Coursarian. All too often, there can be a disconnect between the data science work and the impact. And so I hope that the story shared today, not just about Coursera, but throughout the women in data science movement, can remind us all of the impact we can have through data science, uh, because it's incredible the products and services that we can build to make the world a better and more equitable place. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, you were also talking faster and faster, so as the curve is, is changing. She made me nervous <laughs> last night. You said you were going to cut me off. <laughs> I love it when people listen to me. It doesn't happen all that often. <laughs> So um, just a very quick comment. I know a lot of you have been a little cold this afternoon. That's just another example, I think, of uh, the, the climate in buildings not being said for the, the female body, but for the male body. <laughs> we ask them to change it, and I hope that uh, you're gradually warming up. But soon we'll have some wine and beer and other things, and then you will really warm up. Uh, but hey, we have one more talk, and I'm so happy that we are joined by uh, Bean Kim, who works at Google Brain. 
Uh, we had an astrophysicist before. Uh, been, she, you studied mechanical engineering and I think aeronautics yeah. in Seoul. Yeah. And then you came over here, you did your PhD at the East Coast, right? Uh, I shouldn't, I'm not gonna name the university. Uh, it's just a small university on the East Coast. <laughs> and you started at Google, uh, I think five years ago. Let's do three. Three years yeah. ago only. It's amazing how fast you've grown. So thanks <laughs> so much for being here and for being the last speaker of the day. I think she deserves an extra applause because that's tough. <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. I love speaking to a room full of talented women. There's just something about it. You know, we can talk about research, which I'm going to do, but we can also talk about imposter syndrome, which I very much resonate. So I hope that you've been enjoying today, networking and appropriately sanitizing your hands whenever necessary. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about a little bit of research that I do at Google, interpretability for everyone. The research interpretability last couple of years has been amazing. A lot more papers were published on like when I was doing my PhD, a lot of workshops, but I still see this as a drop in the ocean because interpretability has all these complexities that all machine learning folks already have, plus complexity of humans. It's so complex that we have a whole field just dedicated to humans. It's called psychology. And perhaps that's why people keep being interested in this topic, but that's also why we have to think about where we are going. There's so many directions we can go, but we as a community have to row in the same direction so that we can go somewhere in a couple of years. Otherwise, we'll be rowing in all sorts of directions and, and rotating in circles all day. So today I'm going to talk about first, where are we going? And second, taking a critical look at the toolkits that we already have that would help us point where we should go next. And then I'll suggest an idea that might be slightly better. And then we're gonna come back to that idea to criticize that very idea, to inform us, help us think about how we can do even better. And then I will finish with what we should be careful in general in our journey. So first, where are we going? Unlike supervised machine learning, which we have accuracy, which is a flawed metric, but generally we roughly agree, okay, we, that's roughly where we should head to. But interpretability is a little different. Because we have humans involved, humans, you can't really define anything mathematical about humans, well, at least not yet. So we don't have that clear goal. And that requires us to ask a harder question, a value judgment. What are you trying to achieve ultimately? And what are your values? Now your goal and your values are yours, but I would like to share my goal. My goal is to help people use machine learning more responsibly and more effectively. And that could mean a lot of things, but one, it means to me that we can align our values in the model and our knowledge can be reflected when we want it. And I particularly care that this can be available for everyone for two reasons. One, for high stake domains like medical, we have doctors who may have domain expert knowledge that is critical to make important decisions, but they may not know machine learning. But those are the cases where interpretability becomes most useful and important. And second, machine learning is a powerful tool and it shouldn't be the case that you had to, you're lucky enough to be educated in computer science or math to be able to leverage that powerful tool. I think everyone deserves to leverage that powerful tool. And that requires being able to understand how it's doing and being able to build on top of that. It's important to think about what are not our goals. It is not about making all models interpretable. So models, it's, it's a, a, a overkill. You don't need interpretability. It's also not about understanding everything about the model because the overall, the ultimate goal is remember reflecting values and reflecting your knowledge. And that might just be, you know, just be the saving some more patients or debugging this one bug. And that does not always require understanding everything about the model. 
not about against developing highly complex models. And perhaps most importantly, it's not just about gaining trust. In fact, if the model does not deserve to be trusted, the interpretability method should reveal that. For example, this beautiful paper came out last year that showed that deep learning model that predicts hip fracture pretty well wasn't actually looking at the medical image at all. It was looking at x-ray or whatever the medical machine that was taking the medical picture and the model number. So models are older than others. And perhaps it reflected some where the hospital was and economic status of that area. And interpretability method did the right thing. It revealed that this model isn't reliable, shouldn't be trusted. So next up, uh, where are we, where, what do we have now? So today, there are lots of different interpretability methods, but I'm gonna focus on one specific type, and it's called post-training interpretability method. What does that mean? That just means that somebody gave the model to you, and you can change the model, and you're gonna do the best in inter interpreting that model. So for example, you might have a model that takes a picture and predicts what's in the picture, in this case, a bird, and a goal of interpretability method is to explain why was this a bird. The, one of the most popular method in interpretability is called saliency map. How many people heard of saliency maps? All right, no worries. Uh, it is using a first order derivative to test if I change this pixel a little bit, how much would the probability of bird change? So intuitively, if it changes a lot, it's an important pixel. If it's not, it's, if it doesn't, it's not an important pixel. That's the basic idea. It's very popular. So the promise of this method is that this is the evidence of prediction. These are the pixels, why it was predicted as a bird. Then we can ask a sanity check question. Okay, well, you said it was evidence of prediction, so, if the prediction changes, then the explanation should change. In fact, we can make this really extreme and make the prediction completely random, a garbage network, and in that case, the explanation should really change. So we test that. So here are, here's the, the network beautifully trained, high performance. We got a bunch of images and we got a bunch of explanation, the saliency map, which would look like this. And then we copied that network and we randomize it from the last layer, the prediction layer, all the way to the bottom layer. So this network is garbage. It does not predict, it predicts randomly, okay? So you would think that explanation should change. It doesn't. And you might think that, well, come on, these are technically different pictures. They did change a little bit, but remember, the final consumer of interpretability method is a human. And as a human, I don't think I will conclude different things looking at these two pictures. The belly of the bird, still important. The chick part or the head part of the bird looks still important. So we did this for many methods. Each row is different method, one of which is my own work. And we cascading manner randomize each layer. So the last column you're looking at completely random network. And as you can see, some method doesn't even change. So in this paper, we also calculated quantitatively rank correlation and other things to show that in numbers too, this is true, which is quite shocking. So we were very confused and shocked, and in fact, community was. So how did this happen? Confirmation bias. This is such a strong thing that it's just we're being human. We were given a bird picture. We expected to see a bird. We saw a bird and we liked it for years, and myself included. Is this something that we as a human just have and we have to take that into account when we are designing an interpretability method? 
uh, folks in the similar time, uh, same time, uh, reached the similar conclusions. Some folks mathematically proved that some of these method just looks at the picture and not at all the prediction. But some work show that when shown these uh, explanations, humans did better in a final task. So maybe there is something, we just don't know what it is yet. We need to do more study what that is to get more of that. So how can we do better? So we're still thinking about the same problem, which is a subset of interpretability method. And now I took a cash machine picture, and again, the goal is to explain why was this a cash machine. Let's get that saliency map that we just talked about to help us think, of, think about what do we really want to ask when we look at an explanation. So I squint at this picture, and I see this human in front of the cash machine a little highlighted. So I start thinking, oh, maybe it makes sense. Cash machine maybe often have a human in front of it. But for odd reason, the wheel behind the human is also highlighted, which is a little concerning. Then I start wonder, well, did this concept matter? Or am I seeing just illusion? If they do matter, then which one mattered more? And did it matter for all pictures or just this one picture? The problem is that pixel-based method, you can't quite express this concept across many pictures, like humans. And you would have been fine if you had this concept as a part of an input feature, then you get the weight and you're done, but you didn't. I just made it up after the model is already been trained, you can't change the model. So we developed this method called TCAV, testing with concept activation vectors, which is the goal to give a quantitative, quantitative measurement of a concept or concepts that you came up with after training if and only if it mattered. It will be obvious in why, I, why that is the case. So I'll explain to you how this works. This is a pretty uh, relatively simple method. And I'm gonna use a zebra. You have a classifier that predicts a zebra, and you're wondering whether a stripedness pattern mattered for that prediction. So first and foremost, you might ask, okay, well concept sounds good, but what is it? Like how do you even express what that is? Well, we do the simplest possible thing. We represent that concept as a vector. And this has been done before. How do we do that? Well, you get some examples of that concept that you're interested in investigating, in this case, some stripedness pictures, and you get some random images. And you have a network that you, are, you want to in investigate. Then what you do is you simply get a linear classifier that separates random activations from concept activations, and get a vector that is orthogonal to the decision boundary. What is, what is that vector? Well, it's just a vector in the embedding space that points from random stuff to your concept. That's all there is. So you have this vector that represents the concept. Next is to get that quantity, or the TCAP score. How important was this concept? Also pretty simple. We are going to take what's called directional derivative. This is intuitively speaking, if I take this zebra picture and make it more like the concept, how much would the probability of zebra change? If it changes a lot, it's an important concept. If it doesn't, it's not an important concept. That's basically it. Then we do this for many, many zebra pictures and calculate the ratio of zebra pictures that gave you positive directional derivative, which just means that having the concept increased the probability of zebra. So you had 100 zebra pictures, you calculate derivatives, and 80 of them came out positive, then your TCAP score is 0.8. So that's not all. Super quickly, we have a way to quantitatively validate that this is not some spurious calf, because we all know that in high embedding space of neural network, funky things happen, like adversarial examples. So here's one way we propose to uh, confirm that. The basic idea is that you get many, many concept vectors using many, many different random sets of examples from which you get TCAP scores. 
and pretend that that's a sample, there are samples from a particular distribution and do statistical testing on that to, com to distinguish that from TCAP scores from random caps, where random caps are just random versus random pictures. So it's just confirming that this is at least better than random concept on this particular class zebra. So some results, I have a lot of my favorites, but I'll just talk about this medical example. Diabetic retinopathy is a medical condition that is treatable but sight-threatening condition. At BRAIN, we have a model that can accurately predict DR. But our question is, well, would doctors do the same thing? Does the concept doctors use same as the model used? So we went to a doctor and we asked her, which concepts she expects to see at particular level of DR, DR level four, that's the most severe level of DR, and what are the concepts that she does not expect to see for that level, and similar for uh, lower level of DR. Then we asked the model with TCAV, what do you think? It turns out that when the model accuracy was high in the DR level four, model was using concepts that doctors would have used. So that's cool. But when model accuracy was mediocre, the model was using something that doctors did not expect, which is the HMA, it's a part type of hemorrhage in your blood vessel. And they went back and realized that the DR level one and two, the doctors were labeling all over the place. And in fact, this HMA appeared a lot in DR level two, which was often confused by the model with, uh, with DR level one. So they went back and revisited the labeling process. I've been lucky to observe a lot of passionate responses from academia on this work. Uh, Kerry Kai worked, uh, had this Kai conference paper. They used CAVs to concept activation vectors to help doctors sort through medical images. So this time doctors are looking at images, not as in terms of pixels, but in a language that they're familiar with, medical concepts. I met Eric, who used TCAV for storm prediction. Uh, Mara used this for breast cancer and a lot of other things, MRI from King's College, and so on. And I was also really lucky to see that uh, Sundar talked about this work at Google I.O. 2019. My dad was very happy. I think he stood up all night to just watch this. And my, it, this work was also won uh, UNESCO and a word, which is given to 10 digital innovations, and I quote, uh, that will potential profound and lasting impact. So let's come back to what we just talked about. How can we do better? Plenty of permutations of TCAP that I think we can, this is such a simple uh, framework that we can all extend and people have. One, concepts has to be expressible using examples. So something that overlaps a lot in your images or something that cannot be uh, expressed using examples, you can't really use this. You need labels of concepts. We proposed an idea this year, uh, last year, about how automatically do this for images, but we don't know how to do it for language, for example. Or making it causal. All, this, all these are that I talked about so far is correlation based. It's not causal. So we propose an idea but you still need to train a generative model, which correctly reflects the data generative process, which is hard, and causal is uh, always harder, but there's a lot more work that we need to do. Finally, I wanna talk about what we should be careful in our journey. Proper evaluations, I cannot em emphasize this more. So remember I talked about the complexity. Because we are so complex, it is very hard to tease out what we like versus what's true. And it requires a lot of thinking. And you can perhaps achieve that by doing some sort of sanity check that I did or crafting a data set where you know the ground truth, what is important, and confirm that. It, doesn't, it, ha it can be toy data set. It's just sanity check, sanity check ourselves. Testing with humans. Remember, nothing we're doing is useful if it's not consumed by humans. So we have to check with humans that it works. Remember, we are 
beautifully human and biased and irrational. In fact, uh, if, you're, if you enjoy reading, I highly recommend Danny Kahneman's book on Undoing Project, where, where he beautifully describes all different biases we have, uh, example by example, like statistical quizzes that you can attempt to solve, and I failed a lot of them too, because you were just biased, even in them given like facts and numbers where you can calculate them. HCI, I think we have a couple of folks had talked about this already. I cannot also emphasize, emphasize enough importance of HCI. We have to think about workflow. It's not just about math and algorithm. We have to think about interfaces. We have to think about how humans respond, human studies, human factors, psychology, cognitive science. These things all have to come together to make this work. And let's keep checking that we're going to right direction as we go so that in many years, hopefully not too long, we can sit somewhere and say, ha, we've gone come here because we all run into the same direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great way to end. In fact, we should keep that last slide up because you had so many uh, beautiful conclusions. And look at Liza, you're amazing. You're drawing fast. I hope you really enjoyed the drawings made by Liza Donnelly here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely some that I will frame or <laughs> put on Instagram. It's wonderful. Uh, so, you know, before we do the actual closing remarks here, I just want to make sure that to thank people. There have been so many folks making this conference possible. I have the incredible privilege to be on stage here uh, most of the day, but I did not organize this conference, certainly not by myself. There's so many people involved. Karen and Judy, you saw earlier this morning, they are incredible co-directors, so big round of applause to them. Wow. And then, all these people here on the side, behind these black curtains, there's actually people behind there? <laughs> and they've done amazing work from the live stream to the slides to the, the sound checks, uh, everything. They're ready for us and, and running almost flawlessly today. And any mistakes that there were, were ours. So thank you so much for that. Right? And then we have the volunteers and the logistics folks and the people running, uh, helping us with the ambassador program and getting us speakers and et cetera, et cetera. Is your book, at the end of, uh, of the book, there's a whole list of, of everybody that really helped here. Um, so it's been an incredible day and it's been an incredible journey. Uh, we are always taking a short break after our own WITS conference, uh, but we very, quickly start with the next one. You know, we take maybe a couple of weeks and then we start thinking about next year. Who will we invite? Uh, how are we going to improve upon the ambassador program? Uh, we get people enthusiastically sending us emails saying, we want to be an ambassador next year. And uh, how do we do that? So for us, you know, we're constantly thinking about it. And I was just thinking about this last year. Uh, leading up to the conference now, and the big changes we've seen in just five years, not just in the growth of this conference, but also in the diversity of thought we've seen at this conference, also here today, uh, the spread of data science in so many different application areas, uh, the diversity of backgrounds in people. No, I, honestly, 10 years ago, when I first really started working on data science and building programs around data science, most of the people in that field and most of the people who we heard were computer scientists, mathematicians, or statisticians. That's not the case. And certainly not anymore. There are people with all sorts of different backgrounds. And I know there are many different people in this audience today with different backgrounds. And you no longer ask yourself whether or not you belong. You may still feel a little bit like an imposter because we, a lot of us do, I do as well. Uh, but you don't ask yourself anymore, do I have a place in this field? 
And it was clear to me today that there is a place for everybody. There's a place for humanists. There's a place for social scientists. There's a place for, for lawyers. There's a place for economists. There's a place for astrophysicists. <laughs> There's a place for electrical engineers and mathematicians and statisticians and, and everybody, earth scientists, you name it. So that's wonderful to see. And we're really seeing this also at WITS conferences around the world. These WITS conferences are becoming more and more diverse in all sort of different ways. We heard a lot today about bias and, and uh, integrity and fairness and equity and transparency. And, and I'm so glad we had the panel this morning to set this off as well. We heard that it is not just about efficiency, about efficiency and scalability. We heard that it is extremely important to have a shared understanding of value systems. We heard that it's really important for us to understand the difference between what we like to see and what is really the truth, and that we always have to stay critical. That we can be helped by others to stay truthful, and, and that it is so important for that reason to have interdisciplinary teams in all sorts of different ways. Uh, I've learned so much today. I want to thank all the speakers again for today, all the insights that they've given me. Lots of food for thought. So a big round of applause to all the speakers again. Uh, and to you. And I just want to tell you also, this is just the beginning. You know, we've had a few WITS conferences around the world already. We'll have many more to come this week alone, almost every day. There are WITS conferences elsewhere in the world. And a lot of those people are sharing talks online. So please keep an eye out for it. Join us on LinkedIn. Uh, join us on Facebook and other areas to find references to those, uh, to those other WITS conferences. We'll keep going until May, I think, right? Is it, I think until May we have conferences around the world. The so Southern Hemisphere is going to join us uh, probably a little bit later this month. There's still A lot of them are still on vacation at the universities. They come in later. And, and we have so many others coming up in Africa, in the Middle East, in South America. You name it. Uh, now, I was also thinking about changes. And, you know, somebody asked me, when do you know that things are really moving? and that women are really finding their place. And I thought, when there is a television show on female data scientists, maybe? <laughs> or maybe when there are books with uh, heroines, you know, data scientists. And you know, to my big surprise, a month ago, I got an email from a Dutch author called Helene Kist. And we do now have a book about female data scientists. <laughs> she wrote a book, Stay Mad, Sweetheart. Uh, you can get this on, on Amazon.com. But let me offer you this. If you'd like to read it, send me an email. I will send you a copy. It's an enjoyable read. It's a mystery. And the three main people in this book are female data scientists. I didn't think I would see that day five years ago, but here we are. We've made it. Now they just need to make a movie of this, right? <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. So we are shortly going to be breaking for a reception. Keep in mind that we have uh, our two wonderful artists there. As soon as we leave the room here, grab a drink and make your way to the end of the living room. Uh, where the grand piano is, because Patricia is going to uh, give you a demonstration of her fantastic work on, on the, in the interface of music and AI. And you will see the work, the visual arts by uh, Andrea there as well. And I think you'll be blown away by that. And in the meantime, we are soon gearing up for WITS 2021. So here's a placeholder. Put it in your book. March 8th. <laughs> And thank you, thank you for joining us today. See you.